Section 12 of The Letters of Mark Twain Complete. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by James K. White. The Letters of Mark Twain Complete by Mark Twain. Volume 2, Chapter 11. Letters 1871 to 72. Removal to Hartford, a lecture tour, roughing it, first letter to Howells. The house they had taken in Hartford was the Hooker property on Forest Street, a handsome place in a distinctly literary neighborhood. Harriet Beecher Stowe, Charles Dudley Warner, and other well-known writers were within easy walking distance. Twitchell was perhaps half a mile away. It was the proper environment for Mark Twain. He settled his little family there and was presently at Redpath's office in Boston, which was a congenial place, as we have seen before. He did not fail to return to the company of Nasby, Josh Billings, and those others of Redpath's attractions, as long and as often as distance would permit. Bret Hart, who by this time had won fame, was also in Boston now and frequently with Howells, Aldrich and Mark Twain gathered in some quiet restaurant corner for a luncheon that lasted through a dim winter afternoon, a period of anecdote, reminiscence, and mirth. They were all young then, and laughed easily. Howells has written of one such luncheon given by Ralph Keeler, a young Californian, a gathering at which James T. Fields was present. Nothing remains to me of the happy time but a sense of idle and aimless and joyful talk-play, beginning and ending nowhere, of eager laughter, of countless good stories from Fields, of a heat-lightening shimmer of wit from Aldrich, of an occasional concentration of our joint mockeries upon our host, who took it gladly. But the lecture circuit cannot be restricted to the radius of Boston. Clemens was presently writing to Redpath from Washington and points farther west. To James Redpath in Boston. Washington, Tuesday, October 28, 1871. Dear Red, I have come square out, thrown reminiscences overboard, and taken Artemis Ward, humorist, for my subject. Wrote it here on Friday and Saturday and read it from manuscript last night to an enormous house. It suits me, and I'll never deliver the nasty, nauseous reminiscences any more. Yours, Mark. The Artemis Ward lecture lasted eleven days. Then he wrote, To Redpath and Fall in Boston. Buffalo Depot, December 8, 1871. Redpath and Fall, Boston. Notify all hands that from this time I shall talk nothing but selections from my forthcoming book, Roughing It. Tried it last night. Suits me tip-top. Samuel L. Clemens. The Roughing It chapters proved a success and continued in high favor through the rest of the season. To James Redpath in Boston, Logansport, Indiana, January 2, 1872. Friend Redpath, had a splendid time with a splendid audience in Indianapolis last night, a perfectly jammed house, just as I have had all the time out here. I like the new lecture, but I hate the Artemis Ward talk and won't talk it any more. No man ever approved that choice of subject in my hearing, I think. Give me some comfort. If I'm to talk in New York, am I going to have a good house? I don't care now to have any appointments canceled. I'll even fetch those Dutch Pennsylvanians with this lecture. Have paid up $4,000 indebtedness. You are the last on my list. Shall begin to pay you in a few days, and then I shall be a free man again. Yours, Mark. With his debts paid, Clemens was anxious to be getting home. 
Two weeks following the above, he wrote Redpath that he would accept no more engagements at any price, outside of New England, and added, The few engagements I have from this time forth, the better I shall be pleased. By the end of February, he was back in Hartford, refusing an engagement in Boston, and announcing to Redpath, If I had another engagement, I'd rot before I'd fill it from which we gather that he was not entirely happy in the lecture field. As a matter of fact, Mark Twain loathed the continuous travel and nightly drudgery of platform life. He was fond of entertaining, and there were moments of triumph that repaid him for a good deal, but the tyranny of a schedule and timetables was a constant exasperation. Meantime, Roughing It had appeared and was selling abundantly. Mark Twain, free of debt, and in pleasant circumstances, felt that the outlook was bright. It became even more so when, in March, the second child, a little girl, Susie, was born, with no attending misfortunes. But then, in the early summer, little Langdon died. It was seldom, during all of Mark Twain's life, that he enjoyed more than a brief period of unmixed happiness. It was in June of that year that Clemens wrote his first letter to William Dean Howells, the first of several hundred that would follow in the years to come, and has in it something that is characteristic of nearly all the Clemens Howells letters, a kind of tender playfulness that answered to something in Howells' makeup, his sense of humor, his wide knowledge of a humanity which he pictured so amusingly to the world. To William Dean Howells in Boston, Hartford, June 15, 1872. Friend Howells, could you tell me how I could get a copy of your portrait as published in Hearth and Home? I hear so much talk about it as being among the finest works of art which have yet appeared in that journal that I feel a strong desire to see it. Is it suitable for framing? I have written the publishers of H&H &H time and again, but they say that the demand for the portrait immediately exhausted the edition, and now a copy cannot be had, even for the European demand, which has now begun. Bret Hart has been here, and says his family would not be without that portrait for any consideration. He says his children get up in the night and yell for it. I would give anything for a copy of that portrait to put up in my parlor. I have Oliver Wendell Holmes and Bret Hart's as published in every Saturday, and of all the swarms that come every day to gaze upon them, none go away that are not softened and humbled and made more resigned to the will of God. If I had yours to put up alongside of them, I believe the combination would bring more souls to earnest reflection and ultimate conviction of their lost condition than any other kind of warning would. Where in the nation can I get that portrait? Here are heaps of people that want it, that need it. There's my uncle. He wants a copy. He is lying at the point of death. He has been lying at the point of death for two years. He wants a copy, and I want him to have a copy. And I want you to send a copy to the man that shot my dog. I want to see if he is dead to every human instinct. Now, you send me that portrait. I am sending you mine in this letter, and am glad to do it, for it has been greatly admired. People who are judges of art find in the execution a grandeur which has not been equaled in this country and an expression which has not been approached in any. Yours truly, S. L. Clemens. P.S. Sixty-two thousand copies of Ruffin' It sold and delivered in four months. The Clemens family did not spend the summer at Quarry Farm that year. The sea air was prescribed for Mrs. Clemens and the baby, and they went to Saybrook, Connecticut, to Fenwick Hall. Clemens wrote very little, though he seems to have planned Tom Sawyer, and perhaps made its earliest beginning, which was in dramatic form. His mind, however, was otherwise active. He was always more or less given to inventions, and in his next letter we find a description of one which he brought to comparative perfection. He had also conceived the idea of another book of travel, 
and this was his purpose of a projected trip to England. To Orion Clemens in Hartford. Fenwick Hall, Saybrook, Connecticut. August 11, 1872. My dear brother, I shall sail for England in the Scotia, August 21. But what I wish to put on record now is my new invention, hence this note, which you will preserve. It is this, a self-pasting scrapbook, good enough idea if some juggling tailor does not come along and antedate me a couple of months, as in the case of the elastic vest strap. The nuisance of keeping a scrapbook is, one, one never has paste or gum tragacanth handy. Two, mucilage won't stick or stay four weeks. Three, mucilage sucks out the ink and makes the scraps unreadable. Four, to daub and paste three or four pages of scraps is tedious, slow, nasty, and tiresome. My idea is this. Make a scrapbook with leaves veneered or coated with gum stickum of some kind. Wet the page with sponge, brush, rag, or tongue, and dab on your scraps like postage stamps. Lay on the gum in columns of stripes. Each stripe of gum the length of, say, 20 M's, small pica, and as broad as your finger. A blank about as broad as your finger between each two stripes, so in wetting the paper you need not wet any more of the gum than your scrap or scraps will cover. Then you may shut up the book and the leaves won't stick together. Preserve also the envelope of this letter. Postmark ought to be good evidence of the date of this great humanizing and civilizing invention. I'll put it into Dan Sloat's hands and tell him he must send you all over America to urge its use upon stationers and booksellers. So don't buy into a newspaper. The name of this thing is Mark Twain's self pasting Scrapbook. All well here. Shall be up a p.m. Tuesday. Send the carriage. Your brother, S.L. Clemens. The Dan Sloat of this letter is, of course, his old Quaker City shipmate, who was engaged in the blank book business, the firm being Sloat and Woodman, located at 119 and 121 William Street, New York. End of section 12. Recording by James K. White. Chula Vista. Section 13 of The Letters of Mark Twain Complete. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by James K. White. The Letters of Mark Twain Complete by Mark Twain. Volume 2. Chapter 12. Letters, 1872 to 73. Mark Twain in England, London Honors, Acquaintance with Dr. John Brown, A Lecture Triumph, The Gilded Age. Clemens did in fact sail for England on the given date, and was lavishly received there. All literary London joined in giving him a good time. He had not as yet been received seriously by the older American men of letters, but England made no question as to his title to first rank. Already, too, they classified him as one of the human type of Lincoln, and reveled in him without stint. Howells writes, In England, rank, fashion, and culture rejoiced in him. Lord Mayors, Lord Chief Justices, and magnates of many kinds were his hosts. He was treated so well, and enjoyed it all so much, that he could not write a book the kind of book he had planned. One could not poke fun at a country or a people that had welcomed him with open arms. He made plenty of notes at first, but presently gave up the book idea and devoted himself altogether to having a good time. He had one grievance. A publisher by the name of Houghton, a sort of literary harpy of which there were a great number in those days of defective copyright, not merely content with pilfering his early work, had reprinted, under the name of Mark Twain, the work of a mixed assortment of other humorists, an offensive volume bearing the title Screamers and Eye-Openers by Mark Twain. 
they besieged him to lecture in london and promised him overflowing houses artemus ward during his last days had earned london by storm with his platform humor and they promised mark twain even greater success for some reason however he did not welcome the idea perhaps there was too much gaiety to mrs clemens he wrote to mrs clemens in hartford london september fifteen eighteen seventy two livy darling everybody says lecture 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 but i have not the least idea of doing it certainly not at present mr dolby who took dickens to america is coming to talk business to me tomorrow though i have sent him word once before that i can't be hired to talk here because i have no time to spare there is too much sociability i do not get along fast enough with work tomorrow i lunch with mr tool and a member of parliament tool is the most able comedian of the day and then i'm done for a while on tuesday i mean to hang a card to my key box inscribed gone out of the city for a week and then i shall go to work and work hard one can't be caught in a hive of four million people like this i have got such a perfectly delightful razor i have a notion to buy some for charlie theodore and slee for i know they have no such razors there i have got a neat little watch chain for annie twenty dollars i love you my darling my love to all of you samuel that mark twain should feel and privately report something of his triumphs we need not wonder at certainly he was never one to give himself airs but to have the world's great literary center paying court to him who only ten years before had been penniless and unknown and who once had been a barefoot tom sawyer in hannibal was quite startling it is gratifying to find evidence of human weakness in the following heart-to-heart -heart letter to his publisher especially in view of the relating circumstances to elijah bliss in hartford london september twenty eighth eighteen seventy two friend bliss i have been received in a sort of tremendous way to-night by the brains of london assembled at the annual dinner of the sheriffs of london mine being between you and me a name which was received with a flattering outburst of spontaneous applause when the long list of guests was called i might have perished on the spot but for the friendly support and assistance of my excellent friend sir john bennett and i want you to paste the enclosed in a couple of the handsomest copies of the innocents and rough in it and send them to him his address is sir john bennett cheapside london yours truly s l clemens the relating circumstances were these at the above-mentioned dinner there had been a roll-call of the distinguished guests present and each name had been duly applauded clemens conversing in a whisper with his neighbor sir john bennett did not give very close attention to the names applauding mechanically with the others finally a name was read that brought out a vehement hand-clapping mark twain not to be outdone in cordiality joined vigorously and kept his hands going even after the others finished then remarking the general laughter he whispered to sir john whose name was that we were just applauding mark twain's we may believe that the friendly support of sir john bennett was welcome for the moment but the incident could do him no harm the diners regarded it as one of his jokes and enjoyed him all the more for it he was ready to go home by november but by no means had he had enough of england he really had some thought of returning there permanently in a letter to mrs crane at quarry farm he wrote if you and theodore will come over in the spring with livy and me and spend the summer you will see a country that is so beautiful that you will be obliged to believe in fairyland and theodore can browse with me among dusty old dens that look now as they looked five hundred years ago and puzzle over books in the british museum that were made before christ was born and in the customs of their public dinners and the ceremonies of every official act and the dresses of a thousand dignitaries 
trace the speech and manners of all the centuries that have dragged their lagging decades over England since the Heptarchy fell asunder. I would a good deal rather live here if I could get the rest of you over. In a letter home to his mother and sister, we get a further picture of his enjoyment. To Mrs. Jane Clemens and Mrs. Moffat, London, November 6, 1872. My dear mother and sister, I have been so everlasting busy that I couldn't write, and moreover, I have been so unceasingly lazy that I couldn't have written anyhow. I came here to take notes for a book, but I haven't done much but attend dinners and make speeches. But have had a jolly good time, and I do hate to go away from these English folks. They make a stranger feel entirely at home, and they laugh so easily that it is a comfort to make after-dinner speeches here. I have made hundreds of friends, and last night in the crush of the opening of the new Guildhall Library and Museum, I was surprised to meet a familiar face every few steps. Nearly 4,000 people of both sexes came and went during the evening, so I had a good opportunity to make a great many new acquaintances. Livy is willing to come here with me next April and stay several months, so I am going home next Tuesday. I would sail on Saturday, but that is the day of the Lord Mayor's annual grand state dinner when they say 900 of the great men of the city sit down to table, a great many of them in their fine official and court paraphernalia, so I must not miss it. However, I may yet change my mind and sail Saturday. I am looking at a fine magic lantern which will cost a deal of money, and if I buy it, Sammy may come and learn to make the gas and work the machinery, and paint pictures for it on glass. I mean to give exhibitions for charitable purposes in Hartford, and charge a dollar a head. In a hurry, yours affectionately, Sam. He sailed November 12th on the Batavia, arriving in New York two weeks later. There had been a presidential election in his absence. General Grant had defeated Horace Greeley, a result, in some measure at least, attributed to the amusing and powerful pictures of the cartoonist Thomas Nast. Mark Twain admired Greeley's talents, but he regarded him as poorly qualified for the nation's chief executive. He wrote, To Thomas Nast, in Morristown, New Jersey, Hartford, November 1872. Nast, you more than any other man have won a prodigious victory for Grant, I mean, rather, for civilization and progress. Those pictures were simply marvelous, and if any man in the land has a right to hold his head up and be honestly proud of his share in this year's vast events, that man is unquestionably yourself. We all do sincerely honor you and are proud of you. Mark Twain Perhaps Mark Twain was too busy at this time to write letters. His success in England had made him more than ever popular in America, and he could by no means keep up with the demands on him. In January he contributed to the New York Tribune some letters on the Sandwich Islands, but as these were more properly articles, they do not seem to belong here. He refused to go on the lecture circuit, though he permitted Redpath to book him for any occasional appearance and it is due to one of these special engagements that we have the only letter preserved from this time. It is to Howells, and written with that exaggeration with which he was likely to embellish his difficulties. We are not called upon to believe that there were really any such demonstrations as those ascribed to Warner and himself. To W. D. Howells, in Boston. Farmington Avenue, Hartford, February 27. My dear Howells, I am in a suite, and Warner is in another. I told Redpath some time ago I would lecture in Boston any two days he might choose, provided they were consecutive days. I never dreamed of his choosing days during Lent, since that was his special horror, but all at once he telegraphs me, and hollers at me in all manner of ways, that I am booked for Boston March 5, of all days in the year and to make matters just as mixed and uncertain as possible, I can't find out to save my life 
whether he means to lecture me on the sixth or not warner's been in here swearing like a lunatic and saying he had written you to come on the fourth and i said you leatherhead if i talk in boston both afternoon and evening march five i'll have to go to boston the fourth and then he just kicked up his heels and went off cursing after a fashion i never heard of before now let's just leave this thing to providence for twenty-four hours you bet it will come out all right yours ever mark he was writing a book with warner at this time the gilded age the two authors having been challenged by their wives one night at dinner to write a better book than the current novels they had been discussing with some severity clemens already had a story in his mind and warner agreed to collaborate in the writing it was begun without delay clemens wrote the first three hundred and ninety nine pages and read them aloud to warner who took up the story at this point and continued it through twelve chapters after which they worked alternately and with great enjoyment they also worked rapidly and in april the story was completed for a collaboration by two men so different in temperament and literary method it was a remarkable performance another thing mark twain did that winter was to buy some land on farmington avenue and begin the building of a home he had by no means given up returning to england and made his plans to sail with mrs clemens and susie in may miss clara spaulding of elmira later mrs john b stanchfield of new york a girlhood friend of mrs clemens was to accompany them the daily graphic heard of the proposed journey and wrote asking for a farewell word his characteristic reply is the only letter of any kind that has survived from that spring to the editor of the daily graphic in new york city hartford april seventeenth eighteen seventy three editor graphic your note is received if the following two lines which i have cut from it are your natural handwriting then i understand you to ask me for a farewell letter in the name of the american people bless you the joy of the american people is just a little premature i haven't gone yet and what is more i'm not going to stay when i do go yes it is true i am only going to remain beyond the sea six months that is all i love stir and excitement and so the moment the spring birds begin to sing and the lagging weariness of summer to threaten i grow restless i get the fidgets i want to pack off somewhere where there's something going on but you know how that is you must have felt that way this very day i saw the signs in the air of the coming dullness and i said to myself how glad i am that i have already chartered a steamship there was absolutely nothing in the morning papers you can see for yourself what the telegraphic headings were by telegraph a father killed by his son a bloody fight in kentucky a courthouse fired and negroes therein shot while escaping a louisiana massacre an eight-year-old murderer two to three hundred men roasted alive a town in a state of general riot a lively skirmish in indiana and thirty other similar headings the items under those headings all bear date yesterday april sixteen refer to your own paper and i give you my word of honor that that string of commonplace stuff was everything there was in the telegraphic columns that a body could call news well said i to myself this is getting pretty dull this is getting pretty dry there don't appear to be anything going on anywhere has this progressive nation gone to sleep have i got to stand another month of this torpidity before i can begin to browse among the lively capitals of europe but never mind things may revive while i'm away during the last two months my next-door neighbor charles dudley warner has dropped his backlog studies and he and i have written a bulky novel in partnership he has worked up the fiction and i have hurled in the facts i consider it one of the most astonishing novels that ever was written night after night i sit up reading it over and over again 
and crying. It will be published early in the fall, with plenty of pictures. Do you consider this an advertisement? And if so, do you charge for such things when a man is your friend? Yours truly, Samuel L. Clemens, Mark Twain. An amusing, even if annoying, incident happened about the time of Mark Twain's departure. A man named Chu related to Twitchell a most entertaining occurrence. Twitchell saw great possibilities in it, and suggested that Mark Twain be allowed to make a story of it, sharing the profits with Chu. Chu agreed and promised to send the facts carefully set down. Twitchell, in the meantime, told the story to Clemens, who was delighted with it and strongly tempted to write it at once, while he was in the spirit, without waiting on Chu. Fortunately, he did not do so, for when Chu's material came, it was in the form of a clipping, the story having been already printed in some newspaper. Chu's knowledge of literary ethics would seem to have been slight. He thought himself entitled to something under the agreement with Twitchell. Mark Twain, by this time in London, naturally had a different opinion. To Reverend J. H. Twitchell in Hartford. London, June 9, 73. Dear old Joe, I consider myself wholly at liberty to decline to pay Chu anything, and at the same time strongly tempted to sue him into the bargain for coming so near ruining me. If he hadn't happened to send me that thing in print, I would have used the story like an innocent fool, and would straightway have been hounded to death as a plagiarist. It would have absolutely destroyed me. I cannot conceive of a man being such a hopeless ass after serving as a legislative reporter, too, as to imagine that I or any other literary man in his senses would consent to chew over old stuff that had already been in print. If that man weren't an infant in swaddling clothes, his only reply to our petition would have been, It has been in print. It makes me as mad as the very old Harry every time I think of Mr. Chu and the frightful and narrow escape I have had at his hands. Confound Mr. Chu with all my heart. I'm willing that he should have ten dollars for his trouble of warming over his cold victuals. Cheerfully willing to that, but no more. If I had had him near when his letter came, I would have got out my tomahawk and gone for him. He didn't tell the story half as well as you did, anyhow. I wish to goodness you were here this moment. Nobody in our parlor but Livy and me, and a very good view of London to the fore. We have a luxuriously ample suite of apartments in the Langham Hotel, third floor, our bedroom looking straight up Portland Place, and our parlor having a noble array of great windows looking out upon both streets. Portland Place and the crook that joins it to Regent Street. 9 p.m. Full twilight. Rich sunset tints lingering in the west. I'm not going to write anything. Rather, tell it when I get back. I love you in harmony, and that is all the fresh news I've got anyway. And I mean to keep that fresh all the time. Lovingly, Mark. P.S. Am luxuriating in glorious old Peep's diary and smoking. Letters are exceedingly scarce through all this period. Mark Twain, now on his second visit to London, was literally overwhelmed with honors and entertainment. His rooms at the Langham were like a court. Such men as Robert Browning, Turgenieff, Sir John Millay, and Charles Kingsley hastened to call. Kingsley and others gave him dinners. Mrs. Clemens to her sister wrote, It is perfectly discouraging to try to write you. The continuous excitement presently told on her. In July all further engagements were cancelled, and Clemens took his little family to Scotland for quiet and rest. They broke the journey at York, and it was there that Mark Twain wrote the only letter remaining from this time. Fragment of a letter to Mrs. Jervis Langdon of Elmira, New York. For the present, we shall remain in this queer old walled town with its crooked, narrow lanes that tell us of their old day that knew no wheeled vehicles, its plaster and timber dwellings with upper stories far overhanging the street 
and thus marking their date, say, three hundred years ago. The stately city walls, the castellated gates, the ivy-grown foliage sheltered, most noble and picturesque ruin of St. Mary's Abbey, suggesting their date, say, five hundred years ago, in the heart of crusading times and the glory of English chivalry and romance. The vast cathedral of York, with its worn carvings and quaintly pictured windows, preaching of still remoter days. The outlandish names of streets and courts and byways that stand as a record and a memorial all these centuries of Danish dominion here in still earlier times. The hint here and there of King Arthur and his knights and their bloody fights with Saxon oppressors round about this old city more than thirteen hundred years gone by. And, last of all, the melancholy old stone coffins and sculptured inscriptions, a venerable arch and a hoary tower of stone that still remain and are kissed by the sun and caressed by the shadows every day, just as the sun and the shadows have kissed and caressed them every lagging day since the Roman emperor's soldiers placed them here in the times when Jesus, the son of Mary, walked the streets of Nazareth, a youth with no more name or fame than the Yorkshire boy who is loitering down this street this moment. Their destination was Edinburgh, where they remained a month. Mrs. Clemens' health gave way on their arrival there, and her husband, knowing the name of no other physician in the place, looked up Dr. John Brown, author of Rab and His Friends, and found in him not only a skillful practitioner, but a lovable companion to whom they all became deeply attached. Little Susie, now seventeen months old, became his special favorite. He named her Megalops because of her great eyes. Mrs. Clemens regained her strength, and they returned to London. Clemens, still urged to lecture, finally agreed with George Dolby to a week's engagement, and added a promise that after taking his wife and daughter back to America, he would return immediately for a more extended course. Dolby announced him to appear at the Queen's Concert Rooms, Hanover Square, for the week of October 13 through 18, his lecture to be the old Sandwich Islands talk that seven years before had brought him his first success. The Great Hall, the largest in London, was thronged at each appearance, and the papers declared that Mark Twain had no more than whetted the public appetite for his humor. Three days later, October 1873, Clemens, with his little party, sailed for home. Halfway across the ocean, he wrote the friend they had left in Scotland. To Dr. John Brown in Edinburgh, Mid-Atlantic, October 30, 1873. Our dear friend, the doctor, we have plowed a long way over the sea, and there is twenty-two hundred miles of restless water between us now, besides the railway stretch, and yet you are so present with us, so close to us, that a span and a whisper would bridge the distance. The first three days were stormy, and wife, child, maid, and Miss Spaulding were all seasick twenty-five hours out of the twenty-four, and I was sorry I ever started. However, it has been smooth and balmy, and sunny and altogether lovely for a day or two now, and at night there was a broad luminous highway stretching over the sea to the moon, over which the spirits of the sea are traveling up and down all through the secret night, and having a genuine good time, I make no doubt. Today they discovered a collie on board. I find, as per advertisement which I sent you, that they won't carry dogs in these ships at any price. This one has been concealed up to this time. Now his owner has to pay ten pounds or heave him overboard. Fortunately, the doggy is a performing doggy, and the money will be paid. So, after all, it was just as well you didn't entrust your collar to us. A poor little child died at midnight and was buried at dawn this morning, sheeted and shotted, and sunk in the middle of the lonely ocean in water three thousand fathoms deep. Pity the poor mother. With our love, S. L. Clemens. Mark Twain was back in London, lecturing again at the Queen's Concert Rooms, 
after barely a month's absence. Charles Warren Stoddard, whom he had known in California, shared his apartment at the Langham, and acted as his secretary, a very necessary office, for he was besieged by callers and bombarded with letters. He remained in London two months, lecturing steadily at Hanover Square to full houses. It is unlikely that there is any other platform record to match it. One letter of this period has been preserved. It is written to Twitchell, near the end of his engagement. To Rev. J. H. Twitchell, in Hartford. London, January 5, 1874. My dear old Joe, I knew you would be likely to graduate into an ass if I came away, and so you have, if you have stopped smoking. However, I have a strong faith that it is not too late yet, and that the judiciously managed influence of a bad example will fetch you back again. I wish you had written me some news. Livy tells me precious little. She mainly writes to hurry me home and to tell me how much she respects me but she's generally pretty slow on news. I had a letter from her along with yours today, but she didn't tell me the book is out. However, it's all right. I hope to be home twenty days from today, and then I'll see her, and that will make up for a whole year's dearth of news. I am right down grateful that she is looking strong and lovelier than ever. I only wish I could see her look her level best once. I think it would be a vision. I have just spent a good part of this day browsing through the Royal Academy exhibition of Landseer's paintings. They fill four or five great salons and must number a good many hundreds. This is the only opportunity ever to see them because the finest of them belong to the Queen and she keeps them in her private apartments. Ah, they're wonderfully beautiful. There are such rich moonlights and dusks in the challenge and the combat, and in that long flight of birds across a lake in the subdued flush of sunset or sunrise, for no man can ever tell t'other from which in a picture, except it has the filmy morning mist breathing itself up from the water. And there is such a grave analytical profundity in the faces of the connoisseurs, and such pathos in the picture of the fawn suckling its dead mother on a snowy waste, with only the blood and the footprints to hint that she is not asleep. And the way he makes animals absolute flesh and blood, insomuch that if the room were dark and ever so little, and a motionless living animal placed beside a painted one, no man could tell which was which. I interrupted myself here, to drop a line to Shirley Brooks, and suggest a cartoon for Punch. It was this. In one of the academy salons, in the suite where these pictures are, a fine bust of Landseer stands on a pedestal in the center of the room. I suggest that some of Landseer's best known animals be represented as having come down out of their frames in the moonlight and grouped themselves about the bust in mourning attitudes. Well, old man, I am powerful glad to hear from you, and shall be powerful glad to see you in harmony. I am not going to the provinces, because I cannot get halls that are large enough. I always felt cramped in Hanover Square rooms, but I find that everybody here speaks with awe and respect of that prodigious place, and wonder that I could fill it so long. I am hoping to be back in twenty days, but I have so much to go home to and enjoy with a jubilant joy that it seems hardly possible that it can ever come to pass in so uncertain a world as this. I have read the novel, The Gilded Age, published during his absence, December 1873, here, and I like it. I have made no inquiries about it, though. My interest in a book ceases with the printing of it. With a world of love, Samuel. End of section 13. Recording by James K. White, Chula Vista. Section 14 of The Letters of Mark Twain Complete. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. 
Recording by James K. White. The Letters of Mark Twain Complete by Mark Twain. Volume 2. Chapter 13. Letters, 1874. Hartford and Elmira. A New Study. Beginning, Tom Sawyer. The Sellers Play. Naturally, Redpath would not give him any peace now. His London success must not be wasted. At first his victim refused point-blank, and with great brevity. But he was overborne and persuaded, and made occasional appearances, wiring, at last, this final defiant word. Telegram to James Redpath, in Boston. Hartford, March 3, 1874. James Redpath, why don't you congratulate me? I never expect to stand on a lecture platform again after Thursday night. Mark. That he was glad to be home again, we may gather from a letter sent at this time to Dr. Brown of Edinburgh. To Dr. John Brown in Edinburgh. Farmington Avenue, Hartford. February 28, 1874. My dear friend, we are all delighted with your commendations of the Gilded Age, and the more so because some of our newspapers have set forth the opinion that Warner really wrote the book, and I only added my name to the title page in order to give it a larger sale. I wrote the first eleven chapters, every word and every line. I also wrote chapters 24, 25, 27, 28, 30, 32, 33, 34, 36, 37, 21, 42, 43, 45, 51, 52, 53, 57, 59, 60, 61, 62, and portions of 35, 49, and 56. So, I wrote 32 of the 63 chapters entirely, and part of three others beside. The fearful financial panic hit the book heavily, for we published it in the midst of it. But nevertheless, in the eight weeks that have now elapsed since the day we published, we have sold 40,000 copies, which gives 3,000 pounds royalty to be divided between the authors. This is really the largest two-month sale which any American book has ever achieved, unless one accepts the cheaper editions of Uncle Tom's Cabin. The average price of our book is 16 shillings a copy. Uncle Tom was 2 shillings a copy. But for the panic, our sale would have been doubled. I verily believe. I do not believe the sale will ultimately go over 100,000 copies. I shipped to you, from Liverpool, Barley's illustrations of Judd's Margaret, the waiter at the Adelphi Hotel, agreeing to ship it securely per parcel delivery. And I do hope it did not miscarry, for we in America think a deal of Barley's work. Felix Octavius Carr Barley, 1822-1888, illustrator of the works of Irving, Cooper, etc., probably the most distinguished American illustrator of his time. I shipped the novel Margaret to you from here a week ago. Indeed, I am thankful for the wife and the child, and if there is one individual creature on all this footstool who is more thoroughly and uniformly and unceasingly happy than I am, I defy the world to produce him and prove him. In my opinion, he doesn't exist. I was a mighty rough, coarse, unpromising subject when Livy took charge of me four years ago, and I may still be, to the rest of the world, but not to her. She has made a very creditable job of me. Success to the Mark Twain Club, and the novel Shibboleth of the Whistle. Of course, any member rising to speak would be required to preface his remark with a keen, respectful whistle at the chair, the chair recognizing the speaker with an answering shriek and then as the speech proceeded, its gravity and force would be emphasized, and its impressiveness augmented by the continual interjection of whistles in place of punctuation pauses, and the applause of the audience would be manifested in the same way. They've gone to luncheon, and I must follow. With strong love from us both, your friend, 
Samuel L. Clemens. These were the days when the Howells and Clemens families began visiting back and forth between Boston and Hartford, and sometimes Aldrich came, though less frequently, and the gatherings at the homes of Warner and Clemens were full of never-to-be-forgotten happiness. Of one such visit, Howells wrote, In the good fellowship of that cordial neighborhood, we had two such days as the aging sun no longer shines on in his round. There was constant running in and out of friendly houses, where the lively hosts and guests called one another by their Christian names or nicknames, and no such vain ceremony as knocking or ringing at doors. Clemens was then building the stately mansion in which he satisfied his love of magnificence as if it had been another sealskin coat, and he was at the crest of the prosperity which enabled him to humor every whim or extravagance. It was the delight of such a visit that kept Clemens constantly urging its repetition. One cannot but feel the genuine affection of these letters. To W. D. Howells in Boston March 1, 1876 My dear Howells, now you will find us the most reasonable people in the world. We had thought of precipitating upon you, George Warner and wife one day, Twitcher and his jewel of a wife another day, and Charles Perkins and wife another. Only those, simply members of our family, they are. But I'll close the door against them all, which will fix all of the lot except Twitcher, who will no more hesitate to climb in at the back window than nothing. And you shall go to bed when you please, get up when you please, talk when you please, read when you please. Mrs. Howells may even go to New York Saturday if she feels that she must, but if some gentle unannoying coaxing can beguile her into putting that off a few days, we shall be more than glad, for I do wish she and Mrs. Clemens could have a good square chance to get acquainted with each other. But first and last and all the time, we want you to feel untrammeled and wholly free from restraint here. The date suits. All dates suit. Yours ever, Mark. To W. D. Howells in Boston. Farmington Avenue, Hartford, March 20, 1876. Dear Howells, You or Aldrich, or both of you, must come to Hartford to live. Mr. Hall, who lives in the house next to Mrs. Stowe's, just where we drive in to go to our new house, will sell for $16,000 or $17,000. The lot is 85 feet front and 150 deep. Long time and easy payments on the purchase? You can do your work just as well here as in Cambridge, can't you? Come, will one of you boys buy that house? Now say yes. Mrs. Clemens is an invalid yet, but is getting along pretty fairly. We send best regards, Mark. April found the Clemens family in Elmira. Mrs. Clemens was not overstrong, and the cares of house building were many. They went early, therefore, remaining at the Langdon home in the city, until Quarry Farm should feel a touch of warmer sun. Clemens wrote the news to Dr. Brown. To Dr. John Brown in Edinburgh. Elmira, New York, April 27, 86. Dear Doctor, This town is in the interior of the state of New York, and was my wife's birthplace. We are here to spend the whole summer. Although it is so near summer, we had a great snowstorm yesterday, and one the day before. This is rather breaking in upon our plans, as it may keep us down here in the valley a trifle longer than we desired. It gets fearfully hot here in the summer, so we spend our summers on top of a hill six or seven hundred feet high, about two or three miles from here. It never gets hot up there. Mrs. Clemens is pretty strong, and so is the little wifey. Barring a desperate cold in the head, the child grows in grace and beauty marvelously. I wish the nations of the earth would combine in a baby show and give us a chance to compete. I must try to find one of her latest photographs to enclose in this, and this reminds me that Mrs. Clemens keeps urging me to ask you for your photograph, and last night she said, 
and be sure to ask him for a photograph of his sister and jock but say master jock do not be headless and forget that courtesy he is jock in our memories and our talk but he has a right to his title when a body uses his name in a letter now i have got it all in i can't have made any mistake this time miss clara spaulding looked in a moment yesterday morning as bright and good as ever she would like to lay her love at your feet if she knew i was writing as would also fifty friends of ours whom you have never seen and whose homage is as fervent as if the cold and clouds and darkness of a mighty sea did not lie between their hearts and you poor old rab had not many friends at first but if all his friends of today could gather to his grave from the four corners of the earth what a procession there would be and rab's friends are your friends i am going to work when we get on the hill till then i have got to lie fallow albeit against my will we join in love to you and yours your friend ever samuel l clemens p s i enclose a specimen of villainy a man pretends to be my brother and my lecture agent gathers a great audience together in a city more than a thousand miles from here and then pockets the money and elopes leaving the audience to wait for the imaginary lecturer i am after him with the law it was a historic summer at the farm a new baby arrived in june a new study was built for mark twain by mrs crane on the hillside near the old quarry a new book was begun in it the adventures of tom sawyer and a play the first that mark twain had really attempted was completed the dramatization of the gilded age an early word went to hartford of conditions at the farm to reverend and mrs twitchell in hartford elmira june eleventh eighteen seventy four my dear old joe and harmony the baby is here and is the great american giantess weighing seven and three-quarter pounds we had to wait a good long time for her but she was full of compensation when she did come the modoc was delighted with it and gave it her doll at once there is nothing selfish about the modoc she is fascinated with the new baby the modoc rips and tears around outdoors most of the time and consequently is as hard as a pine knot and as brown as an indian she is bosom friend to all the ducks chickens turkeys and guinea hens on the place yesterday as she marched along the winding path that leads up the hill through the red clover beds to the summer house there was a long procession of these fowls stringing contentedly after her led by a stately rooster who can look over the modoc's head the devotion of these vassals has been purchased with daily largesse of indian meal and so the modoc attended by her bodyguard moves in state wherever she goes susie crane has built the loveliest study for me you ever saw it is octagonal with a peaked roof each octagon filled with a spacious window and it sits perched in complete isolation on top of an elevation that commands leagues of valley and city and retreating ranges of distant blue hills it is a cozy nest with just room in it for a sofa and a table and three or four chairs and when the storms sweep down the remote valley and the lightning flashes above the hills beyond and the rain beats upon the roof over my head imagine the luxury of it it stands five hundred feet above the valley and two and a half miles from it however one must not ride all day we send continents of love to you and yours affectionately mark we have mentioned before that clemens had settled his mother and sister at fredonia new york and when mrs clemens was in condition to travel he concluded to pay them a visit it proved an unfortunate journey the hot weather was hard on mrs clemens and harder still perhaps on mark twain's temper at any period of his life a bore exasperated him and in these earlier days he was far more likely to explode than in his mellower age remorse always followed the price he paid was always costly we cannot know now who was the unfortunate that invited the storm but in the next letter we get the echoes of it and realize something of its damage 
to Mrs. Jane Clemens and Mrs. Moffat in Fredonia, Elmira, August 15. My dear mother and sister, I came away from Fredonia ashamed of myself, almost too much humiliated to hold up my head and say goodbye. For I began to comprehend how much harm my conduct might do you socially in your village. I would have gone to that detestable oyster brain boar and apologized for my inexcusable rudeness to him, but that I was satisfied he was of too small a caliber to know how to receive an apology with magnanimity. Pamela appalled me by saying people had hinted that they wished to visit Livy when she came, but that she had given them no encouragement. I feared that those people would merely comprehend that their courtesies were not wanted, and yet not know exactly why they were not wanted. I came away feeling that in return for your constant and tireless efforts to secure our bodily comfort and make our visit enjoyable, I had basely repaid you by making you sad and sore-hearted and leaving you so. And the natural result has fallen to me likewise, for a guilty conscience has harassed me ever since, and I have not had one short quarter of an hour of peace to this moment. You spoke of Middletown. Why not go there and live? Mr. Crane says it is only about a hundred miles this side of New York on the Erie Road. The fact that one or two of you might prefer to live somewhere else is not a valid objection. There are no four people who would all choose the same place. So it will be vain to wait for the day when your taste shall be a unit. I seriously fear that our visit has damaged you in Fredonia, and so I wish you were out of it. The baby is fat and strong, and Susie the same. Susie was charmed with the donkey and the doll. Yours affectionately, Samuel. P.S. Dear Ma and Pamela, I am mainly grieved because I have been rude to a man who has been kind to you, and if you ever feel a desire to apologize to him for me, you may be sure that I will endorse the apology, no matter how strong it may be. I went to his bank to apologize to him, but my conviction was strong that he was not man enough to know how to take an apology, and so I did not make it. William Dean Howells was in those days writing those vividly realistic, indeed photographic stories which fixed his place among American men of letters. He had already written Their Wedding Journey and A Chance Acquaintance when a foregone conclusion appeared. For the reason that his own work was so different and perhaps because of his fondness for the author, Clemens always greatly admired the books of Howells. Howells's exact observation and his gift for human detail seemed marvelous to Mark Twain, who, with a bigger brush, was inclined to record the larger rather than the minute aspects of life. The sincerity of his appreciation of Howells, however, need not be questioned, nor, for that matter, his detestation of Scott. To W. D. Howells, in Boston, Elmira, August 22, 1874 Dear Howells, I have just finished reading the foregone conclusion to Mrs. Clemens, and we think you have even outdone yourself. I should think that this must be the daintiest, truest, most admirable workmanship that was ever put on a story. The creatures of God do not act out their natures more unerringly than yours do. If your genuine stories can die, I wonder by what right old Walter Scott's artificialities shall continue to live. I brought Mrs. Clemens back from her trip in a dreadfully broken-down condition, so by the doctor's orders we unpacked the trunk sorrowfully to lie idle here another month instead of going at once to Hartford and proceeding to furnish the new house which is now finished. We hate to have it go longer desolate and tenantless, but cannot help it. By and by, if the madam gets strong again, we are hoping to have the greys there and you and the Aldrich households and Osgood down to engage in an orgy with them. Yours ever, Mark. Howells was editor of The Atlantic by this time and had been urging Clemens to write something suitable for that magazine. He had done nothing, however, until this summer at Quarry Farm. There, one night in the moonlight, Mrs. Crane's colored cook, who had been a slave, was induced to tell him her story. 
it was exactly the story to appeal to mark twain and the kind of thing he could write he set it down next morning as nearly in her own words and manner as possible without departing too far from literary requirements he decided to send this to howells he did not regard it very highly but he would take the chance an earlier offering to the magazine had been returned he sent the true story with a brief note to w d howells in boston elmira september two seventy four my dear howells i enclose also a true story which has no humor in it you can pay as lightly as you choose for that if you want it for it is rather out of my line i have not altered the old colored woman's story except to begin at the beginning instead of the middle as she did and travel both ways yours ever mark but howells was delighted with it he referred to its realist kind of black talk and in another place added this little story delights me more and more i wish you had about forty of them along with the true story mark twain had sent the fable for good old boys and girls but this howells returned not as he said because he didn't like it but because the atlantic on matters of religion was just in that good lord good devil condition when a little fable like yours wouldn't leave it a single presbyterian baptist unitarian episcopalian methodist or millerite paying subscriber while all the deadheads would stick to it and abuse it in the denominational newspapers but the shorter manuscript had been only a brief diversion mark twain was bowling along at a book and a play the book was tom sawyer as already mentioned and the play a dramatization from the gilded age clemens had all along intended to dramatize the story of colonel sellers and was one day thunderstruck to receive word from california that a san francisco dramatist had appropriated his character in a play written for john t raymond clemens had taken out dramatic copyright on the book and immediately stopped the performance by telegraph a correspondence between the author and the dramatist followed leading to a friendly arrangement by which the latter agreed to dispose of his version to mark twain a good deal of discussion from time to time having arisen over the authorship of the seller's play as presented by raymond certain among the letters that follow may be found of special interest meanwhile we find clemens writing to dr john brown of edinburgh on these matters and events in general the book manuscript which he mentions as having put aside was not touched again for nearly a year to dr john brown in edinburgh quarry farm near elmira new york september four eighteen seventy four dear friend i have been writing fifty pages of manuscript a day on an average for some time now on a book a story and consequently have been so wrapped up in it and so dead to anything else that i have fallen mighty short in letter writing but not before last i discovered that that day's chapter was a failure in conception moral truth to nature and execution enough blemish to impair the excellence of almost any chapter and so i must burn up the day's work and do it all over again it was plain that i had worked myself out pump myself dry so i knocked off and went to playing billiards for a change i haven't had an idea or a fancy for two days now an excellent time to write to friends who have plenty of ideas and fancies of their own and so will prefer the offerings of the heart before those of the head day after tomorrow i go to a neighboring city to see a five-act drama of mine brought out and suggest amendments in it and would about as soon spend a night in the spanish inquisition as sit there and be tortured with all the adverse criticisms i can contrive to imagine the audience is indulging in but whether the play be successful or not i hope i shall never feel obliged to see it performed a second time my interest in my work dies a sudden and violent death when the work is done i have invented and patented a pretty good sort of scrapbook i think but i have backed down from letting it be known as mine just at present for i can't stand being under discussion on a play and a scrapbook at the same time 
I shall be away two days, and then return to take our tribe to New York, where we shall remain five days buying furniture for the new house, and then go to Hartford and settle solidly down for the winter. After all that fallow time, I ought to be able to go to work again on the book. We shall reach Hartford about the middle of September, I judge. We have spent the past four months up here on top of a breezy hill six hundred feet high, some few miles from Elmira, New York, and overlooking that town. Elmira is my wife's birthplace, and that of Susie and the new baby. This little summer house on the hilltop, named Quarry Farm, because there's a quarry on it, belongs to my wife's sister, Mrs. Crane. A photographer came up the other day and wanted to make some views, and I shall send you the result per this mail. My study is a snug little octagonal den with a coal grate, six big windows, one little one, and a wide doorway, the latter opening upon the distant town. On hot days, I spread the study wide open, anchor my papers down with brickbats, and write in the midst of the hurricanes, clothed in the same thin linen we make shirts of. The study is nearly on the peak of the hill. It is right in front of the little perpendicular wall of rock left where they used to quarry stones. On the peak of the hill is an old arbor, roofed with bark and covered with the vine you call the American creeper. Its green is almost blooded with red. The study is thirty yards below the old arbor and two hundred yards above the dwelling house. It is remote from all noises. Now isn't the whole thing pleasantly situated? In the picture of me in the study, you glimpse, through the left-hand window, the little rock bluff that rises behind the pond and the bases of the little trees on top of it. The small square window is over the fireplace. The chimney divides to make room for it. Without the stereoscope, it looks like a framed picture. All the study windows have Venetian blinds. They long ago went out of fashion in America, but they have not been replaced with anything half as good yet. The study is built on top of a tumbled rock heap that has morning glories climbing about it and a stone stairway leading down through and dividing it. There now, if you have not time to read all this, turn it over to Jock and drag in the judge to help. Mrs. Clemens must put in a late picture of Susie, a picture which she maintains is good, but which I think is slander on the child. We revisit the Rutland Street home many a time in fancy, for we hold every individual in it in happy and grateful memory. Goodbye, your friend, Samuel L. Clemens. P.S. I gave the post office department a blast in the papers about sending misdirected letters of mine back to the writers for reshipment and got a blast in return through a New York daily from the New York postmaster. But I noticed that misdirected letters find me now without any unnecessary fooling around. The new house in Hartford was now ready to be occupied, and in a letter to Howells, written a little more than a fortnight after the foregoing, we find them located in part of it. But what seems more interesting is that paragraph of the letter which speaks of close friendly relations still existing with the Warners, in that it refutes a report current at this time that there was a break between Clemens and Warner over the rights in the seller's play. There was, in fact, no such rupture. Warner, realizing that he had no hand in the character of sellers and no share in the work of dramatization, generously yielded all claim to any part of the returns. To W. D. Howells in Boston, Farmington Avenue, Hartford, September 20, 1876. My dear Howells, All right, my boy. Send proof sheets here. I amend dialect stuff by talking and talking and talking it till it sounds right. And I had difficulty with this Negro talk because a Negro sometimes, rarely, says going and sometimes gone, and they make just such discrepancies in other words, and when you come to reproduce them on paper, they look as if the variation resulted from the writer's carelessness. But I want to work at the proofs and get the dialect as nearly right as possible. We are in part of the new house. Goodness knows when we'll get in the rest of it. 
full of workmen yet. I worked a month at my play and launched it in New York last Wednesday. I believe it will go. The newspapers have been complimentary. It is simply a setting for the one character, Colonel Sellers. As a play, I guess it will not bear a critical assault in force. The Warners are as charming as ever. They go shortly to the devil for a year, which is but a poetical way of saying they are going to afflict themselves with the unsurpassable, bad word, of travel for a spell. I believe they mean to go and see you first, so they mean to start from heaven to the other place, not from earth. How is that? I think that is no slouch of a compliment, kind of a dim religious light about it. I enjoy that sort of thing. Yours ever, Mark. Raymond, in a letter to the Sun, stated that not one line of the California dramatization had been used by Mark Twain, except that which was taken bodily from the Gilded Age. Clemens himself, in a statement that he wrote for the Hartford Post, but suppressed probably at the request of his wife, gave a full history of the play's origin, a matter of slight interest today. Sellers on the stage proved a great success. The play had no special merit as a literary composition, but the character of Sellers delighted the public, and both author and actor were richly repaid for their entertainment. End of section 14. Recording by James K. White, Chula Vista. Section 15 of The Letters of Mark Twain Complete. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by James K. White. The Letters of Mark Twain Complete by Mark Twain. Volume 2, Chapter 14. Letters, 1874. Mississippi Chapters. Visits to Boston, a joke on Aldrich. Couldn't you send me some such story as that colored one for our January number, that is, within a month? Wrote Howells at the end of September. And during the week following, Mark Twain struggled hard to comply, but without result. When the month was nearly up, he wrote, To W. D. Howells in Boston, Hartford, October 23, 1874. My dear Howells, I have delayed thus long, hoping I might do something for the January number, and Mrs. Clemens has diligently persecuted me day by day with urgence to go to work and do that something, but it's no use. I find I can't. We are in such a state of weary and endless confusion that my head won't go. So, I give it up. Yours ever, Mark. But two hours later, when he had returned from one of the long walks which he and Twitchell so frequently took together, he told a different story. Later, P.M., home, 24th, 74. My dear Howells, I take back the remark that I can't write for the January number for Twitchell and I have had a long walk in the woods, and I got to telling him about old Mississippi days of steamboating glory and grandeur as I saw them during five years from the pilot house. He said, what a virgin subject to hurl into a magazine. I hadn't thought of that before. Would you like a series of papers to run through three months or six or nine or about four months, say? Yours ever, Mark. Howells himself had come from a family of pilots and rejoiced in the idea. A few days later, Mark Twain forwarded the first installment of the new series, those wonderful chapters that begin now with Chapter 4 in the Mississippi book. Apparently, he was not without doubt concerning the manuscript and accompanied it with a brief line. To W. D. Howells in Boston. Dear Howells, cut it, scarify it, reject it, 
handle it with entire freedom. Yours ever, Mark. But Howells had no doubts as to the quality of the new find. He declared that the piece about the Mississippi was capital, that it almost made the water in their ice pitcher turn muddy as he read it. The sketch of the low-lived little town was so good that I could have wished that there was more of it. I want the sketches, if you can make them, every month. The low-lived little town was Hannibal, and the reader can turn to the vivid description of it in the chapter already mentioned. In the same letter, Howells refers to a letter from Limerick, which he declares he shall keep until he has shown it around, especially to Aldrich and Osgood. The letter from Limerick has to do with a special episode. Mention has just been made of Mark Twain's walk with Twitchell. Frequently their walks were extended tramps, and once in a daring moment one or the other of them proposed to walk to Boston. The time was November, and the bracing air made the proposition seem attractive. They were off one morning early, Twitchell carrying a little bag, and Clemens a basket of luncheon. A few days before, Clemens had written Redpath that the Reverend J. H. Twitchell and he expected to start at eight o'clock Thursday morning to walk to Boston in twenty-four hours or more. We shall telegraph Young's Hotel for room Saturday night in order to allow for a low average of pedestrianism. They did not get quite to Boston. In fact, they got only a little farther than the twenty-eight miles they made the first day. Clemens could hardly walk next morning, but they managed to get to North Ashford, where they took a carriage for the nearest railway station. There they telegraphed to Redpath and Howells that they would be in Boston that evening. Howells, of course, had a good supper and good company awaiting them at his home, and the pedestrians spent two happy days visiting and recounting their adventures. It was one morning at his hotel that Mark Twain wrote the Limerick letter. It was addressed to Mrs. Clemens, but was really intended for Howells and Twitchell, and the others whom it mentions. It was an amusing fancy, rather than a letter, but it deserves place here. To Mrs. Clemens, intended for Howells, Aldrich, etc. Boston, November 16, 1874. Dear Livy, you observe I still call this beloved old place by the name it had when I was young. Limerick. It is enough to make a body sick. The gentlemen in waiting stare to see me sit here telegraphing this letter to you, and no doubt they are smiling in their sleeves. But let them. The slow old fashions are good enough for me, thank God, and I will none other. When I see one of these modern fools sit absorbed holding the end of a telegraph wire in his hand and reflect that a thousand miles away there is another fool hitched to the other end of it, it makes me frantic with rage. And then am I more implacably fixed and resolved than ever to continue taking twenty minutes to telegraph you what I communicate in ten seconds by the new way if I would so debase myself. And when I see a whole silent, solemn drawn room full of idiots sitting with their hands on each other's foreheads, communing, I tug the white hairs from my head and curse till my asthma brings me the blessed relief of suffocation. In our old day, such a gathering talked pure drivel and rot, mostly. But better that, a thousand times, than these dreary conversational funerals that oppress our spirits in this mad generation. It is sixty years since I was here before. I walked hither, then, with my precious old friend. It seems incredible now that we did it in two days, but such is my recollection. I no longer mention that we walk back in a single day. It makes me so furious to see doubt in the face of the hearer. Men were men in those old times. Think of one of the puerile organisms in this effeminate age attempting such a feat. My airship was delayed by a collision with a fellow from China loaded with the usual cargo of jabbering copper-colored missionaries, and so I was nearly an hour on my journey. But by the goodness of God, thirteen of the missionaries were crippled and several killed, so I was content to lose the time. I love to lose time, anyway, 
because it brings soothing reminiscences of the creeping railroad days of old, now lost to us forever. Our game was neatly played and successfully. None expected us, of course. You should have seen the guards at the Ducal Palace stare when I said, Announce His Grace the Archbishop of Dublin and the Right Honorable the Earl of Hartford. Arrived within, we were all eyes to see the Duke of Cambridge and his Duchess, wondering if we might remember their faces and they ours. In a moment, they came tottering in, he bent and withered and bald, she blooming with wholesome old age. He peered through his glasses a moment, then screeched in a reedy voice, Come to my arms, away with titles. I'll know ye by no names but Twain and Twitcher. Then fell he on our necks and jammed his trumpet in his ear, the which we filled with shoutings to this effect, God bless you, old Howells, what is left of you. We talked late that night, none of your silent idiot communings for us, of the olden time. We rolled a stream of ancient anecdotes over our tongues, and drank till the Lord Archbishop grew so mellow in the mellow past that Dublin ceased to be Dublin to him, and resumed its sweeter forgotten name of New York. In truth, he almost got back into his ancient religion too, good Jesuit, as he has always been since O'Mulligan I established that faith in the empire. And we canvassed everybody. Bailey Aldrich, Marquis of Ponkapog, came in, got nobly drunk, and told us all about how poor Osgood lost his earldom and was hanged for conspiring against the second emperor. But it didn't mention how near he himself came to being hanged too for engaging in the same enterprise. He was as chaffy as he was sixty years ago too, and swore the archbishop and I never walked to Boston but there was never a day that Ponkapog wouldn't lie, so be it by the grace of God he got the opportunity. The Lord High Admiral came in, a hale gentleman close upon seven in, bronzed by the suns and storms of many climes, and scarred with the wounds got in many battles, and I told him how I had seen him sit in a high chair and eat fruit and cakes and answer to the name of Johnny. His granddaughter, the eldest, is but lately wedded to the youngest of the Grand Dukes, and so who knows but a day may come when the blood of the Howells may reign in the land. I must not forget to say, while I think of it, that your new false teeth are done, my dear, and your wig. Keep your head well bundled with a shawl till the latter comes, and so cheat your persecuting neuralgias and rheumatisms. Would you believe it? The Duchess of Cambridge is deafer than you, deafer than her husband. They call her to breakfast with a salvo of artillery, and usually, when it thunders, she looks up expectantly and says, Come in. The monument to the author of Gloverson and his silent partners is finished. It is the stateliest and the costliest ever erected to the memory of any man. This noble classic has now been translated into all the languages of the earth, and is adored by all nations and known to all creatures. Yet I have conversed as familiarly with the author of it as I do with my own great-grandchildren. I wish you could see old Cambridge and Ponkapog. I love them as dearly as ever. But privately, my dear, they are not much improvement on idiots. It is melancholy to hear them jab over the same pointless anecdotes three and four times of an evening, forgetting that they had jabbed them over three or four times the evening before. Ponkapog still writes poetry, but the old-time fire has mostly gone out of it. Perhaps his best effort of late years is this. O oh, soul, soul, soul of mine, soul, soul, soul of thine, Thy soul, my soul, two souls entwine, And sing thy lauds in crystal wine. This he goes about repeating to everybody, daily and nightly, insomuch that he has become a sore affliction to all that know him. But I must desist. 
There are drafts here, everywhere, and my gout is something frightful. My left foot hath resemblance to a snuff bladder. God be with you, Hartford. These to Lady Hartford, in the earldom of Hartford, in the upper portion of the city of Dublin. One may imagine the joy of Howells and the others in this ludicrous extravaganza, which could have been written by no one but Mark Twain. It will hardly take rank as prophecy, though certainly true forecast in it is not wholly lacking. Clemens was now pretty well satisfied with his piloting story, but he began to have doubts as to its title, Old Times on the Mississippi. It seemed to commit him to too large an undertaking. To W. D. Howells in Boston, December 3, 1874 my dear howells let us change the heading to piloting on the mississippi in the old times or to steamboating on the mississippi in old times or to personal old times on the mississippi we could change it for february if now too late for january i suggest it because the present heading is too pretentious too broad and general it seems to command me to deliver a second book of revelation to the world and cover all the old times the mississippi dang that word it is worse than type or egypt ever saw whereas here i have finished article number three and am about to start on number four and yet i have spoken of nothing but of piloting as a science so far and i doubt if i ever get beyond that portion of my subject and i don't care to any muggins can write about old times on the mississippi of five hundred different kinds but i am the only man alive that can scribble about the piloting of that day and no man ever has tried to scribble about it yet its newness pleases me all the time and it is about the only new subject i know of if i were to write fifty articles they would all be about pilots and piloting therefore let's get the word piloting into the heading there's a sort of freshness about that, too. Yours ever, Mark. But Howells thought the title satisfactory, and indeed it was the best that could have been selected for the series. He wrote every few days of his delight in the papers, and cautioned the author not to make an attempt to please any supposed Atlantic audience, adding, Yarn it off into my sympathetic ear. Clemens replied, to W. D. Howells in Boston, Hartford, December 8, 1874. My dear Howells, it isn't the Atlantic audience that distresses me, for it is the only audience that I sit down before in perfect serenity, for the simple reason that it doesn't require a humorist to paint himself striped and stand on his head every fifteen minutes. The trouble was that I was only bent on working up an atmosphere and that is to me a most fidgety and irksome thing sometimes i avoid it usually but in this case it was absolutely necessary else every reader would be applying the atmosphere of his own or sea experiences and that shirt wouldn't fit you know i could have sent this article too a week ago or more but i couldn't bring myself to the drudgery of revising and correcting it I have been at that tedious work three hours now, and by George, but I am glad it is over. Say, I am as prompt as a clock, if I only know the day a thing is wanted. Otherwise, I am a natural procrastinaturalist. Tell me what day and date you want numbers three and four, and I will tackle and revise them, and they'll be there to the minute. I could wind up with number four, but there are some things more which I am powerfully moved to write, which is natural enough, since I am a person who would quit authorizing in a minute to go to piloting, if the madam would stand it. I would rather sink a steamboat than eat any time. My wife was afraid to write you, so I said with simplicity, I will give you the language and ideas. Through the infinite grace of God, there has not been such another insurrection in the family before as followed this. However, the letter was written, and promptly, too. 
whereas heretofore she has remained afraid to do such things. With kind regards to Mrs. Howells, yours ever, Mark. The Old Times papers appeared each month in the Atlantic until July 1875, and take rank today with Mark Twain's best work. When the first number appeared, John Hay wrote, It is perfect. No more, no less. I don't see how you do it. Which was reported to Howells, who said, What business has Hay, I should like to know, praising a favorite of mine? It's interfering. These were the days when the typewriter was new. Clemens and Twitchell, during their stay in Boston, had seen the marvel in operation, and Clemens had been unable to resist owning one. It was far from being the perfect machine of today. The letters were all capitals, and one was never quite certain even of those. Mark Twain, however, began with enthusiasm and practiced faithfully. On the day of its arrival, he wrote two letters that have survived, the first to his brother, the other to Howells. Top written letter to W. D. Howells in Boston, Hartford, December nine, eighteen seventy four. My dear Howells, I want to add a short paragraph to Article Number One when the proof comes. Merely a line or two, however. I don't know whether I'm going to make this typewriting machine go or N. T. O. That last word was intended for not. But I guess I shall make some sort of a success of it before I run it very long. I am so thick-fingered that I miss the keys. You needn't answer this. I am only practicing to get three. Another slip up there. Only practicing to get the hang of the thing. I notice I miss fire and get in a good many unnecessary letters and punctuation marks. I am simply using you for a target to bang at. Blame my cats, but this thing requires genius in order to work it just right. Yours ever. Parenthesis M. Close parenthesis. Arc. Knowing Mark Twain, Howells wrote, When you get tired of the machine, send it to me. Clemens naturally did get tired of the machine. It was ruining his morals, he said. He presently offered it to Howells, who by this time hesitated, but eventually yielded and accepted it. If he was blasted by its influence, the fact has not been recorded. One of the famous Atlantic dinners came along in December. Don't you dare to refuse that invitation, wrote Howells, to meet Emerson, Aldrich, and all those boys at the Parker House at six o'clock, Tuesday, December 15th. Come. Clemens had no desire to refuse. He sent word that he would come, and followed it with a characteristic line. To W. D. Howells in Boston. Hartford, Sunday. My dear Howells, I want you to ask Mrs. Howells to let you stay all night at the Parker House and tell lies and have an improving time, and take breakfast with me in the morning. I will have a good room for you and a fire. Can't you tell her it always makes you sick to go home late at night, or something like that? That sort of thing rouses Mrs. Clemens' sympathies easily. The only trouble is to keep them up. Twitchell and I talked till two or three in the morning the night we supped at your house, and it restored his health, on account of his being drooping for some time and made him much more robuster than what he was before. Will Mrs. Howells let you? Yours ever. S.L.C. Aldrich had issued that year a volume of poems, and he presented Clemens with a copy of it during this Boston visit. The letter of appreciation which follows contains also reference to an amusing incident, but we shall come to that presently. To T.B. Aldrich in Ponkapog, Massachusetts, Farmington Avenue, Hartford, December 18, 1874. My dear Aldrich, I read the cloth of gold through coming down in the cars, and it is just lightning poetry, a thing which it gravels me to say because my own efforts in that line have remained so persistently unrecognized in consequence of the envy and jealousy of this generation. Baby Bell always seemed perfection before, 
but now that I have children, it has got even beyond that. About the hour that I was reading it in the cars, Twitchell was reading it at home, and forthwith fell upon me with a burst of enthusiasm about it when I saw him. This was pleasant, because he has long been a lover of it. Thomas Bailey Aldridge responded, etc., in one of the brightest speeches of the evening. That is what the Tribune correspondent says, and that is what everybody that heard it said. Therefore, you keep still. Don't ever be so unwise as to go on trying to unconvince those people. I've been skating around the place all day with some girls, with Mrs. Clemens in the window to do the applause. There would be a power of fun in skating if you could do it with somebody else's muscles. There are about twenty boys booming by the house now, and it is mighty good to look at. I'm keeping you in mind, you see, in the matter of photographs. I have a couple to enclose in this letter, and I want you to say you got them, and then I shall know I have been a good, truthful child. I'm going to send more as I ferret them out about the place, and I won't forget that you are a subscriber. The wife and I unite in warm regards to you and Mrs. Aldridge. Yours ever, S. L. Clemens. A letter bearing the same date as the above went back to Howells, we find, in reference to still another incident, which perhaps should come first. Mark Twain, up to this time, had worn the black string necktie of the West, a decoration which disturbed Mrs. Clemens, and invited remarks from his friends. He had persisted in it, however, up to the date of the Atlantic dinner, when Howells and Aldrich decided that something must be done about it. To W. D. Howells in Boston, Hartford, December 18, 1874. My dear Howells, I left number three, Mississippi chapter, in my eldest's reach, and it may have gone to the postman and it likewise may have gone into the fire. I confess to a dread that the latter is the case, and that that stack of manuscript will have to be written over again. If so, oh, for the return of the lamented Herod. You and Aldrich have made one woman deeply and sincerely grateful, Mrs. Clemens. For months, I may even say years, she had shown unaccountable animosity toward my necktie even getting up in the night to take it with the tongs and blackguard it, sometimes also going so far as to threaten it. When I said you and Aldrich had given me two new neckties and that they were in a paper in my overcoat pocket, she was in a fever of happiness until she found I was going to frame them. Then all the venom in her nature gathered itself together, insomuch that I, being near to a door, went without perceiving danger. Now I wear one of the new neckties, nothing being sacred in Mrs. Clemens' eyes that can be perverted to a god that shall make the person of her husband more alluring than it was aforetime. Joe Twitcher was the delightedest old boy I ever saw when he read the words you had written in that book. He and I went to the concert of the Yale students last night and had a good time. Mrs. Clemens dreads our going to New Orleans, but I tell her she'll have to give her consent this time. With kindest regards unto you both, yours ever, S. L. Clemens. The reference to New Orleans at the end of this letter grew naturally out of the enthusiasm aroused by the Mississippi papers. The more Clemens wrote about the river, the more he wished to revisit it and take Howells with him. Howells was willing enough to go, and they eventually arranged to take their wives on the excursion. This seemed all very well and possible, so long as the time was set for some date in the future still unfixed. But Howells was a busy editor, and it was much more easy for him to promise good-naturedly than to agree on a definite time of departure. He explained at length why he could not make the journey, and added, "'Forgive me having led you on to fix a time.' I never thought it would come to that. I supposed you would die or something. I am really more sorry and ashamed than I can make it appear. So the beautiful plan was put aside, though it was not entirely abandoned for a long time. 
We now come to the incident mentioned in Mark Twain's letter to Aldrich of December the 18th. It had its beginning at the Atlantic dinner where Aldrich had abused Clemens for never sending him any photographs of himself. It was suggested by one or the other that his name be put down as a regular subscriber for all Mark Twain photographs as they came out. Clemens returned home and hunted up 52 different specimens, put each into an envelope, and began mailing them to him, one each morning. When a few of them had arrived, Aldrich wrote, protesting. The police, he said, have a way of swooping down on that kind of publication. The other day they gobbled up an entire edition of The Life in New York. Whereupon Clemens bundled up the remaining collection, 45 envelopes of photographs and prints, and mailed them together. Aldrich wrote now, violently declaring the perpetrator of the outrage to be known to the police, that a sprawling yellow figure against a green background had been recognized as an admirable likeness of Mark Twain, alias the Jumping Frog, a well-known Californian desperado formerly the chief of Henry Plummer's band of road agents in Montana. The letter was signed T. Bailey, Chief of Police. On the back of the envelope, T. Bailey had also written that it was no use for the person to send any more letters, as the post office at that point was to be blown up. Forty-eight hogshead of nitroglycerin had been surreptitiously introduced into the cellar of the building, and more was expected. R. W. E., H. W. L., O. W. H., and other conspirators in masks have been seen flitting about the town for some days past. The greatest excitement combined with the most intense quietness reigns at Ponkapog. End of section 15. Recording by James K. White, Chula Vista. Section 16 of The Letters of Mark Twain Complete. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by James K. White. The Letters of Mark Twain Complete by Mark Twain. Volume 2, Chapter 15. Letters from Hartford, 1875. Much correspondence with Howells. Orion Clemens had kept his job with Bliss only a short time. His mental makeup was such that it was difficult for him to hold any position long. He meant to do well, but he was unfortunate in his efforts. His ideas were seldom practical. His nature was yielding and fickle. He had returned to Keokuk presently, and being convinced there was a fortune in chickens, had prevailed upon his brother to purchase for him a little farm not far from the town. But the chicken business was not lively, and Orion kept the mail hot with manuscripts and propositions of every sort, which he wanted his brother to take under advisement. Certainly to Mark Twain, Orion Clemens was a trial. The letters of the latter show that scarcely one of them but contains the outline of some rainbow-chasing scheme, full of wild optimism, and the certainty that somewhere just ahead lies the pot of gold. Only now and then there is a letter of abject humiliation and complete surrender, when some golden vision, some iridescent soap-bubble, had vanished at his touch. Such depression did not last. By sunrise he was ready with a new dream, new enthusiasm, and with a new letter inviting his brother Sam's interest and investment. Yet his fear of incurring his brother's displeasure was pitiful, regardless of the fact that he constantly employed the very means to ensure that result. At one time Clemens made him sign a sworn agreement that he would not suggest any plan or scheme of investment for the period of twelve months. Orion must have kept this agreement. He would have gone to the stake before he would have violated an oath, but the stake would have probably been no greater punishment than his sufferings that year. On the whole, Samuel Clemens was surprisingly patient and considerate with Orion, and there was never a time that he was not willing to help. Yet there were bound to be moments of exasperation, 
and once, when his mother or sister had written, suggesting that he encourage his brother's efforts, he felt moved to write at considerable freedom. To Mrs. Jane Clemens and Mrs. Moffat in Fredonia, New York, Hartford, Sunday, 1875. My dear mother and sister, I saw Governor Newell today, and he said he was still moving in the matter of Sammy's appointment as a West Point cadet, and would stick to it till it got a result of a positive nature one way or the other, but thus far he did not know whether to expect success or defeat. Ma, whenever you need money, I hope you won't be backward about saying so. You can always have it. We stint ourselves in some ways, but we have no desire to stint you, and we don't intend to, either. I can't encourage Orion. Nobody can do that, conscientiously, for the reason that before one's letter has time to reach him, he is off on some new wild goose chase. Would you encourage in literature a man who, the older he grows, the worse he writes? Would you encourage Orion in the glaring insanity of studying law? If he were packed and crammed full of law, it would be worthless lumber to him, for his is such a capricious and ill-regulated mind that he would apply the principles of the law with no more judgment than a child of ten years. I know what I am saying. I laid one of the plainest and simplest of legal questions before Orion once and the helpless and hopeless mess he made of it was absolutely astonishing. Nothing aggravates me so much as to have Orion mention law or literature to me. Well, I cannot encourage him to try the ministry, because he would change his religion so fast that he would have to keep a traveling agent under wages to go ahead of him to engage pulpits and board for him. I cannot conscientiously encourage him to do anything but potter around his little farm and put in his odd hours contriving new and impossible projects at the rate of 365 a year, which is his customary average. He says he did well in Hannibal. Now there's a man who ought to be entirely satisfied with the grandeurs, emoluments, and activities of a hen farm. If you ask me to pity Orion, I can do that. I can do it every day and all day long but one can't encourage Quicksilver, because the instant you put your finger on it, it isn't there. No, I am saying too much. He does stick to his literary and legal aspirations, and he naturally would select the very two things which he is wholly and preposterously unfitted for. If I ever become able, I mean to put Orion on a regular pension without revealing the fact that it is a pension. That is best for him. Let him consider it a periodical loan, and pay interest out of the principal. Within a year's time he would be looking upon himself as a benefactor of mine, in the way of furnishing me a good permanent investment for money, and that would make him happy and satisfied with himself. If he had money, he would share with me in a moment, and I have no disposition to be stingy with him. Affectionately, Sam. Livy sends love. The New Orleans plan was not wholly dead at this time. Howells wrote near the end of January that the matter was still being debated now and then, but was far from being decided upon. He hoped to go somewhere with Mrs. Howells for a brief time in March, he said. Clemens, in haste, replied. To W. D. Howells in Boston. Hartford, January 26, 1875. My dear Howells, when Mrs. Clemens read your letter, she said, Well, then, wherever they go in March, the direction will be southward, and so they must give us a visit on the way. I do not know what sort of control you may be under, but when my wife speaks as positively as that, I am not in the habit of talking back and getting into trouble. Situated as I am, I would not be able to understand now how you could pass by this town without feeling that you were running a wanton risk and doing a daredevil thing. I consider it settled that you are to come in March, and I would be sincerely sorry to learn that you and Mrs. Howells feel differently about it. 
the piloting material has been uncovering itself by degrees until it has exposed such a huge hoard to my view that a whole book will be required to contain it if i use it so i have agreed to write the book for bliss the book idea was later given up for the time being i won't be able to run the articles in the atlantic later than the september number for the reason that a subscription book issued in the fall has a much larger sale than if issued at any other season of the year it is funny when i reflect that when i originally wrote you and proposed to do from six to nine articles for the magazine the vague thought in my mind was that six might exhaust the material and nine would be pretty sure to do it or rather it seems to me that that was my thought can't tell at this distance but in truth nine chapters don't now seem to more than open up the subject fairly and start the yarn to wagon i have been sick a bed several days for the first time in twenty-one years how little confirmed invalids appreciate their advantages i was able to read the english edition of the greville memoirs through without interruption take my meals in bed neglect all business without a pang and smoke eighteen cigars a day I try not to look back upon these twenty-one years with a feeling of resentment, and yet the partialities of Providence do seem to me to be slathered around, as one may say, without that gravity and attention to detail which the real importance of the matter would seem to suggest. Yours ever, Mark. The New Orleans idea continued to haunt the letters. The thought of drifting down the Mississippi so attracted both Clemens and Howells that they talked of it when they met, and wrote of it when they were separated. Howells, beset by uncertainties, playfully tried to put the responsibility upon his wife. Once he wrote, She says in the noblest way, Well, go to New Orleans if you want to so much. You know the tone. I suppose it will do if I let you know about the middle of February but they had to give it up in the end howells wrote that he had been under the weather and on half work the whole winter he did not feel that he had earned his salary he said or that he was warranted in taking a three weeks pleasure trip clemens offered to pay all the expenses of the trip but only indefinite postponement followed it would be seven years more before mark twain would return to the river and then not with howells in a former chapter, mention has been made of Charles Warren Stoddard, whom Mark Twain had known in his California days. He was fond of Stoddard, who was a facile and pleasing writer of poems and descriptive articles. During the period that he had been acting as Mark Twain's secretary in London, he had taken pleasure in collecting for him the news reports of the celebrated Tishborne Claimant case, then in the English courts. Clemens thought of founding a story on it and did, in fact, use the idea, though the American claimant, which he wrote years later, had little or no connection with the Tishborne episode. To C. W. Stoddard, Hartford, February 1, 1875. Dear Charlie, I'll write about the Tishborne scrapbooks. Send them along when convenient. I mean to have the Beecher Tilton trial scrapbook as a companion. I am writing a series of seven page articles for the Atlantic at twenty dollars a page, but as they do not pay anybody else as much as that, I do not complain, though at the same time I do swear that I am not content. However, the awful respectability of the magazine makes up. I have cut your articles about San Marco out of a New York paper. Joe Twitcher saw it and brought it home to me with loud admiration, and sent it to Howells. It is too bad to fool away such good literature in a perishable daily journal. Do remember us kindly to Lady Hardy and all that rare family. My wife and I so often have pleasant talks about them. Ever your friend, Samuel L. Clemens. The price received by Mark Twain for the Mississippi papers, as quoted in this letter, furnishes us with a realizing sense of the improvement in the literary market, with the advent of a flood of cheap magazines and the Sunday newspaper. 
the atlantic page probably contained about a thousand words which would make his price average say two cents per word thirty years later when his fame was not much more extended his pay for the same matter would have been fifteen times as great that is to say at the rate of thirty cents per word but in that early time there were no sunday magazines no literary magazines at all except the atlantic and harper's and a few fashion periodicals probably there were newsstands but it is hard to imagine what they must have looked like without the gay pictorial cover femininity that today pleases and elevates the public and makes author and artist affluent clemens worked steadily on the river chapters and howells was always praising him and urging him to go on at the end of january he wrote you're doing the science of piloting splendidly every word's interesting and don't you drop the series till you've got every bit of anecdote and reminiscence into it to w d howells in boston hartford february tenth eighteen seventy five my dear howells your praises of my literature gave me the solidest gratification but i never did have the fullest confidence in my critical penetration and now your verdict on s has knocked what little i did have gully west i didn't enjoy his gush but i thought a lot of his similes were ever so vivid and good but it's just my luck every time i go into convulsions of admiration over a picture and want to buy it right away before i've lost a chance some wretch who really understands art comes along and damns it but i don't mind i would rather have my ignorance than another man's knowledge because i have got so much more of it i send you number five today i have written and rewritten the first half of it three different times yesterday and today and at last mrs clemens says it will do i never saw a woman so hard to please about things she doesn't know anything about yours ever mark of course the reference to his wife's criticism in this is tenderly playful as always of a pattern with the severity which he pretends for her in the next to mrs w d howells in boston eighteen seventy five dear mrs howells mrs clemens is delighted to get the pictures and so am i i can perceive in the group that mr howells is feeling as i so often feel viz well no doubt i'm in the wrong though i do not know how or where or why but anyway it will be safest to look meek and walk circumspectly for a while and not discuss the thing and you look exactly as mrs clemens does after she has said indeed i do not wonder that you can frame no reply for you know only too well that your conduct admits of no excuse palliation or argument none i shall just delight in that group on account of the good old human domestic spirit that pervades it bother these family groups that put on a state aspect to get their pictures taken in we want a heliotype made of our eldest daughter how soft and rich and lovely the picture is mr howells must tell me how to proceed in the matter truly yours samuel l clemens in the next letter we have a picture of susie clemens's third birthday certainly a pretty picture and as sweet and luminous and tender to-day as it was forty years ago as it will be a hundred years hence if these lines should survive that long footnote this spelling of the name s u s y was adopted somewhat later and much preferred it appears as s u s i e in most of the earlier letters End of footnote. the letter is to her uncle charles langdon the charlie of the quaker city atwater was associated with the langdon coal interests in elmira the play is of course the gilded age to charles langdon in elmira march nineteenth eighteen seventy five dear charlie livy after reading your letter used her severest form of expression about mr atwater to wit she did not approve of his conduct this made me shudder 
for it was equivalent to Alice Spalding saying Mr. Atwater is a mean thing, or Reverend Thomas Beecher's saying, Damn that Atwater, or my saying, I wish Atwater was three hundred million miles in blank. However, Livy does not often get into one of these furies, God be thanked. In Brooklyn, Baltimore, Washington, Cincinnati, St. Louis, and Chicago, the play paid me an average of nine hundred dollars a week. In smaller towns, the average is four hundred to five hundred dollars. This is Susie's birthday. Lizzie brought her in at eight thirty this morning before we were up, hooded with a blanket, red curl papers in her hair, a great red japonica in one hand for Livy, and a yellow rosebud nestled in violets for my buttonhole in the other and she looked wonderfully pretty. She delivered her memorials and received her birthday kisses. Livy laid her japonica down to get a better holt for kissing, which Susie presently perceived and became thoughtful, then said sorrowfully, turning the great deeps of her eyes upon her mother, Don't you care for you now? Right after breakfast, we got up a rousing wood fire in the main hall. It is a cold morning illuminated the place with a rich glow from all the globes of the newel chandelier, spread a bright rug before the fire, set a circling row of chairs, pink ones and dove-colored, and in the midst a low invalid table covered with a fanciful cloth and laden with the presents, a pink azalea in lavish bloom from Rosa, a gold-inscribed Russia leather Bible from Patrick and Mary, a gold ring inscribed from Maggie Cook, a silver thimble, inscribed with motto and initials, from Lizzie, a rattling mob of Sunday-clad dolls from Livy and Annie, and a Noah's Ark from me, containing two hundred wooden animals, such as only a human being could create, and only God could call by name without referring to the passenger list. Then the family and the seven servants assembled there, and Susie and the bay arrived in state from above the bay's head being fearfully and wonderfully decorated with a profusion of blazing red flowers and overflowing cataracts of lycopodium. We congratulatory notes accompanied the presence of the servants. I tell you, it was a great occasion, and a striking and cheery group, taking all the surroundings into account and the wintry aspect outside. Remainder Missing there was to be a centennial celebration that year of the battles of Lexington and Concord, and Howells wrote, urging Clemens and his wife to visit them and attend it. Mrs. Clemens did not go, and Clemens and Howells did not go either, to the celebration. They had their own ideas about getting there, but found themselves unable to board the thronged train at Concord, and went tramping about in the cold and mud, hunting a conveyance, only to return at length to the cheer of the home, defeated and rather low in spirits. Twitchell, who went on his own hook, had no such difficulties. To Howells, Mark Twain wrote the adventures of this athletic and strenuous exponent of the gospel. The Winnie mentioned in this letter was Howells' daughter Winifred. She had unusual gifts, but did not live to develop them. To W. D. Howells in Boston Farmington Avenue, Hartford, April 23, 1875. My dear Howells, I've got Mrs. Clemens' picture before me and hope I shall not forget to send it with this. Joe Twitchell preached morning and evening here last Sunday, took midnight train for Boston, got an early breakfast, and started by rail at 7.30 a.m. for Concord, swelled around there until 1 p.m., seeing everything, then traveled on top of a train to Lexington, saw everything there, traveled on top of a train to Boston, with hundreds in company, deluged with dust, smoke, and cinders, yelled and hurrahed all the way like a schoolboy, lay flat down to dodge numerous bridges, and sailed into the depot, howling with excitement and as black as a chimney sweep, got to Young's Hotel at 7 p.m., sat down in reading room, and immediately fell asleep, was promptly awakened by a porter who supposed he was drunk, 
wandered around an hour and a half, then took 9 p.m. train, sat down in smoking car, and remembered nothing more until awakened by a conductor as the train came into Hartford at 1.30 a.m. Thinks he had simply a glorious time and wouldn't have missed the centennial for the world. He would have run out to see us a moment at Cambridge, but was too dirty. I wouldn't have wanted him there. His appalling energy would have been an insufferable reproach to mild adventurers like you and me. Well, he is welcome to the good time he had. I had a deal better one. My narrative has made Mrs. Clemens wish she could have been there. When I think over what a splendid good sociable time I had in your house, I feel ever so thankful to the wise providence that thwarted our several ably planned and ingenious attempts to get to Lexington. I am coming again before long, and then she shall be of the party. Now, you said that you and Mrs. House could run down here nearly any Saturday. Very well, then, let us call it next Saturday, for a starter. Can you do that? By that time it will really be spring, and you won't freeze. The birds are already out. A small one paid us a visit yesterday. We entertained it and let it go again. Susie protesting. The spring laziness is already upon me, insomuch that the spirit begins to move me to cease from Mississippi articles and everything else and give myself over to idleness until we go to New Orleans. I have one article already finished, but somehow it doesn't seem as proper a chapter to close with as the one already in your hands. I hope to get in a mood and rattle off a good one to finish with but just now all my moods are lazy ones. Winnie's literature sings through me yet. Surely that child has one of these futures before her. Now try to come, will you? With the warmest regards of the two of us, yours ever, S. L. Clemens. Mrs. Clemens sent a note to Mrs. Howells, which will serve as a pendant to the foregoing. From Mrs. Clemens to Mrs. Howells in Boston. My dear Mrs. Howells, Don't dream for one instant that my not getting a letter from you kept me from Boston. I am too anxious to go to let such a thing as that keep me. Mr. Clemens did have such a good time with you and Mr. Howells. He evidently has no regret that he did not get to the centennial. I was driven nearly distracted by his long account of Mr. Howells and his wanderings. I would keep asking if they ever got there. He would never answer, but made me listen to a very minute account of everything that they did. At last I found them back where they started from. If you find misspelled words in this note, you will remember my infirmity, and not hold me responsible. Affectionately yours, Livy L. Clemens. In spite of his success with the Sellers play and his itch to follow it up, Mark Twain realized what he believed to be his literary limitations. All his life he was inclined to consider himself wanting in the finer gifts of character shading and delicate portrayal. Remembering Huck Finn and the rare presentation of Joan of Arc, we may not altogether agree with him. Certainly he was never qualified to delineate those fine artificialities of life which we are likely to associate with culture, and perhaps it was something of this sort that caused the hesitation confessed in the letter that follows. Whether the plan suggested interested Howells or not, we do not know. In later years Howells wrote a novel called The Story of a Play. This may have been its beginning. To W. D. Howells in Boston, Farmington Avenue, Hartford, April 26, 1875. My dear Howells, an actor named D. H. Hawkins has been here to ask me to put upon paper a five-act play which he has been mapping out in his mind for three or four years. He sat down and told me his plot all through, in a clear, bright way, and I was a deal taken with it, but it is a line of characters whose fine shading and artistic development requires an abler hand than mine, so I easily perceived that I must not make the attempt. But I liked the man, and thought there was a good deal of stuff in him, and therefore I wanted his play to be written, and by a capable hand, too. 
So I suggested you, and said I would write and see if you would be willing to undertake it. If you like the idea, he will call upon you in the course of two or three weeks and describe his plot and his characters. Then, if it doesn't strike you favorably, of course you can simply decline. But it seems to me well worth while that you should hear what he has to say. You could also average him while he talks, and judge whether he could play your priest though I doubt if any man can do that justice. Shan't I write him and say he may call? If you wish to communicate directly with him instead, his address is Larchmont Manor, Westchester County, New York. Do you know the chill of that 19th of April seems to be in my bones yet? I am inert and drowsy all the time. That was villainous weather for a couple of wandering children to be out in. Yours ever, Mark. The sinister typewriter did not find its way to Howells for nearly a year. Meantime, Mark Twain had refused to allow the manufacturers to advertise his ownership. He wrote to them. Hartford, March 19, 1875 Please do not use my name in any way. Please do not even divulge the fact that I own a machine. I have entirely stopped using the typewriter for the reason that I never could write a letter with it to anybody without receiving a request by return mail that I would not only describe the machine but state what progress I had made in the use of it, etc., etc. I don't like to write letters, and so I don't want people to know I own this curiosity-breeding little joker. Three months later, the machine was still in his possession. Bliss had traded a twelve-dollar saddle for it, but apparently showed little enthusiasm in his new possession. To W. D. Howells in Boston, June 25, 1875. My dear Howells, I told Patrick to get some carpenters and box the machine and send it to you, and found that Bliss had sent for the machine and earned it off. I have been talking to you and writing to you as if you were present when I traded the machine to Bliss for a twelve-dollar saddle worth twenty-five dollars, cheating him outrageously, of course, but conscience got the upper hand again, and I told him before I left the premises that I'd pay for the saddle if he didn't like the machine, on condition that he donate said machine to a charity. This was a little over five weeks ago so I had long ago concluded that Bliss didn't want the machine and did want the saddle. Wherefore, I jumped at the chance of shoving the machine off onto you. Saddle or no saddle, so I got the blame thing out of my sight. The saddle hangs on Tara's walls down below in the stable, and the machine is at Bliss's grimly pursuing its appointed mission, slowly and implacably rotting away another man's chances for salvation. I have sent Bliss word not to donate it to a charity, though it is a pity to fool away a chance to do a charity an ill turn, but to let me know when he has got his dose, because I've got another candidate for damnation. You just wait a couple of weeks, and if you don't see the typewriter come tilting along toward Cambridge with an unsatisfied appetite in its eye, I lose my guess. Don't you be mad about this blunder, Howells. It only comes of a bad memory, and the stupidity which is inseparable from true genius. Nothing intentionally criminal in it. Yours ever, Mark. It was November when Howells finally fell under the baleful influence of the machine. He wrote, The typewriter came Wednesday night and is already beginning to have its effect on me. Of course, it doesn't work. If I can persuade some of the letters to get up against the ribbon, they won't get down again without digital assistance. The treadle refuses to have any part or parcel in the performance, and I don't know how to get the roller to turn with the paper. Nevertheless, I have begun several letters to my D.A.R. Lemons, as it prefers to spell your respected name, and I don't despair yet of sending you something in its beautiful handwriting, after I've had a man out from the agents to put it in order. It's fascinating in the meantime, and it wastes my time like an old friend. The Clemens family remained in Hartford that summer, 
with the exception of a brief season at Bateman's Point, Rhode Island, near Newport. By this time Mark Twain had taken up and finished the Tom Sawyer story begun two years before. Naturally he wished Howells to consider the manuscript. To W. D. Howells in Boston, Hartford, July 5th, 1875. My dear Howells, I have finished the story and didn't take the chap beyond boyhood. I believe it would be fatal to do it in any shape but autobiographically, like Gil Blass. I perhaps made a mistake in not writing it in the first person. If I went on now and took him into manhood, he would be just like all the one-horse men in literature, and the reader would conceive a hearty contempt for him. It is not a boy's book at all. It will only be read by adults. It is only written for adults. Moreover, the book is plenty long enough as it stands. It is about 900 pages of manuscript, and may be a thousand when I shall have finished working up vague places, so it would make from 130 to 150 pages of the Atlantic, about what the foregone conclusion made, isn't it? I would dearly like to see it in the Atlantic, but I doubt if it would pay the publishers to buy the privilege, or me to sell it. Bret Hart has sold his novel, same size as mine, I should say, to Scribner's Monthly for $6,500, publication to begin in September, I think, and he gets a royalty of 7.5% from Bliss in book form afterwards. He gets a royalty of 10% on it in England, issued in serial numbers, and the same royalty on it in book form afterwards, and is to receive an advance payment of £500 the day the first number of the serial appears. If I could do as well here and there with mine, it might possibly pay me, but I seriously doubt it, though it is likely I could do better in England than Brett, who is not widely known there. You see, I take a vile, mercenary view of things, but then my household expenses are something almost ghastly. By and by, I shall take a boy of twelve and run him on through life, in the first person, but not Tom Sawyer. He would not be a good character for it. I wish you would promise to read the manuscript of Tom Sawyer sometime and see if you don't really decide that I am right in closing with him as a boy and point out the most glaring defects for me. It is a tremendous favor to ask and I expect you to refuse and would be ashamed to expect you to do otherwise. But the thing has been so many months in my mind that it seems a relief to snake it out. I don't know any other person whose judgment I could venture to take fully and entirely. Don't hesitate about saying no, for I know how your time is taxed, and I would have honest need to blush if you said yes. Osgood and I are going for the puppy G on infringement of trademark. To win one or two suits of this kind will set literary folks on a firmer bottom. I wish Osgood would sue for stealing Holmes's poem. Wouldn't it be gorgeous to sue R for petty larceny? I will promise to go into court and swear I think him capable of stealing peanuts from a blind peddler. Yours ever, Clemens. Of course, Howells promptly replied that he would read the story, adding, You've no idea what I may ask you to do for me some day. I'm sorry that you can't do it for the Atlantic, but I succumb. Perhaps you will do boy number two for us. Clemens, conscience-stricken, meantime hastily put the manuscript out of reach of temptation. To W. D. Howells in Boston, July 13, 1875. My dear Howells, Just as soon as you consented, I realized all the atrocity of my request and straightway blushed and weakened. I telegraphed my theatrical agent to come here and carry off the manuscript and copy it. But I will gladly send it to you if you will do as follows. Dramatize it, if you perceive that you can, and take, for your remuneration, half of the first $6,000 which I receive for its representation on the stage. You could alter the plot entirely if you chose. 
I could help in the work most cheerfully after you had arranged the plot. I have my eye upon two young girls who can play Tom and Hook. I believe a good deal of a drama can be made of it. Come, can't you tackle this in the odd hours of your vacation, or later if you prefer? I do wish you could come down once more before your holiday. I'd give anything. Yours ever, Mark. Howells wrote that he had no time for the dramatization and urged Clemens to undertake it himself. He was ready to read the story whenever it should arrive. Clemens did not hurry, however. The publication of Tom Sawyer could wait. He already had a book in press, the volume of sketches new and old, which he had prepared for Bliss several years before. Sketches was issued that autumn, and Howells gave it a good notice, possibly better than it deserved. Considered among Mark Twain's books today, the collection of sketches does not seem especially important. With the exception of the frog story and the true story, most of those included might be spared. Clemens himself confessed to Howells that he wished, when it was too late, that he had destroyed a number of them. The book, however, was distinguished in a special way. It contains Mark Twain's first utterance in print on the subject of copyright a matter in which he never again lost interest. The absurdity and injustice of the copyright laws both amused and irritated him, and in the course of time he would be largely instrumental in their improvement. In the book, his open petition to Congress that all property rights, as well as literary ownership, should be put on the copyright basis and limited to a beneficent term of 42 years, was more or less of a joke but, like so many of Mark Twain's jokes, it was founded on reason and justice. He had another idea that was not a joke, an early plan in the direction of international copyright. It was to be a petition signed by the leading American authors, asking the United States to declare itself to be the first to stand for right and justice by enacting laws against the piracy of foreign books. It was a rather utopian scheme, as most schemes for moral progress are in their beginning. It would not be likely ever to reach Congress, but it would appeal to Howells and his Cambridge friends. Clemens wrote, outlining his plan of action. To W. D. Howells in Boston, Hartford, September 18, 1875. My dear Howells, my plan is this. You are to get Mr. Lowell and Mr. Longfellow to be the first signers of my copyright petition. You must sign it yourself and get Mr. Whittier to do likewise. Then Holmes will sign. He said he would if he didn't have to stand at the head. Then I'm fixed. I will then put a gentlemanly chap under wages and send him personally to every author of distinction in the country and corral the rest of the signatures. Then I'll have the whole thing lithographed, about a thousand copies, and move upon the President and Congress in person, but in the subordinate capacity of a party who is merely the agent of better and wiser men, men whom the country cannot venture to laugh at. I will ask the President to recommend the thing in his message, and if he should ask me to sit down and frame the paragraph for him, I should blush, but still I would frame it. Next, I would get a prime leader in Congress. I would also see that votes enough to carry the measure were privately secured before the bill was offered. This I would try through my leader and my friends there. And then, if Europe chose to go on stealing from us, we would say, with noble enthusiasm, American lawmakers do steal, but not from foreign authors, not from foreign authors. You see, what I want to drive into the Congressional mind is the simple fact that the moral law is, Thou shalt not steal, no matter what Europe may do. I swear I can't see any use in robbing European authors for the benefit of American booksellers anyway. If we can ever get this thing through Congress, we can try making copyright perpetual some day. There would be no sort of use in it since only one book in a hundred millions outlives the present copyright term. 
no sort of use except that the writer of that one book have his rights, which is something. If we only had some God in the country's laws, instead of being in such a sweat to get him into the Constitution, it would be better all around. The only man who ever signed my petition with alacrity and said that the fact that a thing was right was all sufficient was Rev. Dr. Bushnell. I have lost my old petition, which was brief, but will draft and enclose another, not in the words it ought to be, but in the substance. I want Mr. Lowell to furnish the words, and the ideas, too, if he will do it. Say, Redpath beseeches me to lecture in Boston in November. Telegraphs that Beecher's and Nast's withdrawal has put him in the tightest kind of a place. So I guess I'll do that old roughing it lecture over again in November and repeat it two or three times in New York while I'm at it. Can I take a carriage after the lecture and go out and stay with you that night, provided you find at that distant time that it will not inconvenience you? Is Aldrich home yet? With love to you all, yours ever, S.L.C. Of course, the petition never reached Congress. Holmes' comment that governments were not in the habit of setting themselves up as high moral examples except for revenue was shared by too many others. The petition was tabled, but Clemens never abandoned his purpose and lived to see most of his dream fulfilled. Meantime, Howell's notice of the sketches appeared in the Atlantic and brought grateful acknowledgment from the author. To W. D. Howells in Boston Hartford, October 19, 1875 My dear Howells, that is a perfectly superb notice. You can easily believe that nothing ever gratified me so much before. The newspaper praises bestowed upon the innocents abroad were large and generous, but somehow I hadn't confidence in the critical judgment of the parties who furnished them. You know how that is, yourself, from reading the newspaper notices of your own books. They gratify a body, but they always leave a small pang behind in the shape of a fear that the critic's good words could not safely be depended upon as authority. Yours is the recognized critical court of last resort in this country. From its decision there is no appeal. And so, to have gained this decree of yours before I am forty years old, I regard as a thing to be right down proud of. Mrs. Clemens says, Tell him I am just as grateful to him as I can be. It sounds as if she were grateful to you for heroically trampling the truth underfoot in order to praise me, but in reality it means that she is grateful to you for being bold enough to utter a truth which she fully believes all competent people know, but which none has heretofore been brave enough to utter. You see, the thing that gravels her is that I am so persistently glorified as a mere buffoon, as if that entirely covered my case, which she denies with venom. The other day Mrs. Clemens was planning a visit to you, and so I am waiting with a pleasurable hope for the result of her deliberations. We are expecting visitors every day now from New York, and afterwards some are to come from Elmira. I judge that we should then be free to go Bostonward. I should be just delighted, because we could visit in comfort, since we shouldn't have to do any shopping. Did it all in New York last week, and a tremendous pull it was, too. Mrs. C. said the other day, we will go to Cambridge if we have to walk, for I don't believe we can ever get the houses to come here again until we have been there. I was gratified to see that there was one string anyway that could take her to Cambridge. But I will do her the justice to say that she is always wanting to go to Cambridge, independent of the selfish desire to get a visit out of you by it. I want her to get started now, before children's diseases are fashionable again, because they always play such hob with visiting arrangements. With love to you all, yours ever, S. L. Clemens. Mark Twain's trips to Boston were usually made alone. Women require more preparation to go visiting, and Mrs. Clemens and Mrs. Howells seem to have exchanged visits infrequently. For Mark Twain, perhaps, it was just as well that his wife did not always go with him. 
his absent-mindedness and boyish ingeniousness often led him into difficulties which Mrs. Clemens sometimes found embarrassing. In the foregoing letter they were planning a visit to Cambridge. In the one that follows they seem to have made it, with certain results, perhaps, not altogether amusing at the moment. To W. D. Howells in Boston, October 4, 75. My dear Howells, we had a royal good time at your house, and have had a royal good time ever since, talking about it, both privately and with the neighbors. Mrs. Clemens's bodily strength came up handsomely under that cheery respite from household and nursery cares. I do hope that Mrs. Howells's didn't go correspondingly down, under the added burden to her cares and responsibilities. Of course, I didn't expect to get through without committing some crimes and hearing of them afterwards, so I have taken the inevitable lashings and been able to hum a tune while the punishment went on. I caught it for letting Mrs. Howells bother and bother about her coffee when it was a good deal better than we get at home. I caught it for interrupting Mrs. C. at the last moment and losing her the opportunity to urge you not to forget to send her that manuscript when the printers are done with it. I caught it once more for personating that drunken Colonel James. I caught it for mentioning that Mr. Longfellow's picture was slightly damaged, and when, after a lull in the storm, I confessed, shamefacedly, that I had privately suggested to you that we hadn't any frames, and that if you wouldn't mind hinting to Mr. Houghton, etc., 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 the madam was simply speechless for the space of a minute. Then she said, How could you, youth? The idea of sending Mr. Howells, with his sensitive nature, upon such a repulsive air. Oh, Howells won't mind it. You don't know Howells. Howells is a man who... She was gone. But George was the first person she stumbled on in the hall, so she took it out on George. I was glad of that, because it saved the babies. I've got another rattling good character for my novel. That great work is mulling itself into shape gradually. Mrs. Clemens sends love to Mrs. Howells. Meantime, she is diligently laying up material for a letter to her. Yours ever, Mark. The George of this letter was Mark Twain's colored butler, a valued and even beloved member of the household, a most picturesque character, who one day came to wash windows, as Clemens used to say, and remained eighteen years. The fiction of Mrs. Clemens' severity he always found amusing, because of its entire contrast with the reality of her gentle heart. Clemens carried the Tom Sawyer manuscript to Boston himself, and placed it in Howell's hands. Howells had begged to be allowed to see the story, and Mrs. Clemens was especially anxious that he should do so. She had doubts as to certain portions of it, and had the fullest faith in Howells' opinion. It was a gratifying one when it came. Howells wrote, I finished reading Tom Sawyer a week ago, sitting up till 1 a.m. to get to the end, simply because it was impossible to leave off. It's altogether the best boy's story I ever read. It will be an immense success, but I think you ought to treat it explicitly as a boy's story. Grown-ups will enjoy it just as much if you do, and if you should put it forth as a study of boy character from the grown-up point of view, you give the wrong key to it. The adventures are enchanting. I wish I had been on that island. The treasure hunting, the loss in the cave, it's all exciting and splendid. I shouldn't think of publishing this story serially. Give me a hint when it's to be out, and I'll start the sheep to jumping in the right places. Meaning that he would have an advance review ready for publication in the Atlantic, which was a leader of criticism in America. Mark Twain was writing a great deal at this time. Howells was always urging him to send something to the Atlantic, declaring a willingness to have his name appear every month in their pages, and Clemens was generally contributing some story or sketch. The proof, referred to in the next letter, was one of these articles. To W. D. Howells in Boston, Hartford, November 23, 75. My dear Howells, herewith is the proof. 
in spite of myself, how awkwardly I do jumble words together, and how often I do use three words where one would answer, a thing I am always trying to guard against. I shall become as slovenly a writer as Charles Francis Adams, if I don't look out. That is said in jest, because of course I do not seriously fear getting so bad as that. I never shall drop so far toward his and Bret Hart's level as to catch myself saying, it must have been wiser to have believed that he might have accomplished it if he could have felt that he would have been supported by those who should have etc. 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 The reference to Bret Hart reminds me that I often accuse him of being a deliberate imitator of Dickens, and this in turn reminds me that I have charged unconscious plagiarism upon Charlie Warner and this in turn reminds me that I have been delighting my soul for two weeks over a brand new and ingenious way of beginning a novel, and behold, all at once it flashes upon me that Charlie Warner originated the idea three years ago and told me about it. Aha! Uh -huh. So much for self-righteousness. I am well repaid. Here are a hundred eight pages of manuscript, new and clean lying disgraced in the waste paper basket and i am beginning the novel over again in an unstolen way i would not wonder if i am the worst literary thief in the world without knowing it it is glorious news that you like tom sawyer so well i mean to see to it that your review of it shall have plenty of time to appear before the other notices Mrs. Clemens decides with you that the book should issue as a book for boys, pure and simple, and so do I. It is surely the correct idea. As to that last chapter, I think of just leaving it off and adding nothing in its place. Something told me that the book was done when I got to that point, and so the strong temptation to put Huck's life at the widow's into detail, instead of generalizing it in a paragraph, was resisted just send sawyer to me by express i enclose money for it if it should get lost it will be no great matter company interfered last night and so private theatricals goes over till this evening to be read aloud mrs clemens is mad but the story will take that all out this is going to be a splendid winter night for fireside reading anyway I am almost at a dead standstill with my new story on account of the misery of having to do it all over again. We all send love to you all. Yours ever, Mark. The story referred to may have been any one of several begun by him at this time. His head was full of ideas for literature of every sort. Many of his beginnings came to nothing for the reason that he started wrong or with no definitely formed plan. Others of his literary enterprises were condemned by his wife for their grotesqueness or for the offense they might give in one way or another, however worthy the intention behind them. Once he wrote a burlesque on family history, the autobiography of a damned fool. Livy wouldn't have it, he said later. So I gave it up. The world is indebted to Mark Twain's wife, for the check she put upon his fantastic or violent impulses. She was his public, his best public, clear-headed and wise. That he realized this and was willing to yield was by no means the least of his good fortunes. We may believe that he did not always yield easily, and perhaps sometimes only out of love for her. In the letter which he wrote her on her thirtieth birthday, we realize something of what she had come to mean in his life. To Mrs. Clemens on her thirtieth birthday, Hartford, November 27, 1875. Livy, darling, six years have gone by since I made my first great success in life and won you, and thirty years have passed since Providence made preparation for that happy success by sending you into the world. Every day we live together adds to the security of my confidence that we can never any more wish to be separated than that we can ever imagine a regret that we were ever joined. You are dearer to me today, my child, than you were upon the last anniversary of this birthday. 
you were dearer then than you were a year before you have grown more and more dear from the first of those anniversaries and i do not doubt that this precious progression will continue on to the end let us look forward to the coming anniversaries with their age and their gray hairs without fear and without depression trusting and believing that the love we bear each other will be sufficient to make them blessed so with abounding affection for you and our babies i hail this day that brings you the matronly grace and dignity of three decades always yours s l c end of section sixteen recording by james k white chula vista Section 17 of The Letters of Mark Twain Complete. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by James K. White. The Letters of Mark Twain Complete by Mark Twain. Volume 3, Chapter 16. Letters, 1876 chiefly to w d howells literature and politics planning a play with bret hart the monday evening club of hartford was an association of most of the literary talent of that city and it included a number of very distinguished members the writers the editors the lawyers and the ministers of the gospel who composed it were more often than not men of national or international distinction there was but one paper at each meeting and it was likely to be a paper that would later find its way into some magazine naturally mark twain was one of its favorite members and his contributions never failed to arouse interest and discussion a mark twain night brought out every member in the next letter we find the first mention of one of his most memorable contributions a story of one of life's moral aspects the tale now included in his collected works is, for some reason, little read today. Yet the curious allegory, so vivid in its seeming reality, is well worth consideration. To W. D. Howells in Boston, Hartford, January 11, 76. My dear Howells, indeed we haven't forgotten the Howellses, nor scored up a grudge of any kind against them but the fact is i was under the doctor's hands for four weeks on a stretch and have been disabled from working for a week or so beside i thought i was well about ten days ago so i sent for a shorthand writer and dictated answers to a bushel or so of letters that had been accumulating during my illness getting everything shipshape and cleared up i went to work next day upon an atlantic article which ought to be worth twenty dollars per page which is the price they usually pay for my work, I believe, for although it is only seventy pages manuscript, less than two days' work, counting by bulk, I have spent three more days trimming, altering, and working at it. I shall put in one more day's polishing on it, and then read it before our club, which is to meet at our house Monday evening, the twenty-fourth instant. I think it will bring out considerable discussion among the gentlemen of the club, though the title of the article would not give them much notion of what is to follow this title being the facts concerning the recent carnival of crime in connecticut which reminds me that today's tribune says there will be a startling article in the current atlantic in which a being which is tangible but invisible will figure exactly the case with the sketch of mine which i am talking about however mine can lie unpublished a year or two as well as not though i wish that contributor of yours had not interfered with his coincidence of heroes but what i am coming at is this won't you and mrs howells come down saturday the twenty-second and remain to the club on monday night we always have a rattling good time at the club and we do want you to come ever so much will you now say you will mrs clemens and i are persuading ourselves that 
you twain will come my volume of sketches is doing very well considering the times received my quarterly statement today from bliss by which i perceive that twenty thousand copies have been sold or rather twenty thousand had been sold three weeks ago a lot more by this time no doubt i am on the sick list again and was day before yesterday but on the whole i am getting along yours ever mark howells wrote that he could not come down to the club meeting adding that sickness was quite out of character for mark twain and hardly fair on a man who had made so many other people feel well he closed by urging that bliss hurry out tom sawyer that boy is going to make a prodigious hit clemens answered to w d howells in boston hartford january eighteen seventy six my dear howells thanks and ever so many for the good opinion of tom sawyer williams has made about three hundred rattling pictures for it some of them very dainty poor devil what a genius he has and how he does murder it with rum he takes a book of mine and without suggestion from anybody builds no end of pictures just from his reading of it there was never a man in the world so grateful to another as i was to you day before yesterday when i sat down in still rather wretched health to set myself to the dreary and hateful task of making final revision of tom sawyer and discovered upon opening the package of manuscript that your pencil marks were scattered all along this was splendid and swept away all labor instead of reading the manuscript i simply hunted out the pencil marks and made the emendations which they suggested i reduced the boy battle to a curt paragraph i finally concluded to cut the sunday school speech down to the first two sentences leaving no suggestion of satire since the book is to be for boys and girls i tamed the various obscenities until i judged that they no longer carried offence so at a single sitting i began and finished a revision which i had supposed would occupy three or four days and leave me mentally and physically fagged out at the end i was careful not to inflict the manuscript upon you until i had thoroughly and painstakingly revised it therefore the only faults left were those that would discover themselves to others not me and these you had pointed out there was one expression which perhaps you overlooked when Huck is complaining to Tom of the rigorous system in vogue at the widows, he says the servants harass him with all manner of compulsory decencies, and he winds up saying, And they comb me all to hell. No exclamation point. Long ago, when I read that to Mrs. Clemens, she made no comment. Another time I created occasion to read that chapter to her aunt and her mother both sensitive and loyal subjects of the kingdom of heaven so to speak and they let it pass i was glad for it was the most natural remark in the world for that boy to make and he had been allowed few privileges of speech in the book when i saw that you two had let it go without protest i was glad and afraid too afraid you hadn't observed it did you and did you question the propriety of it since the book is now professedly and confessedly a boys and girls book that darn word bothers me some nights but it never did until i had ceased to regard the volume as being for adults don't bother to answer now for you've writing enough to do without allowing me to add to the burden but tell me when you see me again which we do hope will be next saturday or sunday or monday couldn't you come now and mull over the alterations which you are going to make in your manuscript and make them after you go back wouldn't it assist the work if you dropped out of harness and routine for a day or two and have that sort of revivification which comes of a holiday forgetfulness of the workshop i can always work after i've been to your house and if you will come to mine now and hear the club toot their various horns over the exasperating metaphysical question which i mean to lay before them in the disguise of a literary extravaganza it would just brace you up like a cordial 
I feel sort of mean trying to persuade a man to put down a critical piece of work at a critical time, but yet I am honest in thinking it would not hurt the work nor impair your interest in it to come under the circumstances. Mrs. Clemens says, maybe the houses could come Monday if they cannot come Saturday. Ask them. It is worth trying. Well, how's that? Could you? It would be splendid if you could. Drop me a postal card. I should have a twinge of conscience if I forced you to write a letter. I am honest about that. And if you find you can't make out to come, tell me that you bodies will come the next Saturday, if the thing is possible, and stay over Sunday. Yours ever, Mark. Howells, however, did not come to the club meeting, but promised to come soon when they could have a quiet time to themselves together. As to Huck's language, he declared, I'd have that swearing out in an instant. I suppose I didn't notice it because the locution was so familiar to my western sense, and so exactly the thing that Huck would say. Clemens changed the phrase to, They comb me all to thunder, and it stands today. The Carnival of Crime, having served its purpose at the club, found quick acceptance by Howells for the Atlantic. He was so pleased with it, in fact, that somewhat later he wrote, urging that its author allow it to be printed in a dainty book by Osgood, who made a specialty of fine publishing. Meantime, Howells had written his Atlantic notice of Tom Sawyer, and now enclosed Clemens a proof of it. We may judge from the reply that it was satisfactory to w d howells in boston april three seventy six my dear howells it is a splendid notice and will embolden weak kneed journalistic admirers to speak out and will modify or shut up the unfriendly to fear god and dread the sunday school exactly described that old feeling which i used to have but i couldn't have formulated it i want to enclose one of the illustrations in this letter if I do not forget it. Of course, the book is to be elaborately illustrated, and I think that many of the pictures are considerably above the American average, in conception, if not in execution. I do not re-enclose your review to you, for you have evidently read and corrected it, and so I judge you do not need it. About two days after the Atlantic issues, I mean to begin to send books to principal journals and magazines. I read the Carnival of Crime Proof in New York when worn and witless, and so left some things unamended which I might possibly have altered had I been at home. For instance, I shall always address you in your own sniveling drawl, baby. I saw that you objected to something there, but I did not understand what. Was it that it was too personal? Should the language be altered, or the hyphens taken out? Won't you please fix it the way it ought to be, altering the language as you choose, only making it bitter and contemptuous? Deuced was not strong enough, so I met you halfway with devilish. Mrs. Clemens has returned from New York with dreadful sore throat and bones racked with rheumatism. She keeps her bed. Aloha Nui, as the Kanakas say. Mark. Henry Irving once said to Mark Twain, You made a mistake by not adopting the stage as a profession. You would have made even a greater actor than a writer. Mark Twain would have made an actor, certainly, but not a very tractable one. His appearance in Hartford, in The Loan of a Lover, was a distinguished event, and his success complete though he made so many extemporaneous improvements on the lines of thick-headed Peter Spuck that he kept the other actors guessing as to their cues and nearly broke up the performance. It was, of course, an amateur benefit, though Augustine Daly promptly wrote, offering to put it on for a long run. The skeleton novelette mentioned in the next letter refers to a plan concocted by Howells and Clemens by which each of twelve authors was to write a story using the same plot, blindfolded as to what the others had written. 
it was a regular mark twain notion and it is hard today to imagine howells continued enthusiasm in it neither he nor clemens gave up the idea for a long time it appears in their letters again and again though perhaps it was just as well for literature that it was never carried out to w d howells in boston april twenty two eighteen seventy six my dear howells you'll see per enclosed slip that i appear for the first time on the stage next wednesday you and mrs h come down and you shall skip in free i wrote my skeleton novelette yesterday and today it will make a little under twelve pages please tell aldrich i have got a photographer engaged and tri weekly issue is about to begin show him the canvas and specimens and beseech him to subscribe ever yours s l c in his next letter mark twain explains why tom sawyer is not to appear as soon as planned the reference to the literary nightmare refers to the punch conductor punch with care sketch which had recently appeared in the atlantic many other versifiers had had their turn at horse-car poetry and now a publisher was anxious to collect it in a book provided he could use the atlantic sketch clemens does not tell us here the nature of carleton's insult forgiveness of which he was not yet qualified to grant but there are at least two stories about it or two halves of the same incident as related afterward by clemens and canton clemens said that when he took the jumping frog book to carleton in eighteen sixty seven the latter pointing to his stock said rather scornfully books i don't want your book my shelves are full of books now though the reader may remember that it was carleton himself who had given the frog story to the saturday press and had seen it become famous carleton's half of the story was that he did not accept mark twain's book because the author looked so disreputable long afterward when the two men met in europe the publisher said to the now rich and famous author mr clemens my one claim on immortality is that i declined your first book to w d howells in boston hartford april twenty five eighteen seventy six my dear howells thanks for giving me the place of honor bliss made a failure in the matter of getting tom sawyer ready on time the engravers assisting as usual i went down to see how much of a delay there was going to be and found that the man had not even put a canvasser on or issued an advertisement yet in fact that the electrotypes would not all be done for a month but of course the main fact was that no canvassing had been done because a subscription harvest is before publication not after when people have discovered how bad one's book is well yesterday i put in the current an editorial paragraph stating that tom sawyer is ready to issue but publication is put off in order to secure english copyright by simultaneous publication there and here the english edition is unavoidably delayed you see part of that is true very well when i observed that my sketches had dropped from a sale of six or seven thousand a month down to twelve hundred a month i said this ain't no time to be publishing books therefore let tom lie still till autumn mr bliss and make a holiday book of him to beguile the young people with all i shall print items occasionally still further delaying tom till i ease him down to autumn without shock to the waiting world as to that literary nightmare proposition i am obliged to withhold consent for what seems a good reason to wit a single page of horse-car poetry is all that the average reader can stand without nausea now to stack together all of it that has been written and then add it to my article would be to enrage and disgust each and every reader and win the deathless enmity of the lot even if that reason were insufficient there would still be a sufficient reason left in the fact that mr carlton seems to be the publisher of the magazine in which it is proposed to publish this horse-car matter carlton insulted me in february eighteen sixty seven and so when the day arrives that sees me doing him a civility i shall feel that i am ready for paradise 
since my list of possible and impossible forgivenesses will then be complete. Mrs. Clemens says my version of the blindfold novelette, A Murder and a Marriage, is good. Pretty strong language for her. The Fieldses are coming down to the play tomorrow, and they promise to get you and Mrs. Howells to come too, but I hope you'll do nothing of the kind if it will inconvenience you, for I'm not going to play either strikingly bad enough or well enough to make the journey pay you. My wife and I think of going to Boston May 7th to see Anna Dickinson's debut on the 8th. If I find we can go, I'll try to get a stage box, and then you and Mrs. Howells must come to Parker's and go with us to the crucifixion. Is that spelt right? Somehow it doesn't look right. With our very kindest regards to the whole family, yours ever, Mark. The mention of Anna Dickinson at the end of this letter recalls a prominent reformer and lecturer of the Civil War period. She had begun her crusades against temperance and slavery in 1857, when she was but fifteen years old, when her success as a speaker had been immediate and extraordinary. Now, in this later period, at the age of thirty-four, she aspired to the stage, unfortunately for her, as her gifts lay elsewhere. Clemens and Howells knew Miss Dickinson, and were anxious for the success which they hardly dared hope for. Clemens arranged a box party. To W. D. Howells in Boston, May 4, 76. My dear Howells, I shall reach Boston on Monday the 8th, either at 4.30 p.m. or 6 p.m., which is best, and go straight to Parker's. If you and Mrs. Howells cannot be there by half past four, I'll not plan to arrive till the later train time, six, because I don't want to be there alone, even a minute. Still, Joe Twitchell will doubtless go with me. Forgot that. He is going to try hard to. Mrs. Clemens has given up going because Susie is just recovering from about the savagest assault of diphtheria a child ever did recover from, and therefore will not be entirely her health itself again by the 8th. Would you and Mrs. Howells like to invite Mr. and Mrs. Aldrich? I have a large proscenium box, plenty of room. Use your own pleasure about it. I mainly, that is honest, suggested because I am seeking to make matters pleasant for you and Mrs. Howells. I invited Twitcher because I thought I knew you'd like that. I want you to fix it so that you and the madam can remain in Boston all night, for I leave next day and we can't have a talk otherwise. I am going to get two rooms in a parlor and would like to know what you decide about the Aldriches, so as to know whether to apply for an additional bedroom or not. Don't dine that evening, for I shall arrive dinnerless and need your help. I'll bring my blindfold novelette, but shan't exhibit it unless you exhibit yours. You would simply go to work and write a novelette that would make mine sick, because you would know all about where my weak points lay. No, sir, I'm one of these old wary birds. Don't bother to write a letter. Three lines on a postal card is all that I can permit from a busy man. Yours ever, Mark. P.S. Good. You'll not have to feel any call to mention that debut in the Atlantic. They've made me pay the grand cash for my box, a thing which most managers would be too worldly wise to do with journalistic folks. But I'm most honestly glad, for I'd rather pay three prices any time than to have my tongue half paralyzed with a deadhead ticket. Hang that Anna Dickinson. A body can never depend upon her debuts. She has made five or six false starts already. If she fails to debut this time, I will never bet on her again. In his book, My Mark Twain, Howells refers to the tragedy of Miss Dickinson's appearance. She was the author of numerous plays, some of which were successful, but her career as an actress was never brilliant. At Elmira that summer, the Clemenses heard from their good friend Dr. Brown of Edinburgh and sent eager replies. 
to Dr. John Brown in Edinburgh, Elmira, New York, U.S., June 22, 1876. Dear friend the doctor, it was a perfect delight to see the well-known handwriting again, but we so grieve to know that you are feeling miserable. It must not last. It cannot last. The regal summer is come, and it will smile you into high good cheer. It will charm away your pains. It will banish your distresses. I wish you were here to spend the summer with us. We are perched on a hilltop that overlooks a little world of green valleys, shining rivers, sumptuous forests, and billowy uplands veiled in the haze of distance. We have no neighbors. It is the quietest of all quiet places, and we are hermits that eschew caves and live in the sun. Doctor, if you'd only come. I will carry your letter to Mrs. C. now, and there will be a glad woman, I tell you. And she shall find one of those pictures to put in this for Mrs. Barclays, and if there isn't one here, we'll send right away to Hartford and get one. Come over, Dr. John, and bring the Barclays, the Nicholsons, and the Browns, one and all. Affectionately, Samuel L. Clemens from May until August, no letters appear to have passed between Clemens and Howells. The latter finally wrote, complaining of the lack of news. He was in the midst of campaign activities, he said, writing a life of Hayes, and gaily added, You know I wrote the life of Lincoln, which elected him. He further reported a comedy he had completed and gave Clemens a general stirring up as to his own work. Mark Twain, in his hillside study, was busy enough. Summer was his time for work, and he had tried his hand in various directions. His mention of Huck Finn in his reply to Howells is interesting in that it shows the measure of his enthusiasm, or lack of it, as a gauge of his ultimate achievement. To W. D. Howells in Boston, Elmira, August 9, 1876. My dear Howells, I was just about to write you when your letter came, and not one of those obscene postal cards either, but reverently upon paper. I shall read that biography, though the letter of acceptance was amply sufficient to corral my vote without any further knowledge of the man, which reminds me that a campaign club in Jersey City wrote a few days ago and invited me to be present at the raising of a Tilden and Hendricks flag there, and to take the stand and give them some counsel. Well, I could not go, but gave them counsel and advice by letter, and in the kindliest terms as to the raising of the flag, advised them not to raise it. Get your book out quick, for this is a momentous time. If Tilden is elected, I think the entire country will go pretty straight to Mrs. Howell's bad place. I am infringing on your patent. I started a record of our children's sayings last night, which reminds me that last week I sent down and got Susie a vast pair of shoes of a most villainous pattern, for I discovered that her feet were being twisted and cramped out of shape by a smaller and prettier article. She did not complain, but looked degraded and injured. At night her mamma gave her the usual admonition when she was about to say her prayers, to wit, now, Susie, think about God. Mama, I can't with those shoes. The farm is perfectly delightful this season. It is as quiet and peaceful as a South Sea island. Some of the sunsets which we have witnessed from this commanding eminence were marvelous. One evening, a rainbow spanned an entire range of hills with its mighty arch, and from a black hub resting upon the hilltop in the exact center, black rays diverged upward in perfect regularity to the rainbow's arch, and created a very strongly defined and altogether the most majestic, magnificent, and startling half-sunk wagon wheel you can imagine. After that, a world of tumbling and prodigious clouds came drifting up out of the west and took to themselves a wonderfully rich and brilliant green color, the decided green of new spring foliage. Close by them we saw the intense blue of the skies, through rents in the cloud rack, 
and away off in another quarter were drifting clouds of a delicate pink color. In one place hung a pile of dense black clouds like compacted pitch smoke, and the stupendous wagon wheel was still in the supremacy of its unspeakable grandeur. So you see, the colors present in the sky at once and the same time were blue, green, pink, black, and the vari-colored splendors of the rainbow. All strong and decided colors, too. I don't know whether this weird and astounding spectacle most suggested heaven or hell. The wonder, with its constant, stately, and always surprising changes, lasted upwards of two hours, and we all stood on the top of the hill by my study till the final miracle was complete and the greatest day ended that we ever saw. Our farmer, who was a grave man, watched that spectacle to the end and then observed that it was damn funny. The double-barreled novel lies torpid. I found I could not go on with it. The chapters I had written were still too new and familiar to me. I may take it up next winter, but cannot tell yet. I waited and waited to see if my interest in it would not revive, but gave it up a month ago and began another boy's book, more to be at work than anything else. I have written four hundred pages on it, therefore it is very nearly half done. It is Huck Finn's autobiography. I like it only tolerably well, as far as I have got, and may possibly pigeonhole or burn the manuscript when it is done. So the comedy is done, and with a fair degree of satisfaction. That rejoices me and makes me mad, too, for I can't plan a comedy, and what have you done that God should be so good to you? I have racked myself bald-headed trying to plan a comedy harness for some promising characters of mine to work in, and had to give it up. It is a noble lot of blooded stock and worth no end of money, but they must stand in the stable and be profitless. I want to be present when the comedy is produced and help enjoy the success. Warner's book is mighty readable, I think. Love to yous. Yours ever, Mark. Howells promptly wrote again, urging him to enter the campaign for Hayes. There is not another man in this country, he said, who could help him so much as you. The farce, which Clemens refers to in his reply, was the parlor car, which seems to have been about the first venture of Howells in that field. To W. D. Howells in Boston. Elmira, August 23, 1876. My dear Howells, I am glad you think I could do Hayes any good, for I have been wanting to write a letter or make a speech to that end. I'll be careful not to do either, however, until the opportunity comes in a natural, justifiable, and unlugged way, and shall not then do anything unless I have got it all digested and worded just right. In which case I might do some good, in any other I should do harm. When a humorist ventures upon the grave concerns of life, he must do his job better than another man, or he works harm to his cause. The farce is wonderfully bright and delicious, and must make a hit. You read it to me, and it was mighty good. I read it last night, and it was better. I read it aloud to the household this morning, and it was better than ever. So it would be worth going a long way to see it well played. For without any question, an actor of genius always adds a subtle something to any man's work that none but the writer knew was there before, even if he knew it. I have heard of readers convulsing audiences with my Aurelia's unfortunate young man. If there is anything really funny in the piece, the author is not aware of it. All right. Advertise me for the new volume. I send you herewith a sketch which will make three pages of the Atlantic. If you like it and accept it, you should get it into the December number, because I shall read it in public in Boston the 13th and 14th of November. If it went in a month earlier, it would be too old for me to read except as old matter, and if it went in a month later, it would be too old for the Atlantic. Do you see? And if you wish to use it, will you set it up now? and send me three proofs, one to correct for Atlantic, one to send to Temple Bar, 
shall i tell them to use it not earlier than their november number and one to use in practicing for my boston readings we must get up a less elaborate and a much better skeleton plan for the blindfold novels and make a success of that idea david gray spent sunday here and said we could but little comprehend what a rattling stir that thing would make in the country he thought it would make a mighty strike so do i but with only eight pages to tell the tale in the plot must be less elaborate doubtless what do you think when we exchange visits i'll show you an unfinished sketch of elizabeth's time which shook david gray's system up pretty exhaustively yours ever mark the manuscript sketch mentioned in the foregoing letter was the canvasser's tale later included in the volume tom sawyer abroad and other stories it is far from being mark twain's best work but was accepted and printed in the atlantic david gray was an able journalist and editor whom mark twain had known in buffalo the sketch of elizabeth's time is a brilliant piece of writing an imaginary record of conversation and court manners in the good old days of free speech and performance phrased in the language of the period gray john hay twitchell and others who had a chance to see it thought highly of it and hay had it set in type and a few proofs taken for private circulation some years afterward a west point officer had a special font of antique type made for it and printed a hundred copies but the present-day reader would hardly be willing to include fireside conversation in the time of queen elizabeth in mark twain's collected works clemens was a strong republican in those days as his letters of this period show his mention of the caves in the next is another reference to the canvasser's tale to w d howells in boston september fourteen eighteen seventy six my dear howells yes the collection of caves was the origin of it i changed it to echoes because these being invisible and intangible constituted a still more absurd species of property and yet a man could really own an echo and sell it too for a high figure such an echo as that at the villa seminetti two miles from milan for instance my first purpose was to have the man make a collection of caves and afterwards of echoes but perceived that the element of absurdity and impracticability was so nearly identical as to amount to a repetition of an idea i will not and do not believe that there is a possibility of hayes's defeat but i want the victory to be sweeping it seems odd to find myself interested in an election i never was before and i can't seem to get over my repugnance to reading or thinking about politics yet but in truth i care little about any party's politics the man behind it is the important thing you may well know that mrs clemens liked the parlor car enjoyed it ever so much and was indignant at you all through and kept exploding into rages at you for pretending that such a woman ever existed closing each and every explosion with but it is just what such a woman would do it is just what such a woman would say they all voted the parlor car perfection except me i said they wouldn't have been allowed to court and quarrel there so long uninterrupted but at each critical moment the odious train boy would come in and pile foul literature all over them four or five inches deep and the lover would turn his head aside and curse and presently that train boy would be back again as on all those western roads to take up the literature and leave prize candy of course the thing is perfect in the magazine without the train boy but i was thinking of the stage and the groundlings if the dainty touches went over their heads the train boy and other possible interruptions would fetch them every time would it mar the flow of the thing too much to insert that devil i thought it over a couple of hours and concluded it wouldn't and that he ought to be in for the sake of the groundlings and to get new copyright on the piece and it seemed to me that now that the fourth act is so successfully written why not go ahead and write the three preceding acts and then after it is finished let me put into it a low comedy character 
the girl's or the lover's father or uncle, and gobble a big pecuniary interest in your work for myself. Do not let this generous proposition disturb your rest, but do write the other three acts, and then it will be valuable to managers, and don't go and sell it to anybody, like Hart, but keep it for yourself. Hart's play can be doctored till it will be entirely acceptable, and then it will clear a great sum every year. I am out of all patience with Hart for selling it. The play entertained me hugely, even in its present crude state. Love to y'all. Yours ever, Mark. Following the seller's success, Clemens had made many attempts at dramatic writing. Such undertakings had uniformly failed, but he had always been willing to try again. In the next letter we get the beginning of what proved his first and last direct literary association, that is to say, collaboration, with Bret Hart. Clemens had great admiration for Hart's ability and believed that between them they could turn out a successful play. Whether or not this belief was justified will appear later. Howell's biography of Hayes, meanwhile, had not gone well. He reported that only 2,000 copies had been sold in what was now the height of the campaign. There's success for you, he said. It makes me despair of the Republic. Clemens, on his part, had made a speech for Hayes that Howells declared had put civil service reform in a nutshell. He added, You are the only Republican orator quoted without distinction of party by all the newspapers. To W. D. Howells in Boston, Hartford, October 11, 1876. My dear Howells, this is a secret to be known to nobody but you. Of course, I comprehend that Mrs. Howells is part of you. That Bret Hart came up here the other day and asked me to help him write a play and divide the swag, and I agreed. I am to put in Scotty Briggs, see Buck Fanshawe's funeral in Roughing It, and he is to put in a Chinaman, a wonderfully funny creature, as Brett presents him, for five minutes in his Sandy Bar play. This Chinaman is to be the character of the play, and both of us will work on him and develop him. Brett is to draw a plot, and I am to do the same. We shall use the best of the two or gouge from both and build a third. My plot is built. Finished it yesterday. Six days' work, eight or nine hours a day, and has nearly killed me. Now, the favor I ask of you is that you will have the words Ah, Sin, a drama, printed in the middle of a notepaper page and send the same to me with Bill. We don't want anybody to know that we are building this play. I can't get this title page printed here without having to lie so much that the thought of it is disagreeable to one reared as I have been, and yet the title of the play must be printed. The rest of the application for copyright is allowable in penmanship. We have got the very best gang of servants in America now. When George first came, he was one of the most religious of men. He had but one fault, young George Washington's. But I have trained him. And now it fairly breaks Mrs. Clemens' heart to hear George stand at that front door and lie to the unwelcome visitor. But your time is valuable. I must not dwell upon these things. I'll ask Warner and Hart if they'll do blindfold novelettes. Sometime I'll simplify that plot. All it needs is that the hanging and the marriage shall not be appointed for the same day. I got over that difficulty but it required too much manuscript to reconcile the thing, so the movement of the story was clogged. I came near agreeing to make political speeches with our candidate for governor the 16th and 23rd instant, but I had to give up the idea, for Hart and I will be here at work then. Yours ever, Mark. Mark Twain was writing few letters these days to anyone but Howells, Yet in November, he sent one to an old friend of his youth, Burrow, the literary chairmaker who had roomed with him in the days when he had been setting type for the St. Louis Evening News. To Mr. Burrow of St. Louis, Hartford, 
November 1, 1876. My dear Burroughs, as you describe me, I can picture myself as I was 20 years ago. The portrait is correct. You think I've grown some. Upon my word, there was room for it. You have described a callow fool, a self-sufficient ass, a mere human tumblebug, imagining that he is remodeling the world and is entirely capable of doing it right. Ignorance, intolerance, egotism, self-assertion, opaque perception, dense and pitiful chuckle-headedness, and an almost pathetic unconsciousness of it all. That is what I was at nineteen and twenty, and that is what the average Southerner is at sixty today. Northerners, too, of a certain grade. It is of children like this that voters are made, and such is the primal source of our government. A man hardly knows whether to swear or cry over it. I think I comprehend the position there, perfect freedom to vote just as you choose, provided you choose to vote as other people think, social ostracism otherwise. The same thing exists here among the Irish. An Irish Republican is a pariah among his people. Yet that race finds fault with the same spirit in no nothingism. Fortunately, a good deal of experience of men enabled me to choose my residence wisely. I live in the freest corner of the country. There are no social disabilities between me and my democratic personal friends. We break the bread and eat the salt of hospitality freely together and never dream of such a thing as offering impertinent interference in each other's political opinions. Don't you ever come to New York again and not run up here to see me. I suppose we were away for the summer when you were east, but no matter, you could have telegraphed and found out. We were at Elmira, New York, and right on your road, and could have given you a good time if you had allowed us the chance. Yes, Will Bowen and I have exchanged letters now and then for several years, but I suspect that I made him mad with my last, shortly after you saw him in St. Louis, I judge. There is one thing which I can't stand and won't stand from many people. That is, sham sentimentality. The kind a schoolgirl puts into a graduating composition. The sort that makes up the original poetry column of a country newspaper. The rot that deals in the happy days of yore. The sweet yet melancholy past, with its blighted hopes and its vanished dreams and all that sort of drivel. Wills were always of this stamp. I stood it years. When I get a letter like that from a grown man and he a widower with a family, it gives me the stomach ache. And I just told Will Bowen so last summer. I told him to stop being sixteen at forty. Told him to stop drooling about the sweet yet melancholy past and take a pill. I said there was but one solitary thing about the past worth remembering, and that was the fact that it is the past. Can't be restored. Well, I exaggerated some of these truths a little, but only a little. But my idea was to kill his sham sentimentality once and forever, and so make a good fellow of him again. I went to the unheard of trouble of rewriting the letter and saying the same harsh thing softly, so as to sugarcoat the anguish and make it a little more endurable, and I asked him to write and thank me honestly for doing him the best and kindliest favor that any friend ever had done him. But he hasn't done it yet. Maybe he will sometime. I am grateful to God that I got that letter off before he was married. I get that news from you. Elsie would just have slobbered all over me and drowned me when that event happened. I enclose photograph for the young ladies. I will remark that I do not wear sealskin for grandeur, but because I found, when I used to lecture in the winter, that nothing else was able to keep a man warm sometimes in these high latitudes. I wish you had sent pictures of yourself and family. I'll trade picture for picture with you, straight through, if you are commercially inclined. Your old friend Samuel L. Clemens 
End of section 17. Recording by James K. White, Chula Vista. Section 18 of the Letters of Mark Twain Complete. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by James K. White. The Letters of Mark Twain Complete by Mark Twain. Volume 3, Chapter 17. Letters 1877 to bermuda with twitchell proposition to thomas nast the whittier dinner mark twain must have been too busy to write letters that winter those that have survived are few and unimportant as a matter of fact he was writing the play ah sin with bret hart and getting it ready for production hart was a guest in the clemens home while the play was being written and not always a pleasant one. He was full of requirements, critical as to the menage, to the point of sarcasm. The long friendship between Clemens and Hart weakened under the strain of collaboration and intimate daily intercourse, never to renew its old fiber. It was an unhappy outcome of an enterprise which in itself was to prove of little profit. The play, Ah Sin, had many good features, and with Charles T. Parslow in an amusing Chinese part, might have been made a success if the two authors could have harmoniously undertaken the needed repairs. It opened in Washington in May, and a letter from Parslow, written at the moment, gives a hint of the situation. From Charles T. Parslow to S. L. Clemens, Washington, D.C., May eleventh, 1877. Mr. Clemens, I forgot whether I acknowledged receipt of check by telegram. Hart has been here since Monday last, and done little or nothing yet, but promises to have something fixed by tomorrow morning. We have been making some improvements among ourselves. The last act is weak at the end, and I do hope Mr. Hart will have something for a good finish to the piece. The other acts, I think, are all right, now. Hope you have entirely recovered. I am not very well myself. The excitement of a first night is bad enough, but to have the annoyance with heart that I have is too much for a beginner. I ain't used to it. The houses have been picking up since Tuesday. Mr. Ford has worked well and hard for us. Yours in haste, Charles Thomas Parslow. The play drew some good houses in Washington, but it could not hold them for a run. Never mind what was the matter with it. Perhaps a very small change at the right point would have turned it into a fine success. We have seen in a former letter the obligation which Mark Twain confessed to Hart, a debt he had tried in many ways to repay, obtaining for him a liberal book contract with Bliss, advancing him frequent and large sums of money which Hart could not or did not repay, seeking to advance his fortunes in many directions. The mistake came when he introduced another genius into the intricacies of his daily life. Clemens went down to Washington during the early rehearsals of Ah Sin. Meantime, Rutherford B. Hayes had been elected president, and Clemens one day called with a letter of introduction from Howells, thinking to meet the chief executive. His own letter to Howells later probably does not give the real reason of his failure but it will be amusing to those who recall the erratic personality of George Francis Train. Train and Twain were sometimes confused by the very unlettered, or pretendedly by Mark Twain's friends. To W. D. Howells in Boston, Baltimore, May 1, 77. My dear Howells, found I was not absolutely needed in Washington, so I only stayed twenty-four hours, and am on my way home now. I called at the White House and got admission to Colonel Rogers, because I wanted to inquire what was the right hour to go and infest the President. It was my luck to strike the place in the dead waste and middle of the day, the very busiest time. I perceived that Mr. Rogers took me for George Francis Train, 
and had made up his mind not to let me get at the president. So at the end of half an hour, I took my letter of introduction from the table and went away. It was a great pity all round, and a great loss to the nation, for I was brim full of the Eastern question. I didn't get to see the president or the chief magistrate either, though I had sort of a glimpse of a lady at a window who resembled her portraits. Yours ever, Mark. Howells condoled with him on his failure to see the president. But, he added, if you and I had both been there, our combined skill would have no doubt procured us to be expelled from the White House by Fred Douglas. But the thing seems to be a complete failure as it was. Douglas, at this time being the Marshal of Columbia, gives special point to Howells' suggestion. Later, in May, Clemens took Twitchell for an excursion to Bermuda. He had begged Howells to go with them, but Howells, as usual, was full of literary affairs. Twitchell and Clemens spent four glorious days tramping the length and breadth of the beautiful island, and remembered it always as one of their happiest adventures. Put it down as an oasis, wrote Twitchell on his return. I'm afraid I shall not see as green a spot again soon. And it was your invention and your gift, and your company was the best of it. Indeed, I never took more comfort in being with you than on this journey, which, my boy, is saying a great deal. To Howells, Clemens triumphantly reported the success of the excursion. To W. D. Howells in Boston, Farmington Avenue, Hartford, May 29, 1877. Confound you! Joe Twitchell and I roamed about Bermuda day and night and never ceased to gabble and enjoy. About half the talk was, it is a burning shame that Howells isn't here. Nobody could get at the very meat and marrow of this pervading charm and deliciousness like Howells. How Howells would revel in the quaintness and the simplicity of this people and the Sabbath repose of this land. What an imperishable sketch Howells would make of Captain West, the whaler, and Captain Hope, with the patient, pathetic face, wander in all the oceans for forty-two years, lucky in none, coming home defeated once more, now, minus his ship, resigned, uncomplaining, being used to this. What a rattling chapter Howells would make out of the small boy Alfred, with his alert eye and military brevity and exactness of speech, and out of the old landlady, and her sacred onions, and her daughter, and the visiting clergyman, and the ancient pianos of Hamilton, and the venerable music in vogue there, and forty other things which we shall leave untouched, or touched, but lightly upon, we not being worthy. Damn Howells for not being here. This usually from me, not Twitchell. Oh, your insufferable pride, which will have a fall some day. If you had gone with us and let me pay the fifty dollars which the trip and the board and the various knick-knacks and mementos would cost, I would have picked up enough droppings from your conversation to pay me five hundred percent profit in the way of the several magazine articles which I could have written, whereas I can now write only one or two, and am therefore largely out of pocket by your proud ways. Ponder these things. Lord, what a perfectly bewitching excursion it was. I traveled under an assumed name and was never molested with a polite attention from anybody. Love to you all. Yours ever. Mark. Aldrich, meantime, had invited the Clemenses to Ponkapog during the Bermuda absence, and Clemens hastened to send him a line expressing regrets. At the close, he said, to T. B. Aldrich in Ponkapog, Massachusetts, Farmington Avenue, Hartford, June 3, 1877. Day after tomorrow, we leave for the hills beyond Elmira, New York, for the summer, when I shall hope to write a book of some sort or other to beat the people with. A work similar to your new one in the Atlantic is what I mean, though I have not heard what the nature of that one is. 
immoral, I suppose. Well, you are right. Such books sell best, Howells says. Howells says he is going to make his next book indelicate. He says he thinks there is money in it. He says there is a large class of the young in schools and seminaries who... But you let him tell you. He has ciphered it all down to a demonstration. With the warmest remembrances to the pair of you, ever yours, Samuel L. Clemens. Clemens would naturally write something about Bermuda, and began at once, Random Notes of an Idle Excursion, and presently completed four papers which Howells eagerly accepted for the Atlantic. Then we find him plunging into another play, this time alone. To W. D. Howells in Boston, Elmira, June 27, 1877. My dear Howells, if you should not like the first two chapters, send them to me and begin with chapter three, or part three, I believe you call these things in the magazine. I have finished number four, which closes the series, and will mail it tomorrow if I think of it. I like this one. I like the preceding one, already mailed to you some time ago, but I had my doubts about one and two. Do not hesitate to squelch them, even with derision and insult. Today I am deep in a comedy which I began this morning. Principal character, that old detective, I skeletoned the first act and wrote the second today, and am dog-tired now. Fifty-four close pages of manuscript in seven hours. Once I wrote fifty-five pages at a sitting. That was on the opening chapters of the Gilded Age novel. When I cool down an hour from now, I shall go to zero, I judge. Yours ever, Mark. Clemens had doubts as to the quality of the Bermuda papers, and with some reason. They did not represent him at his best. Nevertheless, they were pleasantly entertaining, and Howells expressed full approval of them for Atlantic use. The author remained troubled. To W. D. Howells in Boston, Elmira, July 4, 1877. My dear Howells, it is splendid of you to say those pleasant things, but I am still plagued with doubts about parts one and two. If you have any, don't print. If otherwise, please make some cold villain like Lathrop read and pass sentence on them. Mind, I thought they were good, at first. It was the second reading that accomplished its hellish purpose on me. Put them up for a new verdict. Part four has lain in my pigeonhole a good while, and when I put it there, I had a Christian's confidence in four aces in it, and you can be sure it will skip toward Connecticut tomorrow before any fatal fresh reading makes me draw my bet. I've piled up 151 manuscript pages on my comedy. The first, second, and fourth acts are done, and done to my satisfaction, too. Tomorrow, and next day, we'll finish the third act, and the play. I have not written less than 30 pages any day since I began. Never had so much fun over anything in my life, never such consuming interest and delight. But Lord bless you, the second reading will fetch it. And just think, I had Saul Smith Russell in my mind's eye for the old detective's part, and hang it, he has gone off pottering with Oliver Optic, or else the papers lie. I read everything about the president's doings there with exultation. I wish that old ass of a private secretary hadn't taken me for George Francis Train. If ignorance were a means of grace, I wouldn't trade that gorilla's chances for the Archbishop of Canterbury's. I shall call on the president again by and by. I shall go in my war paint. And if I am obstructed, the nation will have the unusual spectacle of a private secretary with a pen over one ear, a tomahawk over the other. I read the entire Atlantic this time. Wonderful number. Mrs. Rose Terry Cook's story was a ten-strike. I wish she would write twelve old-time New England tales a year. Good times to y'all. Mind, if you don't run here for a few days, 
you will go to hence without having had a full glimpse of heaven. Mark. The play Ah Sen, that had done little enough in Washington, was that summer given another trial by Augustine Daly at the Fifth Avenue Theatre, New York, with a fine company. Clemens had undertaken to doctor the play, and it would seem to have had an enthusiastic reception on the opening night, but it was a summer audience, unspoiled by many attractions. Ah Sen was never a success in the New York season, never a money-maker on the road. The reference in the first paragraph of the letter that follows is to the Bermuda chapters which Mark Twain was publishing simultaneously in England and America. Elmira, August 3, 1877. My dear Howells, I have mailed one set of the slips to London and told Bentley you would print September 15 in October Atlantic, and he must not print earlier in Temple Bar. Have I got the dates and things right? I am powerful glad to see that number one reads a nation's sight better in print than it did in manuscript. I told Bentley we'd send him the slips, each time, six weeks before day of publication. We can do that, can't we? Two months ahead would be still better, I suppose, but I don't know. Our sin went a-booming at the Fifth Avenue. The reception of Colonel Sellers was calm compared to it. The criticisms were just. The criticisms of the great New York dailies are always just, intelligent, and square, and honest. Notwithstanding by a blunder which nobody was seriously to blame for, I was made to say exactly the opposite of this in a newspaper some time ago. Never said it at all, and moreover, I never thought it. I could not publicly correct it before the play appeared in New York, because that would look as if I had really said that thing, and then was moved by fears for my pocket and my reputation to take it back. But I can correct it now, and shall do it, for now my motives cannot be impugned. When I began this letter, it had not occurred to me to use you in this connection, but it occurs to me now. Your opinion and mine, uttered a year ago, and repeated more than once since, that the candor and ability of the New York critics were beyond question, is a matter which makes it proper enough that I should speak through you at this time. Therefore, if you will print this paragraph somewhere, it may remove the impression that I say unjust things which I do not think, merely for the pleasure of talking. There, now. Can't you say... In a letter to Mr. Howells of the Atlantic Monthly, Mark Twain describes the reception of the new comedy Ah Sin, and then goes on to say, etc. Beginning at the star with the words, The criticisms were just. Mrs. Clemens says, Don't ask that of Mr. Howells. It will be disagreeable to him. I hadn't thought of it but I will bet two to one on the correctness of her instinct. We shall see. Will you cut that paragraph out of this letter and precede it with the remarks suggested, or with better ones, and send it to the Globe or some other paper? You can't do me a bigger favor, and yet if it is in the least disagreeable, you mustn't think of it. But let me know right away, for I want to correct this thing before it grows stale again. I explain myself to only one critic, the world. The consequence was a noble notice of the play. This one called on me, else I shouldn't have explained myself to him. I have been putting in a deal of hard work on that play in New York, but it is full of incurable defects. My old Plunkett family seemed wonderfully coarse and vulgar on the stage but it was because they were played in such an outrageously and inexcusably coarse way. The Chinaman is killingly funny. I don't know when I have enjoyed anything as much as I did him. The people say there isn't enough of him in the piece. That's a triumph. There'll never be any more of him in it. John Broham said, Read the list of things which the critics have condemned in the piece, and you have unassailable proofs that the play contains all the requirements of success and a long life. That is true. 
nearly every time the audience roared i knew it was over something that would be condemned in the morning justly too but must be left in for low comedies are written for the drawing room the kitchen and the stable and if you cut out the kitchen and the stable the drawing room can't support the play by itself there was as much money in the house the first two nights as in the first ten of sellers having heard from the third i came away yours ever mark in a former letter we have seen how mark twain working on a story that was to stand as an example of his best work and become one of his surest claims to immortality the adventures of huckleberry finn displayed little enthusiasm in his undertaking in the following letter, which relates the conclusion of his detective comedy, we find him at the other extreme, on very tiptoe with enthusiasm over something wholly without literary value or dramatic possibility. One of the hallmarks of genius is the inability to discriminate as to the value of its output. Simon Wheeler, amateur detective, was a dreary, absurd, impossible performance as wild and unconvincing in incident and dialogue as anything out of an asylum could be. The title which he first chose for it, Balaam's Ass, was properly in keeping with the general scheme. Yet Mark Twain, still warm with the creative fever, had the fullest faith in it as a work of art and a winner of fortune. It would never see the light of production, of course. We shall see presently that the distinguished playwright Dion Boussicot good-naturedly complimented it as being better than Ah Sen. One must wonder what that skilled artist really thought, and how he could do even this violence to his conscience. To W. D. Howells in Boston, Elmira, Wednesday, P.M., 1877. My dear Howells, it's finished. I was misled by hurried Miss Pagin. There were ten pages of notes and over three hundred pages of manuscript when the play was done. Did it in forty-two hours by the clock. Forty pages of the Atlantic, but then of course it's very fat. Those are the figures, but I don't believe them myself, because the thing's impossible. But let that pass. All day long and every day since I've finished in the rough, I have been diligently altering, amending, rewriting, cutting down. I finished finally today. Can't think of anything else in the way of an improvement. I thought I would stick to it while the interest was hot, and I am mighty glad I did. A week from now it will be frozen. Then revising would be drudgery. You see, I learned something from the fatal blunder of putting our sin aside before it was finished. She's all right now. She reads in two hours and twenty minutes, and will play not longer than two and three-quarter hours. Nineteen characters, three acts. I bunch two into one. Tomorrow I will draw up an exhaustive synopsis to insert in the printed title page for copywriting, and then on Friday or Saturday I go to New York to remain a week or ten days and lay for an actor. Wish you could run down there and have a holiday. Would be fun. My wife won't have Balaam's ass, therefore I call the piece Captain Simon Wheeler, the Amateur Detective. Yours, Mark. To W. D. Howells in Boston, Elmira, August 29, 1877. My dear Howells, just got your letter last night. No, done that article one of the bermuda chapters it made me cry when i read it in proof it was so oppressively and ostentatiously poor skim your eye over it again and you will think as i do if isaac and the prophets of baal can be doctored gently and made permissible it will redeem the thing but if it can't let's burn all of the articles except the tail end of it and use that as an introduction to the next article, as I suggested in my letter to you of day before yesterday. I had this proof from Cambridge before yours came. 
Boosie Co. says my new play is ever so much better than our sin. Says the amateur detective is a bully character, too. An actor is chawing over the play in New York to see if the old detective is suited to his abilities. Haven't heard from him yet. If you've got that paragraph by you yet, and if in your judgment it would be good to publish it, and if you absolutely would not mind doing it, then I think I'd like to have you do it, or else put some other words in my mouth that will be proper, and publish them. But mind, don't think of it for a moment if it is distasteful, and doubtless it is. I value your judgment more than my own as to the wisdom of saying anything at all in this matter. To say nothing leaves me in an injurious position, and yet maybe I might do better to speak to the men themselves when I go to New York. This was my latest idea, and it looked wise. We expect to leave here for home September 4, reaching there the 8th, but we may be delayed a week. Curious thing, I read passages from my play, and a full synopsis to Boosie Co., who was rewriting a play which he wrote and laid aside three or four years ago. My detective is about that age, you know. Then he read a passage from his play, where a real detective does some things that are as idiotic as some of my old Wheeler's performances. Showed me the passages, and behold, his man's name is Wheeler. However, his Wheeler is not a prominent character, so we'll not alter the names. My Wheeler's name is taken from the old Jumping Frog sketch. I am rereading Tickner's diary, and am charmed with it, though I still say he refers to too many good things when he could just as well have told them. Think of the man traveling eight days in convoy and familiar intercourse with a band of outlaws through the mountain fastnesses of Spain, he the fourth stranger they had encountered in thirty years, and compressing this priceless experience into a single colorless paragraph of his diary. They spun yarns to this unworthy devil, too. I wrote you a very long letter a day or two ago, but Susie Crane wanted to make a copy of it to keep, so it has not gone yet. It may go today, possibly. We unite in warm regards to you and yours, yours ever, Mark. The Tickner referred to in a former letter was Professor George Tickner of Harvard College, a history writer of distinction. On the margin of the diary, Mark Twain once wrote, Tickner is a millet who makes all men fall in love with him, and adds, Millet was the cause of lovable qualities in people, and then he admired and loved those persons for the very qualities which he, without knowing it, had created in them. Perhaps it would be strictly truer of these two men to say that they bore within them the divine something in whose presence the evil in people fled away and hid itself, while all that was good in them came spontaneously forward out of the forgotten walls and corners in their systems where it was accustomed to hide. It is Frank Millet, the artist, he is speaking of a knightly soul whom all the Clemens household loved, and who would one day meet his knightly end with those other brave men that found death together when the Titanic went down. The Clemens family was still at Quarry Farm at the end of August, and one afternoon there occurred a startling incident which Mark Twain thought worth setting down in practically duplicate letters to Howells and to Dr. John Brown. It may be of interest to the reader to know that John T. Lewis, the colored man mentioned, lived to a good old age, a pensioner of the Clemens family, and in the course of time of H. H. Rogers. Howell's letter follows. It is the very long letter referred to in the foregoing. To W. D. Howells and wife in Boston. Elmira, August 25, 77. My dear Howellses, I thought I ought to make a sort of record of it for further reference. The pleasantest way to do that would be to write it to somebody, but that somebody would let it leak into print, and that we wish to avoid. 
the houses would be safe so let us tell the houses about it day before yesterday was a fine summer day away up here on the summit aunt marsh and cousin may marsh were here visiting susie crane and livy at our farmhouse by and by mother langdon came up the hill in the high carriage with nora the nurse and little jervis charlie langdon's little boy timothy the coachman driving behind these came charlie's wife and little girl in the buggy with the new young spry gray horse a high stepper theodore crane arrived a little later the bay and susie were on hand with their nurse rosa i was on hand too susie crane's trio of colored servants ditto these being josie housemaid auntie cord cook age sixty two turbaned very tall very broad very fine every way see her portrait in a true story just as i heard it in my sketches chocolate the laundress as the bay calls her she can't say charlotte still taller still more majestic of proportions turbaned very black straight as an indian age twenty four then there was the farmer's wife colored and her little girl susie wasn't it a good audience to get up an excitement before good excitable inflammable material lewis was still downtown three miles away with his two-horse wagon to get a load of manure lewis is the farmer colored he is of mighty frame and muscle stocky stooping ungainly has a good manly face and a clear eye age about forty-five and the most picturesque of men when he sits in his fluttering workday rags humped forward into a bunch with his aged slouch hat mashed down over his ears and neck it is a spectacle to make the broken-hearted smile lewis has worked mighty hard and remained mighty poor at the end of each whole year's toil he can't show a gain of fifty dollars he had borrowed money of the cranes till he owed them seven hundred dollars and he being conscientious and honest imagine what it was to him to have to carry this stubborn helpless load year in and year out well sunset came and ida the young and comely charlie langdon's wife and her little julia and the nurse nora drove out at the gate behind the new gray horse and started down the long hill the high carriage receiving its load under the port cochere ida was seen to turn her face toward us across the fence and intervening lawn theodore waved good-bye to her for he did not know that her sign was a speechless appeal for help the next moment livy said ida's driving too fast down here she followed it with a sort of scream her horse is running away we could see two hundred yards down that descent the buggy seemed to fly it would strike obstructions and apparently spring the height of a man from the ground theodore and i left the shrieking crowd behind and ran down the hill bareheaded and shouting a neighbor appeared at his gate a tenth of a second too late the buggy vanished past him like a thought my last glimpse showed it for one instant far down the descent springing high in the air out of a cloud of dust and then it disappeared as i flew down the road my impulse was to shut my eyes as i turned them to the right or left and so delay for a moment the ghastly spectacle of mutilation and death i was expecting i ran on and on still spared this spectacle but saying to myself i shall see it at the turn of the road they never can pass that turn alive when i came in sight of that turn i saw two wagons there bunched together one of them full of people i said just so they are stand petrified at the remains but when i got amongst that bunch there sat ida in her buggy and nobody hurt not even the horse or the vehicle ida was pale but serene as i came tearing down she smiled back over her shoulder at me and said well we're alive yet aren't we 
a miracle had been performed nothing else you see lewis the prodigious humped upon his front seat had been toiling up on his load of manure he saw the frantic horse plunging down the hill toward him on a full gallop throwing his heels as high as a man's head at every jump so lewis turned his team diagonally across the road just at the turn thus making a v with the fence the running horse could not escape that but must enter it then lewis sprang to the ground and stood in this v he gathered his vast strength and with a perfect creedmoor aim he seized the gray horse's bit as it plunged by and fetched him up standing it was down here mind you ten feet further down here neither lewis nor any other man could have saved them for they would have been on the abrupt turn then but how this miracle was ever accomplished at all by human strength generalship and accuracy is clean beyond my comprehension and grows more so the more i go and examine the ground and try to believe it was actually done i know one thing well if lewis had missed his aim he would have been killed on the spot in the trap he had made for himself and we should have found the rest of the remains away down at the bottom of the steep ravine ten minutes later theodore and i arrived opposite the house with the servant straggling after us and shouted to the distracted group on the porch everybody safe believe it why how could they they knew the road perfectly we might as well have said it to people who had seen their friends go over niagara however we convinced them and then instead of saying something or going on crying they grew very still words could not express it i suppose nobody could do anything that night or sleep either but there was a deal of moving talk with long pauses between pictures of that flying carriage these pauses represented this picture intruded itself all the time and disjointed the talk but yesterday evening late when lewis arrived from downtown he found his supper spread and some presents of books there with very complimentary writings on the fly leaves and certain very complimentary letters and more or less greenbacks of dignified denomination penned to these letters and fly leaves and one said among other things signed by the cranes we cancel four hundred dollars of your indebtedness to us etc etc the end thereof is not yet of course for charlie langdon is west and will arrive ignorant of all these things today the supper room had been kept locked and imposingly secret and mysterious until lewis should arrive but around that part of the house were gathered lewis's wife and child chocolate josie auntie cord and our rosa canvassing things and waiting impatiently they were all on hand when the curtain rose now auntie cord is a violent methodist and lewis an implacable dunker baptist those two are inveterate religious disputants the revealments having been made auntie cord said with effusion now I let folks go on saying they ain't no god lewis the lord sent you there to stop that horse says lewis then who sent the horse there in sich a shape but i want to call your attention to one thing when lewis arrived the other evening after saving those lives by a feat which i think is the most marvelous of any i can call to mind when he arrived hunched up on his manure wagon and as grotesquely picturesque as usual everybody wanted to go and see how he looked they came back and said he was beautiful it was so too and yet he would have photographed exactly as he would have done any day these past seven years that he has occupied this farm august twenty seven p s our little romance in real life is happily and satisfactorily completed charlie has come listened acted and now john t lewis has ceased to consider himself as belonging to that class called the poor it has been known during some years that it was lewis's purpose to buy a thirty dollar silver watch some day if he ever got where he could afford it today 
Ida has given him a new, sumptuous, gold, Swiss stem-winding stopwatch, and if any scoffer shall say, Behold, this thing is out of character, there is an inscription within which will silence him, for it will teach him that this wearer aggrandizes the watch, not the watch the wearer. I was asked beforehand if this would be a wise gift, and I said, Yes, the very wisest of all. I know the colored race, and I know that in Lewis's eyes this fine toy will throw the other more valuable testimonials far away into the shade. If he lived in England, the Humane Society would give him a gold medal as costly as this watch, and nobody would say it is out of character. If Lewis chose to wear a town clock, who would become it better? Lewis has sound common sense, and is not going to be spoiled. The instant he found himself possessed of money, he forgot himself in a plan to make his old father comfortable, who is wretchedly poor and lives down in Maryland. His next act, on the spot, was the proffer to the cranes of the three hundred dollars of his remaining indebtedness to them. This was put off by them to the indefinite future, for he is not going to be allowed to pay that at all, though he doesn't know it. A letter of acknowledgment from Lewis contains a sentence which raises it to the dignity of literature. But I beg to say humbly that inasmuch as divine providence saw fit to use me as an instrument for the saving of those precious lives, the honor conferred upon me was greater than the feat performed. That is well said. Yours ever, Mark. Howells was moved to use the story in the Contributors Club and warned Clemens against letting it get into the newspapers. He declared he thought it one of the most impressive things he had ever read, but Clemens seems never to have allowed it to be used in any form. In its entirety, therefore, it is quite new matter. To W. D. Howells in Boston, Hartford, September 19, 1877 my dear howells i don't really see how the story of the runaway horse could read well with the little details of names and places and things left out they are the true life of all narrative it wouldn't quite do to print them at this time we'll talk about it when you come delicacy a sad sad false delicacy robs literature of the best two things among its belongings family circle narrative and obscene stories but no matter in that better world which i trust we are all going to i have the hope and belief that they will not be denied us say twitchell and i had an adventure at sea four months ago which i did not put in my bermuda articles because there was not enough to it but the press dispatches bring the sequel today and now there's plenty to it a sailless, wasteless, chartless, compassless, grubless old condemned tub that has been drifting helpless about the ocean for four months and a half, begging bread and water like any other tramp, flying a signal of distress permanently, and with thirteen innocent, marveling, chuckle-headed Bermuda niggers on board, taking a pleasure excursion. Our ship fed the poor devils on the 25th of last May, far out at sea and left them to bullyrag their way to new york and now they ain't as near new york as they were then by two hundred fifty miles they have drifted seven hundred fifty miles and are still drifting in the relentless gulf stream what a delicious magazine chapter it would make but i had to deny myself i had to come right out in the papers at once with my details so as to try to raise the government's sympathy sufficiently to have better succor sent them than the cutter Colfax, which went a little way in search of them the other day and then struck a fog and gave it up. If the president were in Washington, I would telegraph him. When I hear that the Jonas Smith has been found again, I mean to send for one of those darkies to come to Hartford and give me his adventures for an Atlantic article. Likely you will see my today's article in the newspapers. Yours ever, Mark. The revenue cutter Colfax went after the Jonas Smith, 
thinking there was mutiny or other crime on board. It occurs to me now that, since there is only mere suffering and misery, and nobody to punish, it ceases to be a matter which a republican form of government will feel authorized to interfere in further. Damn a republican form of government! Clemens thought he had given up lecturing for good. He was prosperous, and he had no love for the platform. But one day an idea popped into his head. Thomas Nast, the father of the American cartoon, had delivered a successful series of illustrated lectures, talks for which he made the drawings as he went along. Mark Twain's idea was to make a combination with Nast. His letter gives us the plan in full. To Thomas Nast, Morristown, New Jersey, Hartford, Connecticut, 1877. My dear Nast, I did not think I should ever stand on a platform again until the time was come for me to say I die innocent. But the same old offers keep arriving. I have declined them all, just as usual, though sorely tempted as usual. Now, I do not decline because I mind talking to an audience, but because one, traveling alone, is so heartbreakingly dreary, and two, shouldering the whole show, is such a cheer-killing responsibility. Therefore, I now propose to you what you proposed to me in 1867, ten years ago when I was unknown, viz. that you stand on the platform and make pictures, and I stand by you and blackguard the audience. I should enormously enjoy meandering around to big towns, don't want to go to the little ones, with you for company. My idea is not to fatten the lecture agents and lyceums on the spoils, but put all the ducats religiously into two equal piles, and say to the artist and lecture, Absorb these. For instance, here follows a plan and a possible list of cities to be visited. The letter continues. Call the gross receipts $100,000 for four months and a half, and the profit from 60000 to 75000 I try to make the figures large enough and leave it to the public to reduce them. I did not put in Philadelphia because Pew owns that town, and last winter, when I made a little reading trip, he only paid me $300 and pretended his concert, I read 15 minutes in the midst of a concert, cost him a vast sum and so he couldn't afford any more. I could get up a better concert with a barrel of cats. I have imagined two or three pictures and concocted the accompanying remarks to see how the thing would go. I was charmed. Well, you think it over, Nast, and drop me a line. We should have some fun. Yours truly, Samuel L. Clemens. The plan came to nothing. Nast, like Clemens, had no special taste for platforming, and while undoubtedly there would have been large profits in the combination, the promise of the venture did not compel his acceptance. In spite of his distaste for the platform, Mark Twain was always giving readings and lectures, without charge, for some worthy Hartford cause. He was ready to do what he could to help an entertainment along, if he could do it in his own way, an original way sometimes, and not always gratifying to the committee whose plans were likely to be prearranged. For one thing, Clemens, supersensitive in the matter of putting himself forward in his own town, often objected to any special exploitation of his name. This always distressed the committee, who saw a large profit to their venture in the prestige of his fame. The following characteristic letter was written in self-defense when, on one such occasion, a committee had become sufficiently peevish to abandon a worthy enterprise. To an Entertainment Committee in Hartford, November 9, E. S. Sykes, Esquire. Dear Sir, Mr. Burton's note puts upon me all the blame of the destruction of an enterprise which had for its object the succor of the Hartford poor. That is to say, this enterprise has been dropped because of the dissatisfaction 
with Mr. Clemens' stipulations. Therefore, I must be allowed to say a word in my defense. There were two stipulations, exactly two. I made one of them. If the other was made at all, it was a joint one, from the choir and me. My individual stipulation was that my name should be kept out of the newspapers. The joint one was that sufficient tickets to ensure a good sum should be sold before the date of the performance should be set. Understand, we wanted a good sum. I do not think any of us bothered about a good house. It was money we were after. Now, you perceive that my concern is simply with my individual stipulation. Did that break up the enterprise? Eugene Burton said he would sell $300 worth of the tickets himself. Mr. Smith said he would sell $200 or $300 worth himself. My plan for Asylum Hill Church would have insured $150 from that quarter. All this in the face of my stipulation. It was proposed to raise $1,000. Did my stipulation render the raising of four hundred or five hundred dollars in a dozen churches impossible? My stipulation is easily defensible. When a mere reader or lecturer has appeared three or four times in a town of Hartford's size, he is a good deal more than likely to get a very unpleasant snub if he shoves himself forward about once or twice more. Therefore, I long ago made up my mind that whenever I again appeared here, it should be only in a minor capacity and not as a chief attraction. Now, I placed that harmless and very justifiable stipulation before the committee the other day. They carried it to headquarters, and it was accepted there. I am not informed that any objection was made to it or that it was regarded as an offense. It seems late in the day now, after a good deal of trouble has been taken and a good deal of thankless work done by the committees, to suddenly tear up the contract and then turn and bowl me down from long range as being the destroyer of it. If the enterprise has failed because of my individual stipulation, here you have my proper and reasonable reasons for making that stipulation. If it has failed because of the joint stipulation, Put the blame there and let us share it collectively. I think our plan was a good one. I do not doubt that Mr. Burton still approves of it, too. I believe the objections come from other quarters and not from him. Mr. Twitchell used the following words in last Sunday's sermon, if I remember correctly. My hearers, the prophet Deuteronomy says this wise thing. Though ye plan a goodly house for the poor, and plan it with wisdom, and do take off your coats and set to build it with high courage, yet shall the croaker presently come, and lift up his voice, having his coat on, and say, Verily, this plan is not well planned, and he will go his way. And the obstructionist will come, and lift up his voice, having his coat on, and say, Behold, this is but a sick plan, and he will go his way. And the man that knows it all will come and lift up his voice, having his coat on, and say, Lo, call they this a plan? Then will he go his way, and the places which knew him once shall know him no more forever, because he was not, for God took him. Now, therefore, I say unto you, Verily, that house will not be budded. And I say this also, He that waiteth for all men to be satisfied with his plan, let him seek eternal life, for he shall need it. This portion of Mr. Twitchell's sermon made a great impression upon me, and I was grieved that someone had not wakened me earlier so that I might have heard what went before. S. L. Clemens Mr. Sykes, of the firm of Sykes & Newton, the Allen House Pharmacy, replied that he had read the letter to the committee and that it had set those gentlemen right who had not before understood the situation. If others were as ready to do their part as yourself, our poor would not want assistance, he said in closing. 
we come now to an incident which assumes the proportions of an episode even of a catastrophe in mark twain's career the disaster was due to a condition noted a few pages earlier the inability of genius to judge its own efforts the story has now become history printed history it having been sympathetically told by howells in my mark twain and more exhaustively with a report of the speech that invited the lightning in a former work by the present writer the speech was made at john greenleaf whittier's seventieth birthday dinner given by the atlantic staff on the evening of december seventeenth eighteen seventy seven it was intended as a huge joke a joke that would shake the sides of these venerable boston deities longfellow emerson holmes and the rest of that venerated group clemens had been a favorite at the atlantic lunches and dinners a speech by him always an event this time he decided to outdo himself he did that but not in the way he had intended to use one of his own metaphors he stepped out to meet the rainbow and got struck by lightning his joke was not of the Boston kind or size. When its full nature burst upon the company, when the ears of the assembled diners heard the sacred names of Longfellow, Emerson, and Holmes lightly associated with human aspects removed, oh, very far removed, from Cambridge and Concord, a chill fell upon the diners that presently became amazement, and then creeping paralysis. Nobody knew afterward whether the great speech that he had so gaily planned ever came to a natural end or not. Somebody, the next on the program, attempted to follow him, but presently the company melted out of the doors and crept away into the night. It seemed to Mark Twain that his career had come to an end. Back in Hartford, sweating and suffering through sleepless nights, he wrote Howells his anguish. To W. D. Howells in Boston, Sunday night, eighteen seventy seven. My dear Howells, my sense of disgrace does not abate, it grows. I see that it is going to add itself to my list of permanencies, a list of humiliations that extends back to when I was seven years old and which keep on persecuting me regardless of my repentances. I feel that my misfortune has injured me all over the country. Therefore, it will be best that I retire from before the public at present. It will hurt the Atlantic for me to appear in its pages now. So it is my opinion, and my wife's, that the telephone story had better be suppressed. Will you return those proofs or revises to me so that I can use the same on some future occasion? It seems as if I must have been insane when I wrote that speech and saw no harm in it, no disrespect toward those men whom I reverence so much. And what shame I brought upon you, after what you said in introducing me. It burns me like fire to think of it. The whole matter is a dreadful subject. Let me drop it here, at least on paper. Penitently yours, Mark. Howells sent back a comforting letter. I have no idea of dropping you out of the Atlantic, he wrote, and Mr. Houghton has still less, if possible. You are going to help and not hurt us many a year yet, if you will. You are not going to be floored by it. There is more justice than that, even in this world. Howells added that Charles Eliot Norton had expressed just the right feeling concerning the whole affair, and that many who had not heard the speech but read the newspaper reports of it had found it without offense. Clemens wrote contrite letters to Holmes, Emerson, and Longfellow, and received most gracious acknowledgments. Emerson, indeed, had not heard the speech. His faculties were already blurred by the mental mists that would eventually shut him in. Clemens wrote again to Howells, this time with less anguish. To W. D. Howells in Boston, Hartford, Friday, 1877. My dear Howells, your letter was a godsend, and perhaps the welcomest part of it was your consent that I write to those gentlemen, for you discouraged my hints in that direction that morning in Boston, rightly too, 
for my offense was yet too new then warner has tried to hold up our hands like the good fellow he is but poor twitchell could not say a word and confessed that he would rather take nearly any punishment than face livy and me he hasn't been here since it is curious but i pitched earlier upon mr norton as the very man who would think some generous thing about that matter whether he said it or not it is splendid to be a man like that but it is given to few to be i wrote a letter yesterday and sent a copy to each of the three i wanted to send a copy to mr whittier also since the offence was done also against him being committed in his presence and he the guest of the occasion besides holding the well-nigh sacred place he does in his people's estimation but i didn't know whether to venture or not and so ended by doing nothing it seemed an intrusion to approach him and even livy seemed to have her doubts as to the best and properest way to do in the case i do not reverence mr emerson less but somehow i could approach him easier send me those proofs if you have got them handy i want to submit them to wiley he won't show them to anybody had a very pleasant and considerate letter from mr houghton today, and was very glad to receive it you can't imagine how brilliant and beautiful that new brass fender is and how perfectly naturally it takes its place under the carved oak how they did scour it up before they sent it i lied a good deal about it when i came home so for once i kept a secret and surprised livy on a christmas morning i haven't done a stroke of work since the atlantic dinner have only moped around but i'm going to try tomorrow how could i ever have ah well i am a great and sublime fool but then i am god's fool and all his works must be contemplated with respect livy and i join in the warmest regards to you and yours yours ever mark longfellow in his reply said i do not believe anybody was much hurt certainly i was not and holmes tells me he was not so i think you may dismiss the matter from your mind without further remorse holmes wrote it never occurred to me for a moment to take offence or feel wounded by your playful use of my name miss ellen emerson replied for her father in a letter to mrs clemens that the speech had made no impression upon him giving at considerable length the impression it had made on herself and other members of the family clearly it was not the principals who were hurt but only those who held them in awe though one can realize that this would not make it much easier for mark twain end of section eighteen recording by james k white chula vista section nineteen of the letters of mark twain complete this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by james k white the letters of mark twain complete by mark twain volume three chapter eighteen letters from europe eighteen seventy eight to seventy nine tramping with twitchell writing a new travel book life in munich whether the unhappy occurrence at the whittier dinner had anything to do with mark twain's resolve to spend a year or two in europe cannot be known now there were other good reasons for going one in particular being a demand for another book of travel it was also true as he explains in a letter to his mother that his days were full of annoyances making it difficult for him to work he had a tendency to invest money in almost any glittering enterprise that came along and at this time he was involved in the promotion of a variety of patent rights that brought him no return other than assessment and vexation clemens mother was by this time living with her son orion and his wife in iowa to Mrs. Jane Clemens in Keokuk, Iowa, Hartford, 
February 17, 1878. My dear mother, I suppose I am the worst correspondent in the whole world, and yet I grow worse and worse all the time. My conscience blisters me for not writing you, but it has ceased to abuse me for not writing other folks. Life has come to be a very serious matter with me. I have a badgered, harassed feeling a good part of my time. It comes mainly of business responsibilities and annoyances and the persecution of kindly letters from well-meaning strangers to whom I must be rudely silent or else put in the biggest half of my time bothering over answers. There are other things also that help to consume my time and defeat my projects. Well, the consequence is I cannot write a book at home. This cuts my income down. Therefore, I have about made up my mind to take my tribe and fly to some little corner of Europe and budge no more until I shall have completed one of the half-dozen books that lie begun upstairs. Please say nothing about this at present. We propose to sail the 11th of April. I shall go to Fredonia to meet you, but it would not be well for Livy to make that trip, I am afraid. However, we shall see. I will hope she can go. Mr. Twitcher has just come in, so I must go to him. We are all well and send love to you all. Affectionately, Sam. He was writing few letters at this time and doing but little work. There were always many social events during the winter, and what with his European plans and a diligent study of the German language which the entire family undertook, his days and evenings were full enough. Howells wrote protesting against the European travel and berating him for his silence. I never was in Berlin and don't know any family hotel there. I should be glad I didn't, if it would keep you from going. You deserve to put up at the sign of the savage in Vienna. Really, it's a great blow to me to hear of that prospected sojourn. It's a shame. I must see you somehow before you go. I'm in dreadfully low spirits about it. I was afraid your silence meant something wicked. Clemens replied promptly, urging a visit to Hartford, adding a postscript for Mrs. Howells, characteristic enough to warrant preservation. P.S. To Mrs. Howells in Boston, February 78. Dear Mrs. Howells, Mrs. Clemens wrote you a letter and handed it to me half an hour ago while I was folding mine to Mr. Howells. I laid that letter on this table before me while I added the paragraph about R's application. Since then I have been hunting and swearing and swearing and hunting, but I can't find a sign of that letter. It is the most astonishing disappearance I ever heard of. Mrs. Clemens has gone off driving so I will have to try and give you an idea of her communication from memory. Mainly, it consisted of an urgent desire that you come to see us next week, if you can possibly manage it, for that will be a reposeful time, the turmoil of breaking up beginning the week after. She wants you to tell her about Italy and advise her in that connection, if you will. Then she spoke of her plans, hers, mind you, for I never have anything quite so definite as a plan. She proposes to stop a fortnight and confound the place I've forgotten what it was. Then go and live in Dresden till some time in the summer, then retire to Switzerland for the hottest season, then stay a while in Venice and put in the winter in Munich. This program subject to modifications according to circumstances. She said something about some little by trips here and there, but they didn't stick in my memory because the idea didn't charm me. They have just telephoned me from the current office that Bayard Taylor and family have taken rooms in our ship, the whole Seisha, for the 11th April. Do come if you possibly can, and remember and don't forget to avoid letting Mrs. Clemens find out I lost her letter. Just answer her the same as if you had got it. Sincerely yours, S. L. Clemens. 
The Howellses came, as invited, for a final reunion before the breaking up. This was in the early half of March. The Clemenses were to sail on the 11th of the following month. Orion Clemens, meantime, had conceived a new literary idea and was piling in his manuscript as fast as possible to get his brother's judgment on it before the sailing date. It was not a very good time to send manuscript, but Mark Twain seems to have read it and given it some consideration. The Journey in Heaven, of his own, which he mentions, was the story published so many years later under the title of Captain Stormfield's Visit to Heaven. He had began it in 1868 on his voyage to San Francisco, it having been suggested by conversations with Captain Ned Wakeman of one of the Pacific steamers. Wakeman also appears in Roughing It, Chapter 50, as Captain Ned Blakely, and again in one of the rambling notes of an idle excursion as Captain Hurricane Jones. To Orion Clemens in Keokuk, Hartford, March 23, 1878. My dear brother, every man must learn his trade, not pick it up. God requires that he learn it by slow and painful processes. The apprentice hand, in blacksmithing, in medicine, in literature, in everything, is a thing that can't be hidden. It always shows. But happily, there is a market for apprentice work, else the innocents abroad would have had no sale. Happily, too, there is a wider market for some sorts of apprentice literature than there is for the very best of journey work. This work of yours is exceedingly crude, but I am free to say it is less crude than I expected it to be, and considerably better work than I believed you could do. It is too crude to offer to any prominent periodical, so I shall speak to the New York Weekly people. To publish it there will be to bury it. Why could not same good genius have sent me to the New York Weekly with my apprentice sketches? You should not publish it in book form at all, for this reason. It is only an imitation of Verne. It is not a burlesque. But I think it may be regarded as proof that Verne cannot be burlesqued. In accompanying notes, I have suggested that you vastly modify the first visit to hell and leave out the second visit altogether. Nobody would or ought to print those things. You are not advanced enough in literature to venture upon a matter requiring so much practice. Let me show you what a man has got to go through. Nine years ago, I mapped out my journey in heaven. I discussed it with literary friends whom I could trust to keep it to themselves. I gave it a deal of thought from time to time. After a year or more, I wrote it up. It was not a success. Five years ago, I wrote it again, altering the plan. That manuscript is at my elbow now. It was a considerable improvement on the first attempt, but still it wouldn't do. Last year, and the year before, I talked frequently with Howells about the subject, and he kept urging me to do it again. So I thought and thought, at odd moments, and at last I struck what I considered to be the right plan. Mind, I have never altered the ideas from the first. The plan was the difficulty. When Howells was here last, I laid before him the whole story without referring to my manuscript, and he said, you have got it sure this time, but drop the idea of making mere magazine stuff of it. Don't waste it. Print it by itself. Publish it first in England. Ask Dean Stanley to endorse it, which will draw some of the teeth of the religious press, and then reprint in America. I doubt my ability to get Dean Stanley to do anything of the sort, but I shall do the rest and this is all a secret which you must not divulge. Now look here. I have tried all these years to think of some way of doing hell too, and have always had to give it up. Hell, in my book, will not occupy five pages of manuscript, I judge. It will be only covert hints, I suppose, and quickly dropped. I may end by not even referring to it. 
and mind you, in my opinion, you will find that you can't write up hell so it will stand printing. Neither Howells nor I believe in hell or the divinity of the Savior, but no matter, the Savior is nonetheless a sacred personage, and a man should have no desire or disposition to refer to him lightly, profanely, or otherwise than with the profoundest reverence. The only safe thing is not to introduce him, or refer to him at all, I suspect. I have entirely rewritten one book three, perhaps four times, changing the plan every time, twelve hundred pages of manuscript, wasted and burned, and shall tackle it again one of these years, and maybe succeed at last. Therefore, you need not expect to get your book right the first time. Go to work and revamp or rewrite it. God only exhibits his thunder and lightning at intervals, and so they always command attention. These are God's adjectives. You thunder and lightning too much. The reader ceases to get under the bed by and by. Mr. Perkins will send you and Ma your checks when we are gone, but don't write him ever except a single line in case he forgets the checks, for the man is driven to death with work. I see you are half promising yourself a monthly return for your book. In my experience, previously counted chickens never do hatch. How many of mine I have counted and never a one of them but failed. It is much better to hedge disappointment by not counting. Unexpected money is a delight. The same sum is a bitterness when you expected more. My time in America is growing mighty short. Perhaps we can manage in this way. I promise if the New York Weekly people know that you are my brother, they will turn that fact into an advertisement, a thing of value to them, but not to you and me. This must be prevented. I will write them a note to say you have a friend near Keokuk, Charles S. Miller, who has a manuscript for sale which you think is a pretty clever travesty on Verne, and if they want it, they might write to him in your care. Then, if any correspondence ensues between you and them, let Molly write for you and sign your name, your own handwriting representing Miller's. Keep yourself out of sight till you make a strike on your own merits. There is no other way to get a fair verdict upon your merits. Later, I've written the note to Smith, and with nothing in it which he can use as an advertisement. I'm called. Goodbye. Love to you both. We leave here next Wednesday for Elmira. We leave there April 9 or 10, and sail 11th. Your brother, Sam. In the letter that follows, the mention of Annie and Sam refers, of course, to the children of Mrs. Moffat, who had been Pamela Clemens. They were grown now, and Annie Moffat was married to Charles L. Webster, who later was to become Mark Twain's business partner. The Moffats and Websters were living in Fredonia at this time, and Clemens had been to pay them a goodbye visit. The Taylor dinner mentioned was a farewell banquet given to Bayard Taylor, who had been appointed minister to Germany, and was to sail on the ship with Mark Twain. Mark Twain's mother was visiting in Fredonia when this letter was written. To Mrs. Jane Clemens in Fredonia, April 7, 7 8. My dear mother, I have told Livy all about Annie's beautiful house, and about Sam and Charlie, and about Charlie's ingenious manufactures, and his strong manhood, and good promise, and how glad I am that he and Annie married. And I have told her about Annie's excellent housekeeping, also about the great bacon conflict. I told you it was a hundred to one that neither Livy nor the European powers had heard of that desolating struggle. And I have told her how beautiful you are in your age, and how bright your mind is with its old-time brightness, and how she and the children would enjoy you. And I have told her how singularly young Pamela is looking, and what a fine, large fella Sam is, and how ill the lingering syllable my to his name fits his port and figure. Well, Pamela, after thinking it over for a day or so, 
I came near inquiring about a stateroom in our ship for Sam, to please you, but my wiser form of resolution came back to me. It is not for his good that he have friends in the ship. His conduct in the bacon business shows that he will develop rapidly into a manly man as soon as he is cast loose from your apron strings. You don't teach him to push ahead and do and dare things for himself, but you do just the reverse. You are assisted in your damaging work by the tyrannous ways of a village. Villagers watch each other and so make cowards of each other. After Sam shall have voyaged to Europe by himself and rubbed against the world and taken and returned its cuffs, do you think he will hesitate to escort a guest into any whiskey mill in Fredonia when he himself has no sinful business to transact there? No, he will smile at the idea. If he avoids this courtesy now from principle, of course I find no fault with it at all, only, if he thinks it is principle, he may be mistaken. A close examination may show it is only a bowing to the tyranny of public opinion. I only say it may. I cannot venture to say it will. Hartford is not a large place, but it is broader than to have ways of that sort. Three or four weeks ago, at a moody and sand-key meeting, the preacher read a letter from somebody exposing the fact that a prominent clergyman had gone from one of those meetings, bought a bottle of lager beer, and drank it on the premises, a drug store. A tempest of indignation swept the town. Our clergyman and everybody else said the culprit had not only done an innocent thing, but had done it in an open, manly way and it was nobody's right or business to find fault with it. Perhaps this dangerous latitude comes of the fact that we never have any temperance rot going on in Hartford. I find here a letter from Orion submitting some new matter in his story for criticism. When you write him, please tell him to do the best he can and bang away. I can do nothing further in this matter for I have but three days left in which to settle a deal of important business and answer a bushel and a half of letters. I am very nearly tired to death. I was so jaded and worn at the Taylor dinner that I found I could not remember three sentences of the speech I had memorized, and therefore got up and said so and excused myself from speaking. I arrived here at three o'clock this morning. I think the next three days will finish me. The idea of sitting down to a job of literary criticism is simply ludicrous. A young lady passenger in our ship has been placed under Livy's charge. Livy couldn't easily get out of it and did not want to, on her own account, but fully expected I would make trouble when I heard of it. But I didn't. A girl can't well travel alone, so I offered no objection. She leaves us at Hamburg. So I've got six people in my care now, which is just six too many for a man of my unexecutive capacity. I expect nothing else but to lose some of them overboard. We send our loving goodbyes to all the household and hope to see you again after a spell. Affectionately yours, Sam. There are no other American letters of this period. The Clemens party, which included Miss Clara Spaulding of Elmira, sailed as planned on the Holsatia, April 11, 1878. As before stated, Bayard Taylor was on the ship. Also, Murat Halstead and family. On the eve of departure, Clemens sent to Howells this farewell word. And that reminds me, ungrateful dog that I am, that I owe as much to your training as the rude country job printer owes to the city boss who takes him in hand and teaches him the right way to handle his art. I was talking to Mrs. Clemens about this the other day and grieving because I never mentioned it to you, thereby seeming to ignore it or to be unaware of it. Nothing that has passed under your eye needs any revision before going into a volume, while all my other stuff does need so much. A CHARACTERISTIC TRIBUTE AND FROM THE HEART The first European letter came from Frankfurt, a rest on their way to Heidelberg. 
to w d howells in boston frankfurt on the mine may four eighteen seventy eight my dear howells i only propose to write a single line to say we are still around ah i have such a deep grateful unutterable sense of being out of it all i think i foretaste some of the advantages of being dead some of the joy of it i don't read any newspapers or care for them when people tell me england has declared war i drop the subject feeling that it is none of my business when they tell me mrs tilton has confessed and mr b denied i say both of them have done that before therefore let the worn stub of the plymouth whitewash brush be brought out once more and let the faithful spit on their hands and get to work again regardless of me for i am out of it all we had two almost devilish weeks at sea and i tell you bayard taylor is a really lovable man which you already knew then we stayed a week in the beautiful the very beautiful city of hamburg and since then we have been fooling along four hours per day by rail with a courier spending the other twenty in hotels whose enormous bedchambers and private parlors are an overpowering marvel to me day before yesterday in castle we had a love of a bedroom thirty-one feet long in a parlor with two sofas twelve chairs a writing desk and four tables scattered around here and there in it made of red silk too by george the times and times i wish you were along you could throw some fun into the journey whereas i go on day by day in a smileless state of solemn admiration what a paradise this is what clean clothes what good faces what tranquil contentment what prosperity what genuine freedom what superb government and i am so happy for i am responsible for none of it i am only here to enjoy how charmed i am when i overhear a german word which i understand with love from us too to you too mark p s we are not taking six days to go from hamburg to heidelberg because we prefer it quite on the contrary mrs clemens picked up a dreadful cold and sore throat on board ship and still keeps them in stock so she could only travel four hours a day she wanted to dive straight through but i had different notions about the wisdom of it i found that four hours a day was the best she could do before i forget it our permanent address is care messieurs kester and company backers heidelberg we go there tomorrow poor susie from the day we reached german soil we have required rosa to speak german to the children which they hate with all their souls the other morning in hanover susie came to us from rosa in the nursery and said in halting syllables papa wie viel uhr ist es then turned with pathos in her big eyes and said mama i wish rosa was made in english unfinished frankfurt was a brief halting place their destination being heidelberg they were presently located there in the beautiful schloss hotel which overlooks the old castle with its forest setting the flowing necker and the distant valley of the rhine clemens who had discovered the location and loved it toward the end of may reported to howells his felicities fragment of a letter to w d howells in boston schloss hotel heidelberg sunday a m may twenty sixth eighteen seventy eight my dear howells divinely located from this airy porch among the shining groves we look down upon heidelberg castle and upon the swift necker and the town and out over the wide green level of the rhine valley a marvelous prospect we are in a cul-de-sac formed of hill ranges and river we are on the side of a steep mountain the river at our feet is walled on its other side yes on both sides by a steep and wooded mountain range which rises abruptly aloft from the water's edge 
portions of these mountains are densely wooded the plain of the rhine seen through the mouth of this pocket has many and peculiar charms for the eye our bedroom has two great glass bird cages in closed balconies one looking toward the rhine valley and sunset the other looking up the necker cul-de-sac and naturally we spend nearly all our time in these when one is sunny the other is shady we have tables and chairs in them we do our reading writing studying smoking and suppering in them the view from these bird cages is my despair the pictures change from one enchanting aspect to another in ceaseless procession never keeping one form half an hour and never taking on an unlovely one and then heidelberg on a dark night it is massed away down there almost right under us you know and stretches off toward the valley its curved and interlacing streets are cobweb beaded thick with lights a wonderful thing to see then the rows of lights on the arched bridges and their glinting reflections in the water and away at the far end the eisenbahnhof with its twenty solid acres of glittering gas jets a huge garden as one may say whose every plant is a flame these balconies are the darlingest things i have spent all the morning in this north one counting big and little it has two hundred fifty six panes of glass in it so one is in effect right out in the free sunshine and yet sheltered from wind and rain and likewise doored and curtained from whatever may be going on in the bedroom it must have been a noble genius who devised this hotel lord how blessed is the repose the tranquillity of this place only two sounds the happy clamor of the birds in the groves and the muffled music of the necker tumbling over the opposing dikes it is no hardship to lie awake a while nights for this subdued roar has exactly the sound of a steady rain beating upon a roof it is so healing to the spirit and it bears up the thread of one's imaginings as the accompaniment bears up a song while livy and miss spaulding have been writing at this table i have sat tilted back near by with a pipe and the last atlantic and read charlie warner's article with prodigious enjoyment i think it is exquisite i think it must be the roundest and broadest and completest short essay he has ever written it is clear and compact and charmingly done the hotel grounds join and communicate with the castle grounds so we and the children loaf in the winding paths of those leafy vastnesses a great deal and drink beer and listen to excellent music when we first came to this hotel a couple of weeks ago i pointed to a house across the river and said i meant to rent the center room on the third floor for a workroom jokingly we got to speaking of it as my office and amused ourselves with watching my people daily in their small grounds and trying to make out what we could of their dress etc without a glass well i loafed along there one day and found on that house the only sign of the kind on that side of the river moblerte vonung zu vermethen i went in and rented that very room which i had long ago selected there was only one other room in the whole double house unrented it occurs to me that i made a great mistake in not thinking to deliver a very bad german speech every other sentence pieced out with english at the bayard taylor banquet in new york i think i could have made it one of the features of the occasion he used this plan at a gathering of the american students in heidelberg on july fourth with great effect so his idea was not wasted we left hartford before the end of march and i have been idle ever since i have waited for a call to go to work i knew it would come well it began to come a week ago my notebook comes out more and more frequently every day since three days ago i concluded to move my manuscript over to my den now the call is loud and decided at last so tomorrow i shall begin regular steady work and stick to it till middle of july or first august when i look for twitchell 
we will then walk about germany two or three weeks and then i'll go to work again perhaps in munich we both send a power of love to the houses and we do wish you were here are you in the new house tell us about it yours ever mark there has been no former mention in the letters of the coming of twitchell yet this had been a part of the european plan Mark Twain had invited his walking companion to make a tramp with him through Europe as his guest. Material for the new book would grow faster with Twitchell as a companion, and these two, in spite of their widely opposed views concerning providence and the general scheme of creation, were wholly congenial comrades. Twitchell, in Hartford, expecting to receive the final summons to start, wrote, Oh my! Do you realize, Mark, what a symposium it is to be? I do. To begin with, I am thoroughly tired, and the rest will be worth everything. To walk with you and talk with you for weeks together, why, it's my dream of luxury. August 1st brought Twitchell, and the friends set out without delay on a tramp through the Black Forest, making short excursions at first, but presently extending them in the direction of Switzerland. Mrs. Clemens and the others remained in Heidelberg to follow at their leisure. To Mrs. Clemens, her husband sent frequent reports of their wanderings. It will be seen that their tramp did not confine itself to pedestrianism, though they did in fact walk a great deal, and Mark Twain, in a note to his mother, declared, I loathe all travel, except on foot. The reports to Mrs. Clemens follow. Letters to Mrs. Clemens in Heidelberg Alla Heiligen, August 5, 1878, 8.30 p.m. Livy, darling, we had a rattling good time today, but we came very near to being left at Baden-Baden, for instead of waiting in the waiting room, we sat down on the platform to wait where the trains come in from the other direction. We sat there a full ten minutes, and then all of a sudden it occurred to me that that was not the right place. On the train, the principal of the big English school at Nauheim, of which Mr. Scheiding was a teacher, introduced himself to me, and then he mapped out our day for us, for today and tomorrow, and also drew a map and gave us directions how to proceed through Switzerland. He had his entire school with him taking them on a prodigious trip through Switzerland, tickets for the round trip ten dollars apiece. He has done this annually for ten years. We took a post carriage from Aachen to Otterhofen for seven marks, stopped at the Flug to drink beer, and saw that pretty girl again at a distance. Her father, mother, and two brothers received me like an ancient customer, and sat down and talked as long as I had any German left. The big room was full of red-vested farmers, the Gemeindrath of the district, with the Burgermeister at the head, drinking beer and talking public business. They had held an election and chosen a new member, and had been drinking beer at his expense for several hours. It was intensely black forestry. There was an Australian there, a student from Stuttgart or somewhere, and Joe told him who I was, and he laid himself out to make our course plain for us, so I am certain we can't get lost between here and Heidelberg. We walked a carriage road till we came to that place where one sees the footpath on the other side of the ravine, then we crossed over and took that. For a good while we were in a dense forest and judged we were lost but met a native woman who said we were all right. We fooled along and got there at 6 p.m., ate supper, then followed down the ravine to the foot of the falls, then struck into a blind path to see where it would go, and just about dark we fetched up at the devil's pulpit on top of the hills, then home, and now to bed, pretty sleepy. Joe sends love, and I sent a thousand times as much, my darling. S.L.C. Hotel Guinan Livy, darling, we had a lovely day, jogged right along with a good horse and sensible driver. 
the last two hours right behind an open carriage filled with a pleasant german family old gentlemen and three pretty daughters at table de haute tonight three dishes were enough for me and then i bored along tediously through the bill of fare with a backache not daring to get up and bow to the german family and leave i meant to sit it through and make them get up and do the bowing but at last joe took pity on me and said he would get up and drop them a curtsy and put me out of my misery i was grateful he got up and delivered a succession of frank and hearty bows accompanying them with an atmosphere of good fellowship which would have made even an english family surrender of course the germans responded then i got right up and they had to respond to my salams too so that was done we walked up a gorge and saw a tumbling waterfall which was nothing to giesbach but it made me resolve to drop you a line and urge you to go and see giesbach illuminated don't fail but take a long day's rest first i love you sweetheart samuel over the gimme pass four thirty p m saturday august twenty four eighteen seventy eight livy darling joe and i have had a most noble day started to climb on foot at eight thirty this morning among the grandest peaks every half hour carried us back a month in the season we left them harvesting second crop of hay at nine we were in july and found ripe strawberries at nine thirty we were in june and gathered flowers belonging to that month at ten we were in may and gathered a flower which appeared in heidelberg the seventeenth of that month also forget-me-nots which disappeared from heidelberg about mid-may at eleven thirty we were in april by the flowers at noon we had rain and hail mixed and wind and enveloping fogs and considered it march at twelve thirty we had snowbanks above us and snowbanks below us and considered it february not good february though because in the midst of the wild desolation the forget-me-not still bloomed lovely as ever what a flower garden the gimme pass is after i had got my hands full joe made me a paper bag which i pinned to my lapel and filled with choice specimens i gathered no flowers which i had ever gathered before except four or five kinds we took it leisurely and i picked all i wanted to i mailed my harvest to you a while ago don't send it to mrs brooks until you have looked it over flower by flower it will pay among the clouds and everlasting snows i found a brave and bright little forget-me-not growing in the very midst of a smashed and tumbled stone debris just as cheerful as if the barren and awful domes and ramparts that towered around were the blessed walls of heaven i thought how lily warner would be touched by such a gracious surprise if she instead of i had seen it so i plucked it and have mailed it to her with a note our walk was seven hours the last two down a path as steep as a ladder almost cut in the face of a mighty precipice people are not allowed to ride down it this part of the day's work taxed our knees i tell you we have been loafing about this village luca bad for an hour now we stay here over sunday not tired at all joe's hat fell over the precipice so he came here bareheaded i love you my darling samuel st nicholas august twenty sixth seventy eight livy darling we came through a whooping today six hours tramp up steep hills and down steep hills in mud and water shoe deep and in a steady pouring rain which never moderated a moment i was as chipper and fresh as a lark all the way and arrived without the slightest sense of fatigue but we were soaked and my shoes full of water so we ate at once stripped and went to bed for two and a half hours while our traps were thoroughly dried and our boots greased in addition then we put our clothes on hot and went to table de haute made some nice english friends and shall see them at zermatt tomorrow 
gathered a small bouquet of new flowers but they got spoiled i sent you a safety match box full of flowers last night from lucabad i have just telegraphed you to wire the family news to me at rafael tomorrow i do hope you are all well and having as jolly a time as we are for i love you sweetheart and also in a measure the bays little susie's word for babies give my love to clara spaulding and also to the cubs samuel this as far as it goes is a truer and better account of the excursion than mark twain gave in the book that he wrote later a tramp abroad has a quality of burlesque in it which did not belong to the journey at all but was invented to satisfy the craving for what the public conceived to be mark twain's humor the serious portions of the book are much more pleasing more like himself the entire journey as will be seen lasted one week more than a month twichell also made his reports home some of which give us interesting pictures of his walking partner in one place he wrote mark is a queer fellow there is nothing he so delights in as a swift strong stream you can hardly get him to leave one when once he is within the influence of its fascinations twichell tells how at kandersteg they were together one evening where a brook comes plunging down from gasternthal and how he pushed in adrift to see it go racing along the current when i got back to the path mark was running downstream after it as hard as he could go throwing up his hands and shouting in the wildest ecstasy and when a piece went over a fall and emerged to view in the foam below he would jump up and down and yell he said afterward that he had not been so excited in three months in other places twichell refers to his companion's consideration for the feeling of others and for animals when we are driving his concern is all about the horse he can't bear to see the whip used or to see a horse pull hard after the walk over gimme pass he wrote mark today was immensely absorbed in flowers he scrambled around and gathered a great variety and manifested the intensest pleasure in them he crowded a pocket of his notebook with his specimens and wanted more room whereupon twichell got out his needle and thread and some stiff paper he had and contrived the little paper bag to hang to the front of his vest the tramp really ended at lucerne where clemens joined his party but a short excursion to chillon and chamonix followed the travellers finally separating at geneva twichell to set out for home by way of england clemens to remain and try to write the story of their travels he hurried a good-bye letter after his comrade to rev j h twichell no date dear old joe it is actually all over i was so low-spirited at the station yesterday and this morning when i woke i couldn't seem to accept the dismal truth that you were really gone and the pleasant tramping and talking at an end ah my boy it has been such a rich holiday to me and i feel under such deep and honest obligations to you for coming i am putting out of my mind all memory of the times when i misbehaved towards you and hurt you i am resolved to consider it forgiven and to store up and remember only the charming hours of the journeys and the times when i was not unworthy to be with you and share a companionship which to me stands first after livy's it is justifiable to do this for why should i let my small infirmities of disposition live and grovel among my mental pictures of the eternal sublimities of the alps livy can't accept or endure the fact that you are gone but you are and we cannot get around it so take our love with you and bear it also over the sea to harmony and god bless you both mark from switzerland the clemens party worked down into italy sightseeing a diversion in which mark twain found little enough of interest he had seen most of the sights ten years before when his mind was fresh he unburdened himself to twichell and to howells after a period of suffering to j h twichell in hartford rome november three seventy eight dear joe 
I have received your several letters, and we have prodigiously enjoyed them. How I do admire a man who can sit down and wail away with a pen just the same as if it was fishing, or something else as full of pleasure and as void of labor. I can't do it, else in common decency I would when I write to you. Joe, if I can make a book out of the matter gathered in your company over here, the book is safe but I don't think I have gathered any matter before or since your visit worth writing up. I do wish you were in Rome to do my sightseeing for me. Rome interests me as much as East Hartford could, and no more. That is, the Rome which the average tourist feels an interest in. But there are other things here which stir me enough to make life worth living. Livy and Clara Spaulding are having a royal time worshipping the old masters, and I as good a time gritting my ineffectual teeth over them. A friend waits for me. A power of love to you all. Amen. Mark. In his letter to Howells, he said, I wish I could give those sharp satires on European life which you mention, but of course a man can't write successful satire except he be in a calm, judicial good humor. Whereas I hate travel and I hate hotels, and I hate the opera, and I hate the old masters. In truth, I don't ever seem to be in a good enough humor with anything to satirize it. No, I want to stand up before it and curse it and foam at the mouth, or take a club and pound it to rags and pulp. I have got in two or three chapters about Wagner's operas and managed to do it without showing temper, but the strain of another such effort would burst me. From Italy, the Clemens party went to Munich, where they had arranged in advance for winter quarters. Clemens claims, in his report of the matter to Howells, that he took the party through without the aid of a courier, though thirty years later, in some comment which he set down on being shown the letter, he wrote concerning this paragraph. Probably a lie. He wrote also that they acquired a great affection for Fraulein Dahlweine, Acquired it at once, and it outlasted the winter we spent in a house. To W. D. Howells in Boston, Number One A, Karlstrasse, Two E, Stockholm. Care Fraulein Dahlweiner, Munich, November Seventeenth, eighteen seventy-eight. My dear Mister Howells, we arrived here night before last, pretty well fagged an eight-hour pull from Rome to Florence, a rest there of a day and two nights, then five and a half hours to Bologna, one night's rest, then from noon to 10.30 p.m. carried us to Trent in the Austrian Tyrol, where the confounded hotel had not received our message, and so at that miserable hour, in that snowy region, the tribe had to shiver together in fireless rooms while beds were prepared and warmed, then up at six in the morning, and a noble view of snow peaks glittering in the rich light of a full moon while the hotel devils lazily deranged a breakfast for us in the dreary gloom of blinking candles then a solid twelve hours pull through the loveliest snow ranges and snow draped forest and at seven p m we hauled up in drizzle and fog at the domicile which had been engaged for us ten months before munich did seem the horriblest place the most desolate place, the most unendurable place, and the rooms were so small, the conveniences so meager, and the porcelain stove so grim, ghastly, dismal, intolerable. So Livy and Clara Spaulding sat down forlorn and cried, and I retired to a private place to pray. By and by we all retired to our narrow German beds, and when Livy and I finished talking across the room, it was all decided that we would rest twenty-four hours, then pay whatever damages were required, and straight away fly to the south of France. But you see, that was simply fatigue. Next morning the tribe fell in love with the rooms, with the weather, with Munich, and head over heels in love with Fräulein Dahlweiner. We got a larger parlor, an ample one, threw two communicating bedrooms into one for the children, and now we are entirely comfortable. 
the only apprehension at present, is that the climate may not be just right for the children, in which case we shall have to go to France, but it will be with the sincerest regret. Now I brought the tribe through Rome myself. We never had so little trouble before. The next time anybody has a courier to put out to nurse, I shall not be in the market. Last night the forlornities had all disappeared, so we gathered around the lamp after supper with our beer and my pipe, and in a condition of grateful snugness tackled the new magazines. I read your new story aloud, amid thunders of applause, and we all agreed that Captain Jennis and the old man with the accordion hat are lovely people and most skillfully drawn, and that cabin boy, too, we like. Of course, we are all glad the girl has gone to Venice, for there is no place like Venice. Now I easily understand that the old man couldn't go, because you have a purpose in sending Liddy by herself. But you could send the old man over in another ship, and we particularly want him along. Suppose you don't need him there. What of that? Can't you let him feed the doves? Can't you let him fall in the canal occasionally? Can't you let his good-natured purse be a daily prey to guides and beggar boys? Can't you let him find peace and rest and fellowship under Pierre Jacopo's kindly wing? However, you are writing the book, not I. Still, I am one of the people you are writing it for. You understand. I only want to insist, in a friendly way, that the old man shall shed his sweet influence frequently upon the page. That is all. The first time we called at the convent, Pierre Jacopo was absent. The next time he was there, and gave us preserved rose leaves to eat, and talked about you and Mrs. Howells and Winnie, and brought out his photographs and showed us a picture of the library of your new house. But not so. It was the study in your Cambridge house. Footnote. Just at this moment, Miss Spaulding spoke up and said something about Pierre Jacopo. There is more in this acting of one mind upon another than people think. End of footnote. He was very sweet and good. He called on us next day. The day after that we left Venice, after a pleasant sojourn of three or four weeks. He expects to spend this winter in Munich, and will see us often, he said. Pretty soon I am going to write something, and when I finish it I shall know whether to put it to itself or in the Contributors Club that contributors club was a most happy idea by the way i think that the man who wrote the paragraph beginning at the bottom of page six forty three has said a mighty sound and sensible thing i wish his suggestion could be adopted it is lovely of you to keep that old pipe in such a place of honor while it occurs to me i must tell you susie's last she is sorely badgered with dreams and her stock dream is that she is being eaten up by bears. She is a grave and thoughtful child, as you will remember. Last night she had the usual dream. This morning she stood apart, after telling it, for some time, looking vacantly at the floor and absorbed in meditation. At last she looked up, and with the pathos of one who feels he has not been dealt by with even-handed fairness, said, But Mama... The trouble is that I am never the bear, but always the person. It would not have occurred to me that there might be an advantage, even in a dream, in occasionally being the eater instead of always the party eaten, but I easily perceived that her point was well taken. I'm sending to Heidelberg for your letter and Winnie's, and I do hope they haven't been lost. My wife and I send love to you all. Yours, Mark. The Howells story, running at this time in the Atlantic and so much enjoyed by the Clemens party, was The Lady of the Aristook. The suggestions made for enlarging the part of the old man are eminently characteristic. Mark Twain's 43rd birthday came in Munich, and in his letter conveying this fact to his mother, we get a brief added outline of the daily life in that old Bavarian city. Certainly, it would seem to have been a quieter and more profitable existence than he had known amid the confusion of things left behind in America. To Mrs. Jane Clemens and Mrs. Moffat in America. 
Number 1A, Karlstrasse, December 1, Munich, 1878. My dear mother and sister, I broke the back of life yesterday and started downhill toward old age. This fact has not produced any effect upon me that I can detect. I suppose we are located here for the winter. I have a pleasant work room a mile from here where I do my writing. The walk to and from that place gives me what exercise I need and all I take. We stayed three weeks in Venice, a week in Florence, a fortnight in Rome, and arrived here a couple of weeks ago. Livy and Miss Spaulding are studying drawing in German, and the children have a German day governess. I cannot see but that the children speak German as well as they do English. Susie often translates Livy's orders to the servants. I cannot work and study German at the same time, so I have dropped the latter, and do not even read the language, except in the morning paper to get the news. We have all pretty good health, latterly, and have seldom had to call the doctor. The children have been in the open air pretty constantly for months now. In Venice they were on the water in the gondola most of the time and were great friends with our gondolier, and in Rome and Florence they had long daily tramps, for Rosa is a famous hand to smell out the sights of a strange place. Here they wander less extensively. The family all join in love to you all, and to Orion and Molly. Affectionately your son, Sam. End of section 19 Recording by James K. White, Chula Vista. Section 20 of The Letters of Mark Twain, Complete. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by James K. White The Letters of Mark Twain Complete by Mark Twain Volume 3, Chapter 19, Part 1 Letters, 1879 Return to America The Great Grant Reunion Life went on very well in Munich. Each day the family fell more in love with Fräulein Dahlweiner and her house. Mark Twain, however, did not settle down to his work readily. His pleasant workroom provided exercise, but no inspiration. When he discovered he could not find his Swiss notebook, he was ready to give up his travel writing altogether. In the letter that follows, we find him much less enthusiastic concerning his own performances than over the story by Howells, which he was following in the Atlantic. The detective chapter mentioned in this letter was not included in A Tramp Abroad. It was published separately as The Stolen White Elephant, in a volume bearing that title. The play, which he had now found dreadfully witless and flat, was no other than Simon Wheeler, Detective, which he had once regarded so highly. The Stewart referred to was the millionaire merchant A. T. Stewart, whose body was stolen in the expectation of reward. To W. D. Howells in Boston, Munich, January 21, 1879. My dear Howells, it's no use. Your letter miscarried in some way and is lost. The consul has made a thorough search and says he has not been able to trace it. It is unaccountable, for all the letters I did not want arrived without a single grateful failure. Well, I have read up now, as far as you have got, that is, to where there's a storm at sea approaching, and we three think you are clear, out howls and howls. If your literature has not struck perfection now, we are not able to see what is lacking. It is all such truth, truth to the life. Everywhere your pen falls, it leaves a photograph. I did imagine that everything had been said about life at sea that could be said. But no matter, it was all a failure and lies, nothing but lies with a thin varnish of fact. Only you have stated it as it absolutely is, and only you see people in their ways and their insides and outsides as they are, and make them talk as they do talk. 
I think you are the very greatest artist in these tremendous mysteries that ever lived. There doesn't seem to be anything that can be concealed from your awful, all-seeing eye. It must be a cheerful thing for one to live with you and be aware that you are going up and down in him like another conscience all the time. Possibly you will not be a fully accepted classic until you have been dead a hundred years. It is the fate of the Shakespeare's and of all genuine prophets. But then your books will be as common as Bibles, I believe. You are not a weed, but an oak. Not a summer house, but a cathedral. In that day, I shall still be in the cyclopedias, too. Thus, Mark Twain, History and Occupation Unknown. But he was personally acquainted with Howells. There, I could sing your praises all day and feel and believe every bit of it. My book is half finished. I wish to heaven it was done. I have given up writing a detective novel. Can't write a novel, for I lack the faculty. But when the detectives were nosing around after Stewart's loud remains, I threw a chapter into my present book in which I have very extravagantly burlesqued the detective business, if it is possible to burlesque that business extravagantly. You know, I was going to send you that detective play so that you could rewrite it. Well, I didn't do it because I couldn't find a single idea in it that could be useful to you. It was dreadfully witless and flat. I knew it would sadden you and unfit you for work. I have always been sorry we threw up that play embodying Orion, which you began. It was a mistake to do that. Do keep that manuscript and tackle it again. It will work out all right. You will see. I don't believe that that character exists in literature in so well-developed a condition as it exists in Orion's person. Now, won't you put Orion in a story? Then he will go handsomely into a play afterwards. How deliciously you could paint him. It would make fascinating reading. The sort that makes a reader laugh and cry at the same time, for Orion is as good and ridiculous a soul as ever was. Ah, to think of Bayard Taylor. It is too sad to talk about. I was so glad there was not a single sting and so many good praiseful words in the Atlantic's criticism of Deucalion. Love to you all, yours ever, Mark. We remain here till middle of March. In A Tramp Abroad there is an incident in which the author describes himself as hunting for a lost sock in the dark, in a vast hotel bedroom at Heilbronn. The account of the real incident, as written to Twitchell, seems even more amusing. The yarn about the Limburger cheese and the box of guns, like the stolen white elephant, did not find place in the travel book, but was published in the same volume with the elephant story, added to the rambling notes of an idle excursion. With the discovery of the Swiss notebook, work with Mark Twain was going better. His letter reflects his enthusiasm. To Rev. J. H. Twitcher in Hartford, Munich, January 26, 79. Dear Old Joe, Sunday, your delicious letter arrived exactly at the right time. It was laid by my plate as I was finishing breakfast at twelve noon. Livy and Clara, Spalding, arrived from church five minutes later. I took a pipe and spread myself out on the sofa, and Livy sat by and read, and I warmed to that butcher the moment he began to swear. There's more than one way of praying, and I like the butcher's way because the petitioner is so apt to be in earnest. I was peculiarly alive to his performance just at this time, for another reason, to wit, last night. I awoke at three this morning, and after raging to myself for two interminable hours, I gave it up. I rose, assumed a cat-like stealthiness to keep from waking Livy, and proceeded to dress in the pitch dark. Slowly but surely, I got on garment after garment, all down to one sock. I had one slipper on and the other in my hand. Well, 
on my hands and knees I crept softly around, pawing and feeling and scooping along the carpet, and among chair legs for that missing sock. I kept that up, and still kept it up and kept it up. At first I only said to myself, blame that sock, but that soon ceased to answer. My expletives grew steadily stronger and stronger, and at last, when I found I was lost, I had to sit flat down on the floor and take hold of something to keep from lifting the roof off with the profane explosion that was trying to get out of me. I could see the dim blur of the window, but of course it was in the wrong place and could give me no information as to where I was. But I had one comfort. I had not waked Livy. I believed I could find that sock in silence if the night lasted long enough, so I started again and softly pawed all over the place, and sure enough, at the end of half an hour, I laid my hand on the missing article. I rose joyfully up and butted the washbowl and pitcher off the stand and simply raised, so to speak. Livy screamed, then said, Who is that? What is the matter? I said, There ain't anything the matter. I'm hunting for my sock. She said, Are you hunting for it with a club? I went in the parlor and lit the lamp, and gradually the fury subsided and the ridiculous features of the thing began to suggest themselves. So I lay on the sofa with notebook and pencil and transferred the adventure to our big room in the hotel at Hybron and got it on paper a good deal to my satisfaction. I found the Swiss notebook some time ago. When it was first lost, I was glad of it. I was getting an idea that I had lost my faculty of writing sketches of travel. Therefore, the loss of that notebook would render the writing of this one simply impossible and let me gracefully out. I was about to write to Bliss and propose some other book when the confounded thing turned up and down went my heart into my boots. But there was now no excuse, so I went solidly to work, tore up a great part of the manuscript written in Heidelberg wrote and tore up, continued to write and tear up, and at last, reward of patient and noble persistence, my pen got the old swing again. Since then, I'm glad Providence knew better what to do with the Swiss notebook than I did, for I like my work now, exceedingly, and often turn out over thirty manuscript pages a day, and then quit, sorry that heaven makes the days so short. One of my discouragements had been the belief that my interest in this tour had been so slender that I couldn't gouge matter enough out of it to make a book. What a mistake. I've got 900 pages written, not a word in it about the sea voyage, yet I stepped my foot out of Heidelberg for the first time yesterday, and then only to take our party of four on our first pedestrian tour to Heilbronn. I've got them dressed elaborately in walking costumes knapsacks, canteens, field glasses, leather leggings, patent walking shoes, muslin folds around the hats with long tails hanging down behind, sun umbrellas, and alpen stocks. They go all the way to Wimpfen by rail, thence to Heilbronn in a chance vegetable cart drawn by a donkey and a cow. I shall fetch them home on a raft, and if other people shall perceive that that was no pedestrian excursion, they themselves shall not be conscious of it. This trip will take one hundred pages or more. Oh, goodness knows how many, for the mood is everything, not the material, and I already seem to see three hundred pages rising before me on that trip. Then I propose to leave Hotelburg for good. Don't you see? The book. 1,800 manuscript pages may really be finished before I ever get to Switzerland. But there's one thing I want to tell Frank Bliss and his father to be charitable toward me in. That is, let me tear up all the manuscript I want to and give me time to write more. I shan't waste the time. I haven't the slightest desire to loaf, but a consuming desire to work ever since I got back my swing. And you see, this book is either going to be compared with the Innocents Abroad or contrasted with it to my disadvantage. I think I can make a book that will be no dead corpse of a thing, and I mean to do my level best to accomplish that. 
my crude plans are crystallizing. As the thing stands now, I went to Europe for three purposes. The first you know, and must keep secret, even from the blisses. The second is to study art, and the third to acquire a critical knowledge of the German language. My manuscript already shows that the two latter objects are accomplished. It shows that I am moving about as an artist and a philologist, and unaware that there is any immodesty in assuming these titles. Having three definite objects has had the effect of seeming to enlarge my domain and give me the freedom of a loose costume. It is three strings to my bow, too. Well, your butcher is magnificent. He won't stay out of my mind. I keep trying to think of some way of getting your account of him into my book without his being offended, and yet confound him there isn't anything you have said which he would see any offense in. I'm only thinking of his friends. They are the parties who busy themselves with seeing things for people. But I'm bound to have them in. I'm putting in the yarn about the Limburger cheese and the box of guns, too. Mighty glad Howells declined it. It seems to gather richness and flavor with age. I have very nearly killed several companies with that narrative. The American Artist Club here, for instance, and Smith and Wife and Miss Griffith, they were here in this house a week or two. I've got other chapters that pretty nearly destroyed the same parties, too. Oh, Switzerland, the further it recedes into the enriching haze of time, the more intolerably delicious the charm of it and the cheer of it, and the glory and majesty and solemnity and pathos of it grow. Those mountains had a soul. They thought, they spoke, one couldn't hear it with the ears of the body, but what a voice it was, and how real. Deep down in my memory it is sounding yet. Alp calleth unto Alp. That stately old scriptural wording is the right one for God's Alps and God's ocean. How puny we were in that awful presence, and how painless it was to be so. How fitting and right it seemed and how stingless was the sense of our unspeakable insignificance. And, Lord, how pervading were the repose and peace and blessedness that poured out of the heart of the invisible great spirit of the mountains. Now, what is it? There are mountains and mountains and mountains in this world, but only these take you by the heartstrings. I wonder what the secret of it is. Well, Time and time again it has seemed to me that I must drop everything and flee to Switzerland once more. It is a longing, a deep, strong, tugging longing. That is the word. We must go again, Joe. October days. Let us get up at dawn and breakfast at the tower. I should like that first rate. Livy and all of us send deluges of love to you and Harmony and all the children. I dreamed last night that I woke up in the library at home, and your children were frolicking around me, and Julia was sitting in my lap. You and Harmony and both families of Warners had finished their welcomes and were filing out through the conservatory door, wrecking Patrick's flower pots with their dress skirts as they went. Peace and plenty abide with you all, Mark. I want the Blisses to know their part of this letter, if possible. They will see that my delay was not from choice. Following the life of Mark Twain, whether through his letters or along the sequence of detailed occurrence, we are never more than a little while, or a little distance, from his brother Orion. In one form or another, Orion is ever present. His inquiries, his proposals, his suggestions, his plans for improving his own fortunes, command our attention. He was one of the most human creatures that ever lived. Indeed, his humanity excluded every form of artificiality, everything that needs to be acquired. Talented, trusting, childlike, carried away by the impulse of the moment, despite a keen sense of humor, he was never able to see that his latest plan or project was not bound to succeed. Mark Twain loved him, pitied him, also enjoyed him, especially with Howells. Orion's new plan to lecture in the interest of religion 
found its way to Munich with the following result. To W. D. Howells in Boston. Munich, February 9, 1879. My dear Howells, I have just received this letter from Orion. Take care of it, for it is worth preserving. I got as far as nine pages in my answer to it, when Mrs. Clemens shut down on it and said it was cruel and made me send the money and simply wish his lecture success. I said I couldn't lose my nine pages, so she said send them to you. But I will acknowledge that I thought I was writing a very kind letter. Now, just look at this letter of Orion's. Did you ever see the grotesquely absurd and the heart-breakingly pathetic more closely joined together? Mrs. Clemens said, raise his monthly pension. So I wrote to Perkins to raise it a trifle. Now, only think of it. He still has one hundred pages to write on his lecture, yet in one inking of his pen he has already swooped around the United States and invested the result. You must put him in a book or a play right away. You are the only man capable of doing it. You might die at any moment, and your very greatest work would be lost to the world. I could write Orion's simple biography, and make it effective, too, by merely stating the bald facts, and this I will do if he dies before I do. But you must put him into romance. This was the understanding you and I had the day I sailed. Observe Orion's career, that he is, a little of it. One, he has belonged to as many as five different religious denominations. Last March he withdrew from the deaconship in a congregational church and the superintendency of its Sunday school, in a speech in which he said that for many months, it runs in my mind that he said thirteen years, he had been a confirmed infidel, and so felt it to be his duty to retire from the flock. Two, after being a Republican for years, he wanted me to buy him a Democratic newspaper. A few days before the presidential election, he came out in a speech and publicly went over to the Democrats. He prudently hedged by voting for six state Republicans also. The new convert was made one of the secretaries of the Democratic meeting and placed in the list of speakers. He wrote me jubilantly of what a ten-strike he was going to make with that speech. All right, but think of his innocent and pathetic candor in writing me something like this a week later. I was more diffident than I had expected to be, and this was increased by the silence with which I was received when I came forward. So I seemed unable to get the fire into my speech which I had calculated upon, and presently they began to get up and go out and in a few minutes they all rose up and went away. How could a man uncover such a sore as that and show it to another? Not a word of complaint, you see, only a patient, sad surprise. 3. His next project was to write a burlesque upon Paradise Lost. 4. Then, learning that the Times was paying Hart $100 a column for stories, he concluded to write some for the same price. I read his first one and persuaded him not to write any more. 5. Then he read proof on the New York Evening Post at $10 a week and meekly observed that the foreman swore at him and ordered him around like a steamboat mate. 6. Being discharged from that post, he wanted to try agriculture. Was sure he could make a fortune out of a chicken farm. I gave him $900 and he went to a ten-house village a mile above Keokuk on the river bank. This place was a railway station. He soon asked for money to buy a horse and light wagon because the trains did not run at church time on Sunday and his wife found it rather far to walk. For a long time I answered demands for loans and by next mail always received his check for the interest due me to date. In the most guileless way, he let it leak out that he did not underestimate the value of his custom to me, since it was not likely that any other customer of mine paid his interest quarterly, and this enabled me to use my capital twice in six months instead of only once. 
but alas when the debt at last reached eighteen hundred dollars or twenty five hundred dollars i have forgotten which the interest ate too formidably into his borrowings and so he quietly ceased to pay it or speak of it at the end of two years i found that the chicken farm had long ago been abandoned and he had moved into keokuk later in one of his casual moments he observed that there was no money in fattening a chicken on sixty-five cents worth of corn and then selling it for fifty seven finally if i would lend him five hundred dollars a year for two years this was four or five years ago he knew he could make a success as a lawyer and would prove it this is the pension which we have just increased to six hundred dollars the first year his legal business brought him five dollars it also brought him an unremunerative case where some villains were trying to chouse some negro orphans out of seven hundred dollars he still has this case he has waggled it around through various courts and made some booming speeches on it the negro children have grown up and married off now i believe and their litigated town lot has been dug up and carted off by somebody but orion still infests the courts with his documents and makes the welkin ring with his venerable case the second year he didn't make anything the third he made six dollars and i made bliss put a case in his hands about half an hour's work orion charged fifty dollars for it bliss paid him fifteen thus four or five years of slaving has brought him twenty-six dollars but this will doubtless be increased when he gets done lecturing and buys that law library meantime his office rent has been sixty dollars a year and he has stuck to that lair day by day as patiently as a spider eight then he by and by conceived the idea of lecturing around america as mark twain's brother that to be on the bills subject of proposed lecture on the formation of character nine i protested and he got on his war paint couched his lance and ran a bold tilt against total abstinence and the red ribbon fanatics it raised a fine row among the virtuous keokukians ten i wrote to encourage him in his good work but i had let a mail intervene so by the time my letter reached him he was already winning laurels as a red ribbon howler eleven afterward he took a rabid part in a prayer meeting epidemic dropped that to travis to jules verne dropped that in the middle of the last chapter last march to digest the matter of an infidel book which he proposed to write and now he comes to the surface to rescue our noble and beautiful religion from the sacrilegious talons of bob ingersoll now come don't fool away this treasure which providence has laid at your feet but take it up and use it one can let his imagination run riot in portraying orion for there is nothing so extravagant as to be out of character with him well good-bye and a short life and a merry one be yours poor old methuselah how did he manage to stand it so long yours ever mark to orion clemens unsent and enclosed with the foregoing to w d howells munich february nine eighteen seventy nine my dear brother yours has just arrived i enclose a draft on hartford for twenty five dollars you will have abandoned the project you wanted it for by the time it arrives but no matter apply it to your newer and present project whatever it is you see i have an ineradicable faith in your unsteadfastness but mind you i didn't invent that faith you conferred it on me yourself but fire away fire away i don't see why a changeable man shouldn't get as much enjoyment out of his changes and transformations and transfigurations as a steadfast man gets out of standing still and pegging at the same old monotonous thing all the time that is to say i don't see why a kaleidoscope shouldn't enjoy itself as much as a telescope nor a grindstone have as good a time as a whetstone nor a barometer as good a time as a yardstick 
I don't feel like girding at you anymore about fickleness of purpose, because I recognize and realize at last that it is incurable. But before I learn to accept this truth, each new weekly project of yours possessed the power of throwing me into the most exhausting and helpless convulsions of profanity. But fire away now. Your magic has lost its might. I am able to view your inspirations dispassionately and judicially now, and say this one or that one or the other one is not up to your average flight, or is above it or below it. And so, without passion, or prejudice, or bias of any kind, I sit in judgment upon your lecture project and say it was up to your average. It was indeed above it, for it had possibilities in it, and even practical ones. While I was not sorry you abandoned it, I should not be sorry if you had stuck to it and given it a trial. But on the whole, you did the wise thing to lay it aside, I think, because a lecture is a most easy thing to fail in, and at your time of life and in your own town, such a failure would make a deep and cruel wound in your heart and in your pride. It was decidedly unwise in you to think for a moment of coming before a community who knew you with such a course of lectures, because Keokuk is not unaware that you have been a Swedenborgian, a Presbyterian, a Congregationalist, and a Methodist on probation, and that just a year ago you were an infidel. If Keokuk had gone to your lecture course, it would have gone to be amused, not instructed, for when a man is known to have no settled convictions of his own, he can't convince other people. They would have gone to be amused, and that would have been a deep humiliation to you. It could have been safe for you to appear only where you were unknown, then many of your hearers would think you were in earnest, and they would be right. You are in earnest, while your convictions are new. But taking it by and large, you probably did best to discard that project altogether. But I leave you to judge of that, for you are the worst judge I know of. Unfinished that Mark Twain in many ways was hardly less childlike than his brother is now and again revealed in his letters. He was of steadfast purpose, and he possessed the driving power which Orion Clemens lacked. But the importance to him of some of the smaller matters of life, as shown in a letter like the following, bespeaks a certain simplicity of nature which he never outgrew. To Rev. J. H. Twitcher in Hartford, Munich, February 24, 1879. Dear old Joe, it was a mighty good letter, Joe, and that idea of yours is a rattling good one. But I have not sat down here to answer your letter, for it is down at my study, but only to impart some information. For a month, I had not shaved without crying. I had spent three quarters of an hour wetting away on my hand. No use couldn't get an edge. Tried a razor strop, same result. So I sat down and put in an hour thinking out the mystery. Then it seemed plain, to wit, my hand can't give a razor an edge. It can only smooth and refine an edge that has already been given. I judged that a razor fresh from the hone is this shape V, the long point being the continuation of the edge, and that after much use, the shape is this V, the attenuated edge all worn off and gone. By George, I knew that was the explanation, and I knew that a freshly honed and freshly strapped razor won't cut, but after strapping on the hand as a final operation, it will cut. So I sent out for an oil stone, none to be had, but messenger brought back a little piece of rock the size of a safety match box. It was bought in a shoemaker's shop bad flaw in the middle of it too but i put four drops of fine olive oil on it picked out the razor mark thursday because it was never any account and would be no loss if i spoiled it gave it a brisk and reckless honing for ten minutes then tried it on a hair it wouldn't cut then i trotted it through a vigorous twenty-minute course on a razor strap and tried it on a hair it wouldn't cut tried it on my face it made me cry, 
gave it a five minutes stropping on my hand, and my land what an edge she had. We thought we knew what sharp razors were when we were tramping in Switzerland, but it was a mistake. They were dull beside this old Thursday razor of mine, which I mean to name Thursday October Christian in gratitude. I took my whetstone, and in twenty minutes I put two more of my razors in splendid condition. But I leave them in the box. I never use any but Thursday October Christian, and shan't till its edge is gone, and then I'll know how to restore it without any delay. We all go to Paris next Thursday. Address, Monroe and Company, Bankers. With love, yours ever, Mark. End of section 20. Recording by James K. White, Chula Vista. Section 21 of the Letters of Mark Twain Complete. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by James K. White The Letters of Mark Twain Complete by Mark Twain Volume 3, Chapter 19, Part 2 In Paris they found pleasant quarters at the Hotel Normandy, but it was a chilly, rainy spring, and the travelers gained a rather poor impression of the French capital. Mark Twain's work did not go well at first, because of the noises of the street. But then he found a quieter corner in the hotel and made better progress. In a brief note to Aldrich, he said, I sleep like a lamb and write like a lion. I mean the kind of a lion that writes, if any such. He expected to finish the book in six weeks, that is to say, before returning to America. He was looking after its illustrations himself, and a letter to Frank Bliss of the American Publishing Company refers to the frontpiece, which, from time to time, has caused question as to its origin. To Bliss, he says, It is a thing which I manufactured by pasting a popular comic picture into the middle of a celebrated biblical one. Shall attribute it to Titian. It needs to be engraved by a master. The weather continued bad in France, and they left there in July to find it little better in England. They had planned a journey to Scotland to visit Dr. Brown, whose health was not very good. In after years, Mark Twain blamed himself harshly for not making the trip, which he declared would have meant so much to Mrs. Clemens. He had forgotten by that time the real reasons for not going the continued storms and uncertainty of trains which made it barely possible for them to reach Liverpool in time for their sailing date, and with characteristic self-reproach vowed that only perversity and obstinacy on his part had prevented the journey to Scotland. From Liverpool, on the eve of sailing, he sent Dr. Brown a good-bye word. To Dr. John Brown in Edinburgh, Washington Hotel, Lime Street, Liverpool, August, 1879. My dear Mr. Brown, During all the fifteen months we have been spending on the continent, we have been promising ourselves a sight of you as our latest and most prized delight in a foreign land. But our hope has failed. Our plan has miscarried. One obstruction after another intruded itself and our short sojourn of three or four weeks on English soil was thus fritted gradually away. And we were at last obliged to give up the idea of seeing you at all. It is a great disappointment, for we wanted to show you how much Megalopis has grown. She is seven now, and what a fine creature her sister is, and how prettily they both speak German. There are six persons in my party, and they are as difficult to cart around as nearly any other menagerie would be. My wife and Miss Spaulding are along, and you may imagine how they take to heart this failure of our long-promised Edinburgh trip. We never even wrote you, because we were always so sure from day to day 
that our affairs would finally so shape themselves as to let us get to Scotland. But no, everything went wrong. We had only flying trips here and there in place of the leisurely ones which we had planned. We arrived in Liverpool an hour ago very tired, and have halted at this hotel by the advice of misguided friends, and if my instinct and experience are worth anything, it is the very worst hotel on earth, without any exception. We shall move to another hotel early in the morning to spend tomorrow. We sail for America next day in the Gaelic. We all join in the sincerest love to you and in the kindest remembrance to Jock, son of Dr. Brown, and your sister. Truly yours, S. L. Clemens. It was September 3, 1879, that Mark Twain returned to America by the steamer Gaelic. In the seventeen months of his absence he had taken on a traveled look and had added gray hairs. A New York paper said of his arrival that he looked older than when he went to Germany and that his hair had turned quite gray. Mark Twain had not finished his book of travel in Paris. In fact, it seemed to him far from complete and he settled down rather grimly to work on it at Quarry Farm. When, after a few days, no word of greeting came from Howells, Clemens wrote to ask if he were dead or only sleeping. Howells hastily sent a line to say that he had been sleeping, the sleep of a torpid conscience. I will feign that I did not know where to write you, but I love you and all of yours, and I am tremendously glad that you are home again. When and where shall we meet? Have you come home with your pockets full of Atlantic papers? Clemens, toiling away at his book, was, as usual, not without the prospect of other plans. Orion, as literary material, never failed to excite him. To W. D. Howells in Boston. Elmira, September 15, 1879. My dear Mr. Howells, When and where here on the farm would be an elegant place to meet but of course you cannot come so far so we will say hartford or belmont about the beginning of november the date of our return to hartford is uncertain but will be three or four weeks hence i judge i hope to finish my book here before migrating i think maybe i've got some atlantic stuff in my head but there's none in manuscript, I believe. Say, a friend of mine wants to write a play with me, I to furnish the broad comedy cuss. I don't know anything about his ability, but his letter serves to remind me of our old projects. If you haven't used Orion or Old Wakeman, don't you think you and I can get together and grind out a play with one of those fellows in it? Orion is a field which grows richer and richer the more he mulches it with each new top dressing of religion or other guano. Drop me an immediate line about this, won't you? I imagine I see Orion on the stage, always gentle, always melancholy, always changing his politics and religion and trying to reform the world, always inventing something and losing a limb by a new kind of explosion at the end of each of the four acts. Poor old chap, he is good material. I can imagine his wife or his sweetheart reluctantly adopting each of his new religions in turn, just in time to see him waltz into the next one and leave her isolated once more. Memorandum Orion's wife has followed him into the outer darkness after thirty years' rabid membership in the Presbyterian Church. Well, with the sincerest and most abounding love to you and yours, from all this family, I am yours ever, Mark. The idea of the play interested Howells, but he had twinges of conscience in the matter of using Orion as material. He wrote, More than once I have taken the skeleton of that comedy of ours and viewed it with tears. I really have a compunction or two about helping to put your brother into drama. You can say that he is your brother, 
to do what you like with him, but the alien hand might inflict an incurable hurt on his tender heart. As a matter of fact, Orion Clemens had a keen appreciation of his own shortcomings, and would have enjoyed himself in a play as much as any observer of it. Indeed, it is more than likely that he would have been pleased at the thought of such distinguished dramatization. From the next letter, one might almost conclude that he had received a hint of this plan, and was bent upon supplying rich material. To W. D. Howells in Boston, Elmira, October 9, 79. My dear Howells, since my return, the mail facilities have enabled Orion to keep me informed as to his intentions. Twenty-eight days ago, it was his purpose to complete a work aimed at religion, the preface to which he had already written. Afterward, he began to sell off his furniture with the idea of hurrying to Leadville and tackling silver mining, threw up his law den and took in his sign. Then he wrote to Chicago and St. Louis newspapers asking for a situation as paragrapher, enclosing a taste of his quality in the shape of two stanzas of humorous rhymes. By a later mail, on the same day, he applied to New York and Hartford insurance companies for copying to do. However, it would take too long to detail all his projects. They comprise a removal to southwest Missouri, application for a reporter's berth on a Keokuk paper, application for a compositor's berth on a St. Louis paper, a rehanging of his attorney's sign, though it only creaks and catches no flies, but last night's letter informs me that he has retackled the religious question, hired a distant den to write in, applied to my mother for fifty dollars to rebuy his furniture, which has advanced in value since the sale, purposes buying twenty-five dollars worth of books necessary to his labors which he had previously been borrowing, and his first chapter is already on its way to me for my decision as to whether it has enough ungodliness in it or not. Poor Orion. Your letter struck me while I was meditating a project to beguile you and John Hay and Joe Twitchell into a descent upon Chicago, which I dream of making, to witness the reunion of the great commanders of the Western Army Corps on the ninth of next month. My sluggish soul needs a fierce upstirring and if it would not get it when Grant enters the meeting place, I must doubtless lay for the final resurrection. Can you and Hay go? At the same time, confound it, I doubt if I can go myself, for this book isn't done yet. But I would give a heap to be there. I mean to heave some holiness into the Hartford primaries when I go back and if there was a solitary office in the land which majestic ignorance and incapacity coupled with purity of heart could fill, I would run for it. This naturally reminds me of Bret Hart, but let him pass. We propose to leave here for New York October 21, reaching Hartford 24th or 25th. If, upon reflection, you houses find you can stop over here on your way, I wish you would do it, and telegraph me. Getting pretty hungry to see you. I had an idea that this was your shortest way home, but like as not my geography is crippled again. It usually is. Yours ever, Mark. The reunion of the great commanders mentioned in the foregoing was a welcome to General Grant after his journey around the world. Grant's trip had been one continuous ovation, a triumphal march. In 79, most of his old commanders were still alive, and they had planned to assemble in Chicago to do him honor. A presidential year was coming on, but if there was anything political in the project, there were no surface indications. Mark Twain, once a Confederate soldier, had long since been completely desouthernized at least to the point where he felt that the sight of old comrades paying tribute to the Union commander would stir his blood as perhaps it had not been stirred, even in that earlier time when that same commander had chased him through the Missouri swamps. 
Grant, indeed, had long since become a hero to Mark Twain, though it is highly unlikely that Clemens favored the idea of a third term. Some days following the preceding letter, an invitation came for him to be present at the Chicago reunion, but by this time he had decided not to go. The letter, he wrote, has been preserved. To General William E. Strong in Chicago. Farmington Avenue, Hartford, October 28, 1879. General William E. Strong, Chairman and Gentleman of the Committee, I have been hoping during several weeks that it might be my good fortune to receive an invitation to be present on that great occasion in Chicago. But now that my desire is accomplished, my business matters have so shaped themselves as to bar me from being so far from home in the first half of November. It is with supreme regret that I lost this chance, for I have not had a thorough stirring up for some years, and I judge that if I could be in the banqueting hall and see and hear the veterans of the Army of the Tennessee at the moment that their old commander entered the room or rose in his place to speak, my system would get the kind of upheaval it needs. General Grant's progress across the continent is of the marvelous nature of the returning Napoleon's progress from Grenoble to Paris. And as the crowning spectacle in the one case was the meeting with the old guard, so likewise the crowning spectacle in the other will be our great captain's meeting with his old guard. And that is the very climax which I wanted to witness. Besides, I wanted to see the general again, anyway, and renew the acquaintance. He would remember me because I was the person who did not ask him for an office. However, I consume your time, and also wander from the point, which is to thank you for the courtesy of your invitation and yield up my seat at the table to some other guest who may possibly grace it better, but will certainly not appreciate its privileges more than I should. With great respect, I am, gentlemen, very truly yours, S. L. Clemens. Private, I beg to apologize for my delay, gentlemen, but the card of invitation went to Elmira, New York, and hence has only just now reached me. This letter was not sent. He reconsidered and sent an acceptance agreeing to speak, as the committee had requested. Certainly there was something picturesque in the idea of the Missouri private who had been chased for a rainy fortnight through the swamps of Rawls County being selected now to join in welcome to his ancient enemy. The great reunion was to be something more than a mere banquet. It would continue for several days, with processions, great assemblages, and much oratory. Mark Twain arrived in Chicago in good season to see it all. Three letters to Mrs. Clemens intimately present his experiences, his enthusiastic enjoyment, and his own personal triumph. The first was probably written after the morning of his arrival. The Dr. Jackson in it was Dr. A. Reeves Jackson the guide-dismaying doctor of innocence abroad. To Mrs. Clemens in Hartford, Palmer House, Chicago, November 11. Livy, darling, I am getting a trifle leg-weary. Dr. Jackson called and dragged me out of bed at noon yesterday, and then went off. I went downstairs and was introduced to some scores of people, and among them an elderly German gentleman named Raster who said his wife owed her life to me, heard in Chicago fire, and lay menaced with death a long time. But the innocence abroad kept her mind in a cheerful attitude, and so, with the doctor's help for the body, she pulled through. They drove me to Dr. Jackson's, and I had an hour's visit with Mrs. Jackson. Started to walk down Michigan Avenue, got a few steps on my way, and met an erect soldierly-looking young gentleman, who offered his hand, said, Mr. Clemens, I believe, I wish to introduce myself. You were pointed out to me yesterday as I was driving down street. My name is Grant. Colonel Fred Grant? Yes, 
my house is not ten steps away, and I would like you to come and have a talk and a pipe, and let me introduce my wife. So we turned back and entered the house next to Jackson's, and talked something more than an hour, and smoked many pipes, and had a sociable good time. His wife is very gentle and intelligent, and pretty, and they have a cunning little girl, nearly as big as Bay, but only three years old. They wanted me to come in and spend an evening, after the banquet, with them and General Grant, after this grand powwow is over, but I said I was going home Friday. Then they asked me to come Friday afternoon, when they and the General will receive a few friends, and I said I would. Colonel Grant said he and General Sherman used the Innocents Abroad as their guidebook when they were on their travels. I stepped in next door and took Dr. Jackson to the hotel, and we played billiards from 7 to 11.30 p.m., and then went to a beer mill to meet some 20 Chicago journalists, talked, sang songs, and made speeches till 6 o'clock this morning. Nobody got in the least degree under the influence, and we had a pleasant time. Read a while in bed, slept till 11, shaved, went to breakfast at noon, and by mistake got into the servants' hall. I remained there and breakfasted with twenty or thirty male and female servants, though I had a table to myself. A temporary structure, clothed and canopied with flags, has been erected at the hotel front, and connected with the second-story windows of a drawing-room. It was for General Grant to stand on and review the procession. Sixteen persons, besides reporters, had tickets for this place, and a seventeenth was issued for me. I was there, looking down on the packed and struggling crowd, when General Grant came forward and was saluted by the cheers of the multitude and the waving of ladies' handkerchiefs, for the windows and roofs of all neighboring buildings were massed full of life. General Grant bowed to the people two or three times, then approached my side of the platform, and the mayor pulled me forward and introduced me. It was dreadfully conspicuous. The general said a word or so, I replied, and then said, But I'll step back, general. I don't want to interrupt your speech. But I'm not going to make any. Stay where you are. I'll get you to make it for me. General Sherman came on the platform wearing the uniform of a full general, and you should have heard the cheers. General Logan was going to introduce me, but I didn't want any more conspicuousness. When the head of the procession passed, it was grand to see Sheridan, in his military cloak and his plume chapeau, sitting as erect and rigid as a statue on his immense black horse, by far the most martial figure I ever saw, and the crowd roared again. It was chilly, and General Deems lent me his overcoat until night. He came a few minutes ago, 5.45 p.m., and got it, but brought General Willard, who lent me his for the rest of my stay, and will get another for himself when he goes home to dinner. Mine is much too heavy for this warm weather. I have a seat on the stage at Haverly's Theater tonight, where the Army of the Tennessee will receive General Grant, and where General Sherman will make a speech. At midnight, I am to attend a meeting of the Owl Club. I love you ever so much, my darling, and am hoping to get a word from you yet. Samuel Following the procession which he describes, came the grand ceremonies of welcome at Haverley's Theatre. The next letter is written the following morning, or at least soiree time the following day, after a night of ratification. To Mrs. Clemens in Hartford, Chicago, November 12, 79. Livy, darling, it was a great time. There were perhaps 30 people on the stage of the theater, and I think I never sat elbow to elbow with so many historic names before. Grant, Sherman, Sheridan, Schofield, Pope, Logan, Auger, and so on. What an iron man Grant is. He sat facing the house, with his right leg crossed over his left, and his right boot sole tilted up at an angle, and his left hand and arm reposing on the arm of his chair. 
you note that position? Well, when glowing references were made to other grandees on the stage, those grandees always showed a trifle of nervous consciousness, and as these references came frequently, the nervous change of position and attitude were also frequent. But Grant? He was under a tremendous and ceaseless bombardment of praise and gratulation. But as true as I'm sitting here, he never moved a muscle of his body for a single instant during thirty minutes. You could have played him on a stranger for an effigy. Perhaps he never would have moved, but at last a speaker made such a particularly ripping and blood-stirring remark about him that the audience rose and roared and yelled and stamped and clapped an entire minute. Grant sitting as serene as ever. When General Sherman stepped to him, laid his hand affectionately on his shoulder, bent respectfully down and whispered in his ear, General Grant got up and bowed and the storm of applause swelled into a hurricane. He sat down, took about the same position and froze to it till by and by there was another of those deafening and protracted roars when Sherman made him get up and bow again. He broke up his attitude once more, the extent of something more than a hair's breadth, to indicate me to Sherman when the house was keeping up a determined and persistent call for me, and poor bewildered Sherman, who did not know me, was peering abroad over the packed audience for me, not knowing I was only three feet from him and most conspicuously located. General Sherman was chairman. One of the most illustrious individuals on that stage was old Abe, the historic war eagle. He stood on his perch, the old savage-eyed rascal, three or four feet behind General Sherman, and as he had been in nearly every battle that was mentioned by the orators, his soul was probably stirred pretty often, though he was too proud to let on. Red Logan's Bosch, and try to imagine a burly and magnificent Indian, in general's uniform, striking a heroic attitude and getting that stuff off in the style of a declaiming schoolboy. Please put the enclosed scraps in the drawer, and I will scrapbook them. I only stayed at the Owl Club till three this morning and drank little or nothing. Went to sleep without whiskey. Ich liebe dich. Samuel. But it is in the third letter that we get the climax. On the same day he wrote a letter to Howells, which, in part, is very similar in substance and need not be included here. A paragraph, however, must not be omitted. Imagine what it was like to see a bullet-shredded old battle flag reverently unfolded to the gaze of a thousand middle-aged soldiers most of whom hadn't seen it since they saw it advancing over victorious fields when they were in their prime. And imagine what it was like when Grant, their first commander, stepped into view while they were still going mad over the flag, and then right in the midst of it all somebody struck up when we were marching through Georgia. Well, you should have heard the thousand voices lift that chorus and seen the tears stream down. If I live a hundred years, I shan't ever forget these things, nor be able to talk about them. Grand times, my boy, grand times. At the great banquet, Mark Twain's speech had been put last on the program to hold the house. He had been invited to respond to the toast of the ladies, but had replied that he had already responded to that toast more than once. There was one class of the community, he said, commonly overlooked on these occasions, the babies. He would respond to that toast. In his letter to Howells, he had not been willing to speak freely of his personal triumph, but to Mrs. Clemens he must tell it all, and with that childlike ingeniousness which never failed him to his last day. To Mrs. Clemens, in Hartford, Chicago, November 14, 79. A little after five in the morning. I've just come to my room, Livy, darling. I guess this was the memorable night of my life. By George, I never was so stirred since I was born. I heard four speeches which I can never forget. One by Emory Stores, one by General Villas. Oh, wasn't it wonderful. One by General Logan, mighty stirring, one by somebody whose name escapes me, 
and one by that splendid old soul Colonel Bob Ingersoll. Oh, it was just the supremest combination of English words that was ever put together since the world began. My soul, how handsome he looked, as he stood on that table, in the midst of those five hundred shouting men, and poured the molten silver from his lips. Lord, what an organ is human speech when it is played by a master. All these speeches may look dull in print, but how the lightning glared around them when they were uttered, and how the crowd roared in response. It was a great night, a memorable night. I am so richly repaid for my journey, and how I did wish with all my whole heart that you were there to be lifted into the very seventh heaven of enthusiasm as I was. The army songs, the military music, the crash and applause, Lord bless me, it was unspeakable. Out of compliment, they placed me last in the list, number 15. I was to hold the crowd, and bless my life, I was in awful terror when number 14 rose at a o'clock this morning and killed all the enthusiasm by delivering the flattest, insipidest, silliest of all responses to woman that ever a weary multitude listened to. Then General Sherman, chairman, announced my toast, and the crowd gave me a good round of applause as I mounted on top of the dinner table. But it was only on account of my name, nothing more. They were all tired and wretched. They let my first sentence go in silence, till I paused and added, We stand on common ground. Then they burst forth like a hurricane, and I saw that I had them. From that time on, I stopped at the end of each sentence, and let the tornado of applause and laughter sweep around me. And when I closed with, and if the child is but the prophecy of the man, there are mighty few who will doubt that he succeeded. I say it who ought to say it. The house came down with a crash. For two hours and a half now, I've been shaking hands and listening to congratulations. General Sherman said, Lord bless you, my boy. I don't know how you do it. It's a secret that's beyond me. But it was great. Give me your hand again. And do you know... General Grant sat through fourteen speeches like a graven image, but I fetched him. I broke him up utterly. He told me he laughed till the tears came and every bone in his body ached. And do you know, the biggest part of the success of the speech lay in the fact that the audience saw that for once in his life he had been knocked out of his iron serenity. Bless your soul, t'was immense. I never was so proud in my life. Lots and lots of people, hundreds I might say, told me my speech was the triumph of the evening, which was a lie. Ladies, Tom, Dick, and Harry, even the policemen, captured me in the halls and shook hands, and scores of army officers said, we shall always be grateful to you for coming. General Pope came to bunt me up. I was afraid to speak to him on that theater stage last night, thinking it might be presumptuous to tackle a man so high up in military history. General Schofield and other historic men paid their compliments. Sheridan was ill and could not come, but I'm to go with a general of his staff and see him before I go to Colonel Grant's. General Auger? Well, I've talked with them all, received invitations from them all, from people living everywhere, and as I said before, it's a memorable night. I wouldn't have missed it for anything in the world. But my sakes, you should have heard Ingersoll's speech on that table. Half an hour ago he ran across me in the crowded halls and put his arms about me and said, Mark, if I live a hundred years, I'll always be grateful for your speech. Lord, what a supreme thing it was. But I told him it wasn't any use to talk. He had walked off with the honors of that occasion by something of a majority. Bully boy is Ingersoll. Traveled with him in the cars the other day, and you can make up your mind we had a good time. Of course, I forgot to go and pay for my hotel car and so secure it. But the armor officers told me an hour ago to rest easy. They would go at once, at this unholy hour of the night, and compel the railways to do their duty by me, and said, you don't need to request the Army of the Tennessee to do your desires. You can command its services. 
Well, I bummed around that banquet hall from eight in the evening till two in the morning, talking with people and listening to speeches, and I never ate a single bite or took a sup of anything but ice water. So if I seem excited now, it is the intoxication of supreme enthusiasm. By George, it was a grand night, a historical night. And now it is a quarter past six a.m. So goodbye and God bless you and the babes. Family word for babies. My darling, Samuel. Show it to Joe if you want to. I saw some of his friends here. Mark Twain's admiration for Robert Ingersoll was very great, and we may believe that he was deeply impressed by the Chicago speech when we find him, a few days later, writing to Ingersoll for a perfect copy to read to a young girls' club in Hartford. Ingersoll sent the speech, also some of his books, and the next letter is Mark Twain's acknowledgment. To Colonel Robert G. Ingersoll, Hartford, December 14. My dear Ingersoll, thank you most heartily for the books. I'm devouring them. They have found a hungry place, and they content it and satisfy it to a miracle. I wish I could hear you speak these splendid chapters before a great audience, to read them by myself and hear the boom of the applause only in the ear of my imagination leaves us something wanting, and there's also a still greater lack, your manner and voice and presence. The Chicago speech arrived an hour too late, but I was all right anyway, for I found that my memory had been able to correct all the errors. I read it to the Saturday Club of young girls and told them to remember that it was doubtful if its superior existed in our language. Truly yours, S. L. Clemens. The reader may remember Mark Twain's Whittier dinner speech of 1877 and its disastrous effects. Now, in 1879, there was to be another Atlantic gathering, a breakfast to Dr. Oliver Wendell Holmes, to which Clemens was invited. He was not eager to accept. It would naturally recall memories of two years before, but being urged by both Howells and Warner, he agreed to attend if they would permit him to speak. Mark Twain never lacked courage, and he wanted to redeem himself. To Howells, he wrote, To W. D. Howells in Boston, Hartford, November 28, 1879. My dear Howells, If anybody talks there, I shall claim the right to say a word myself and be heard among the very earliest, else it would be confoundedly awkward for me and for the rest, too. But you may read what I say beforehand and strike out whatever you choose. Of course, I thought it wisest not to be there at all, but Warner took the opposite view and most strenuously. Speaking of Johnny's conclusion to become an outlaw reminds me of Susie's newest and very earnest longing to have crooked teeth and glasses, like Mama. I would like to look into a child's head once and see what its processes are. Yours ever, S. L. Clemens. The matter turned out well. Clemens, once more introduced by Howells, this time conservatively, it may be said, delivered a delicate and fitting tribute to Dr. Holmes, full of graceful humor and grateful acknowledgment, the kind of speech he should have given at the Whittier dinner of two years before. No reference was made to his former disaster, and this time he came away covered with glory and fully restored in his self-respect. End of section 21. Recording by James K. White, Chula Vista. Section 22 of The Letters of Mark Twain Complete. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by James K. White. The Letters of Mark Twain Complete by Mark Twain. Volume 3, Chapter 20. Letters of 1880. Chiefly to Howells. 
The Prince and the Pauper, Mark Twain Mugwump Society. The Book of Travel, A Tramp Abroad, which Mark Twain had hoped to finish in Paris, and later in Elmira, for some reason, would not come to an end. In December, in Hartford, he was still working on it, and he would seem to have finished it at last, rather by a decree than by any natural process of authorship. This was early in January 1880. To Howells, he reports his difficulties and his drastic method of ending them. To W. D. Howells in Boston. Hartford, January 8, 80. My dear Howells, am waiting for Patrick to come with the carriage. Mrs. Clemens and I are starting without the children to stay indefinitely in Elmira. The wear and tear of settling the house broke her down, and she has been growing weaker and weaker for a fortnight. All that time, in fact ever since I saw you, I have been fighting a life-and-death battle with this infernal book and hoping to get done some day. I require three hundred pages of manuscript, and I have written near six hundred since I saw you, and tore it all up except two hundred eighty-eight. This I was about to tear up yesterday and began again, when Mrs. Perkins came up to the billiard room and said, You will never get any woman to do the thing necessary to save her life by mere persuasion. You see, you have wasted your words for three weeks. It is time to use force. She must have a change. Take her home and leave the children here. I said, If there is one death that is painfuler than another, May I get it if I don't do that thing? So I took the 288 pages to Bliss and told him that was the very last line I should ever write on this book, a book which required 2,600 pages of manuscript, and I have written near 4,000 first and last. I am as sore and flighty as a rocket today with the unutterable joy of getting that old man of the sea off my back where he has been roosting for more than a year and a half. Next time I make a contract before writing the book, may I suffer the righteous penalty and be burnt, like the injudicious believer. I am mighty glad you are done your book. This is from a man who, above all others, feels how much that sentence means. And am also mighty glad you have begun the next. This is also from a man who knows the felicity of that, and means straightway to enjoy it. The Undiscovered starts off delightfully. I have read it aloud to Mrs. C., and we vastly enjoyed it. Well, time's about up. Must drop a line to Aldridge. Yours ever, Mark. In a letter which Mark Twain wrote to his brother Orion at this period, we get the first hint of a venture which was to play an increasingly important part in the Hartford home and fortunes during the next ten or a dozen years. This was the typesetting machine investment, which, in the end, all but wrecked Mark Twain's finances. There is but a brief mention of it in the letter to Orion, and the letter itself is not worth preserving, but as references to the machine appear with increasing frequency, it seems proper to record here its first mention. In the same letter he suggests to his brother that he undertake an absolutely truthful autobiography, a confession in which nothing is to be withheld. He cites the value of Casanova's memories and the confessions of Rousseau, of course, any literary suggestion from Brother Sam was gospel to Orion, who began at once piling up manuscript at a great rate. Meantime, Mark Twain himself, having got a tramp abroad on the presses, was at work with enthusiasm on a story begun nearly three years before at Quarry Farm, a story for children. Its name, as he called it then, The Little Prince and the Little Pauper. He was presently writing to Howells his delight in the new work. To W. D. Howells in Boston, Hartford, March 11, 80. My dear Howells, I take so much pleasure in my story that I am loath to hurry, not wanting to get it done. 
Did I ever tell you the plot of it? It begins at 9 a.m., January 27, 1547, 17 and a half hours before Henry VIII's death by the swapping of clothes and place between the Prince of Wales and a pauper boy of the same age and countenance, and half as much learning and still more genius and imagination. And after that, the rightful small king has a rough time among tramps and rough ends in the country parts of Kent, whilst the small bogus king has a guiled and worshipped and dreary and restrained and cussed time of it on the throne. And this all goes on for three weeks, till the midst of the coronation grandeurs in Westminster Abbey, February 20, when the ragged true king forces his way in, but cannot prove his genuineness until the bogus king, by a remembered incident of the first day, is able to prove it for him. Whereupon clothes are changed, and the coronation proceeds under the new and rightful conditions. My idea is to afford a realizing sense of the exceeding severity of the laws of that day by inflicting some of their penalties upon the king himself, and allowing him a chance to see the rest of them applied to others all of which is to account for certain mildnesses which distinguished Edward the Sixth's reign from those that preceded and followed it. Imagine this fact. I have even fascinated Mrs. Clemens with this yarn for youth. My stuff generally gets considerable damning with faint praise out of her, but this time it is all the other way. She has become the horse leech's daughter, and my mill doesn't grind fast enough to suit her. This is no mean triumph, my dear sir. Last night, for the first time in ages, we went to the theater to see Yorick's love. The magnificence of it is beyond praise. The language is so beautiful, the passion so fine, the plot so ingenious, the whole thing so stirring, so charming, so pathetic. But I will clip from the current. It says it right. And what a good company it is, and how like live people they all acted. The these and the thous had a pleasant sound, since it is the language of the prince and the pauper. You've done the country a service in that admirable work. Yours ever, Mark. The play Yorick's Love, mentioned in this letter, was one which Howells had done for Lawrence Barrett. Orion Clemens, meantime, was forwarding his manuscript, and for once seems to have won his brother's approval, so much so that Mark Twain was willing, indeed anxious, that Howells should run the autobiography in the Atlantic. We may imagine how Orion prized the words of commendation which follow. To Orion Clemens, May 6, 80. My dear brother, it is a model autobiography. Continue to develop your character in the same gradual, inconspicuous, and apparently unconscious way. The reader, up to this time, may have his doubts, perhaps, but he can't say decidedly this writer is not such a simpleton as he has been letting on to be. Keep him in that state of mind. If, when you shall have finished, the reader shall say, the man is an ass, but I really don't know whether he knows it or not. Your work will be a triumph. Stop rewriting. I saw places in your last batch where rewriting had done formidable injury. Do not try to find those places, else you will mar them further by trying to better them. It is perilous to revise a book while it is under way. All of us have injured our books in that foolish way. Keep in mind what I told you. When you recollect something which belonged in an earlier chapter, do not go back, but jam it in where you are. Discursiveness does not hurt an autobiography in the least. I have penciled the manuscript here and there, but have not needed to make any criticisms or to knock out anything. The elder Bliss has heart disease badly, and thenceforth his life hangs upon a thread. Your brother, Sam. But Howells could not bring himself to print so frank a confession as Orion had been willing to make. It wrung my heart, he said, and I felt haggard after I had finished it. 
the writer's soul is laid bare. It is shocking. Howells added that the best touches in it were those which made one acquainted with the writer's brother, that is to say, Mark Twain, and that these would prove valuable material hereafter, a true prophecy, for Mark Twain's early biography would have lacked most of its vital incident, and at least half of its background without those faithful chapters fortunately preserved. Had Orion continued as he began, the work might have proved an important contribution to literature, but he went trailing off into by-paths of theology and discussion where the interest was lost. There were perhaps as many as two thousand pages of it which few could undertake to read. Mark Twain's mind was always busy with plans and inventions, many of them of serious intent, some semi-serious, others of a purely whimsical character. Once he proposed a modest club, of which the first and main qualification for membership was modesty. At present, he wrote, I am the only member, and as the modesty required must be of a quite aggravated type, the enterprise did seem for a time doomed to stop dead still with myself for lack of further material. But upon reflection, I have come to the conclusion that you are eligible. Therefore, I have held a meeting and voted to offer you the distinction of membership. I do not know that we can find any others, though I have had some thought of Hay, Warner, Twitcher, Aldrich, Osgood, Fields, Higginson, and a few more, together with Mrs. Howells and Mrs. Clemens and certain others of the sex. Howells replied that the only reason he had for not joining the Modest Club was that he was too modest, too modest to confess his modesty. If I could get over this difficulty, I should like to join, for I approve highly of the club and its object. It ought to be given an annual dinner at the public expense. If you think I am not too modest, you may put my name down, and I will try to think the same of you. Mrs. Howells applauded the notion of the club from the very first. She said that she knew one thing, that she was modest enough anyway. Her manner of saying it implied that the other persons you had named were not, and created a painful impression in my mind. I have sent your letter and the rules to Hay, but I doubt his modesty. He will think he has a right to belong to it as much as you or I, whereas other people ought only to be admitted on sufferance. Our next letter to Howells is, in the main, pure foolery, but we get in it a hint what was to become in time one of Mark Twain's strongest interests, the matter of copyright. He had both a personal and general interest in the subject. His own books were constantly pirated in Canada, and the rights of foreign authors were not respected in America. We have already seen how he had drawn a petition which Holmes, Lowell, Longfellow and others were to sign, and while nothing had come of this plan, he had never ceased to formulate others. Yet he hesitated when he found that the proposed protection was likely to work a hardship to readers of the poorer class. Once he wrote, My notions have mightily changed lately. I can buy a lot of the copyright classics in paper at from three to thirty cents apiece. These things must find their way into the very kitchens and hovels of the country. And even if the treaty will kill Canadian piracy, and thus save me an average of $5,000 a year, I am down on it anyway, and I'd like cussed well to write an article opposing the treaty. To W. D. Howells in Belmont, Massachusetts. Thursday, June 6, 1880. My dear Howells, there you stick at Belmont, and now I'm going to Washington for a few days. And, of course, between you and Providence, that visit is going to get mixed, and you'll have been here and gone again just about the time I get back. Bother it all, I wanted to astonish you with a chapter or two from Orion's latest book, not the 17th which he has begun in the last four months, but the one which he began last week. Last night, when I went to bed, Mrs. Clemens said, George didn't take the cat down to the cellar. Rosa says he has left it shut up in the conservatory. 
So I went down to attend to Abner the cat. About three in the morning, Mrs. C. woke me and said, I do believe I hear that cat in the drawing room. What did you do with him? I answered up with the confidence of a man who has managed to do the right thing for once, and said, I opened the conservatory doors, took the library off the alarm, and spread everything open so that there wasn't any obstruction between him and the cellar. Language wasn't capable of conveying this woman's disgust, but the sense of what she said was, he couldn't have done any harm in the conservatory, so you must go and make the entire house free to him and the burglars, imagining that he will prefer the coal bins to the drawing room. If you had had Mr. Howells to help you, I should have admired but not been astonished, because I should know that together you would be equal to it. But how you managed to contrive such a stately blunder all by yourself is what I cannot understand. So you see, even she knows how to appreciate our gifts. Brisk times here. Saturday, these things happened. Our neighbor Charles Smith was stricken with heart disease and came near joining the majority. My publisher, Bliss, ditto, ditto. A neighbor's child died. Neighbor Whitmore's sixth child added to his five other cases of measles. Neighbor Niles sent for and responded. Susie Warner down a bed. Mrs. George Warner threatened with death during several hours. Her son Frank, whilst imitating the marvels in Barnum's circus bills, thrown from his aged horse and brought home insensible. Warner's friend Max Yachtsburg shot in the back by a locomotive and broken into thirty-two distinct pieces and his life threatened. And Mrs. Clemens, after writing all these cheerful things to Clara Spaulding, taken at midnight, and if the doctor had not been pretty prompt, the contemplated Clemens would have called before his apartments were ready. However, everybody's all right now, except Yortsburg, and he is mending. That is, he is being mended. I knocked off during these stirring times and don't intend to go to work again till we go away for the summer three or six weeks hence. So I am writing to you not because I have anything to say, but because you don't have to answer, and I need something to do this afternoon. I have a letter from a congressman this morning, and he says Congress couldn't be persuaded to bother about Canadian pirates at a time like this, when all legislation must have a political and presidential bearing, else Congress won't look at it. So have changed my mind and my course. I go north to kill a pirate. I must procure repose some way, else I cannot get down to work again. Pray offer my most sincere and respectful approval to the President. Is approval the proper word? I find it is the one I most value here in the household and seldomest get. With our affection to you both, yours ever, Mark. It was always dangerous to send strangers with letters of introduction to Mark Twain. They were so apt to arrive at the wrong time or to find him in the wrong mood. Howells was willing to risk it, and that the result was only amusing instead of tragic is the best proof of their friendship. To W. D. Howells in Belmont, Massachusetts, June 9, 80. Well, old practical joker, the corpse of Mr. X has been here, and I have bedded it and fed it and put down my work during twenty-four hours and tried my level best to make it do something or say something or appreciate something, but no, it was worse than Lazarus. A kind-hearted, well-meaning corpse was the Boston young man, but laws it bless me, horribly dull company. Now, old man, Unless you have great confidence in Mr. X's judgment, you ought to make him submit his article to you before he prints it. For only think how true I was to you. Every hour that he was here, I was saying, gloatingly, Oh, God damn you, when you are in bed and your light out, I will fix you. Meaning to kill him. But then the thought would follow, No, Howell sent him. He shall be spared. He shall be respected. 
he shall travel hellwards by his own route. Breakfast is frozen by this time, and Mrs. Clemens correspondingly hot. Goodbye, yours ever, Mark. I did not expect you to ask that man to live with you, Howells answered. What I was afraid of was that you would turn him out of doors on sight, and so I tried to put in a good word for him. After this, when I want you to board people, I'll ask you. I am sorry for your suffering. I suppose I have mostly lost my smell for bores, but yours is preternaturally keen. I shall begin to be afraid I bore you. How does that make you feel? In a letter to Twitchell, a remarkable letter, when baby Jean Clemens was about a month old, we get a happy hint of conditions at Quarry Farm, and in the background a glimpse of Mark Twain's unfailing tragic reflection. To Reverend Twitchell in Hartford, Quarry Farm, August 29, 80. Dear Old Joe, Concerning Jean Clemens, if anybody said he didn't see no pints about that frog that's any better than any other frog, I should think he was convicting himself of being a pretty poor sort of observer. I will not go into details. It is not necessary. You will soon be in Hartford, where I have already hired a hall. The admission fee will be but a trifle. It is curious to note the change in the stock quotation of the affection board brought about by throwing this new security on the market. Four weeks ago, the children still put Mama at the head of the list right along where she had always been. But now, Jean, Mama, Motley, a cat, Fraulein, another, Papa. That is the way it stands. Now Mama is become number two. I have dropped from number four and am become number five. Some time ago it used to be nip and tuck between me and the cats, but after the cats developed, I didn't stand any more show. I've got a swollen ear, so I take advantage of it to lie abed most of the day, and read and smoke and scribble and have a good time. Last evening Livy said with deep concern, Oh dear, I believe an abscess is forming in your ear. I responded as the poet would have done if he had had a cold in the head. Tis said that abscess conquers love, but oh, believe it not. This made a coolness. Been reading Daniel Webster's private correspondence. Have read a hundred of his diffuse, conceited, eloquent, bathotic or bathostic letters written in that dim, no, vanished, passed when he was a student, and Lord, to think that this boy who is so real to me now and so booming with fresh young blood and bountiful life and sappy cynicisms about girls has since climbed the Alps of fame and stood against the sun one brief tremendous moment with the world's eyes upon him, and then, pst, where is he? Why, the only long thing the only real thing about the whole shadowy business is the sense of the lagging, dull, and hoary lapse of time that has drifted by since then. A vast, empty level, it seems, with a formless specter glimpsed fitfully through the smoke and mist that lie along its remote verge. Well, we are all getting along here first rate. Livy gains strength daily and sits up a deal. The baby is five weeks old, and... But no more of this. Somebody may be reading this letter eighty years hence. And so, my friend, you pitying snob, I mean, who are holding this yellow paper in your hand in 1960, save yourself the trouble of looking further. I know how pathetically trivial our small concerns will seem to you, and I will not let your eye profane them. No, I keep my news. You keep your compassion. Suffice it you to know, scoffer and ribald, that the little child is old and blind now, and once more toothless, and the rest of us are shadows these many, many years. Yes, and your time cometh. Mark. At the farm that year, Mark Twain was working on The Prince and the Pauper, and, according to a letter to Aldrich, 
brought it to an end September 19th. It is a pleasant letter worth preserving. The book by Aldrich here mentioned was The Stillwater Tragedy. To T. B. Aldrich in Ponkapog, Massachusetts. Elmira, September 15, 80. My dear Aldrich, thank you ever so much for the book. I had already finished it, and prodigiously enjoyed it, in the periodical of the notorious Howells. But it hits Mrs. Clemens just right, for she is having a reading holiday now for the first time in the same months. So between times, when the new baby is asleep, and strengthening up for another attempt to take possession of this place, she is going to read it. Her strong friendship for you makes her think she is going to like it. I finished a story yesterday myself. I counted up and found it between sixty and eighty thousand words, about the size of your book. It is for boys and girls. Been at work at it several years, off and on. I hope Howells is enjoying his journey to the Pacific. He wrote me that you and Osgood were going also, but I doubted it, believing he was in liquor when he wrote it. In my opinion, this universal applause over his book is going to land that man in a retreat inside of two months. I noticed the papers say mighty fine things about your book, too. You ought to try to get into the same establishment with Howells. But applause does not affect me. I am always calm. This is because I am used to it. Well, goodbye, my boy, and good luck to you. Mrs. Clemens asks me to send her warmest regards to you and Mrs. Aldrich, which I do, and add those of yours ever, Mark. While Mark Twain was a journalist in San Francisco, there was a middle-aged man named Sol who had a desk near him on the morning call. Sol was in those days highly considered as a poet by his associates, most of whom were younger and less gracefully poetic but Sol's gift had never been an important one. Now, in his old age, he found his fame still local, and he yearned for wider recognition. He wished to have a volume of poems issued by a publisher of recognized standing. Because Mark Twain had been one of Sol's admirers and a warm friend in the old days, it was natural that Sol should turn to him now, and equally natural that Clemens should turn to Howells. To W. D. Howells in Boston, Sunday, October 2, 80. My dear Howells, here's a letter which I wrote you to San Francisco the second time you didn't go there. I told Sol he needn't write you, but simply send the manuscript to you. Oh, dear, dear, it is dreadful to be an unrecognized poet. How wise it was in Charles Warren started to take in his sign and go for some other calling while still young. I'm laying for that encyclopedical Scotchman, and he'll need to lock the door behind him when he comes in. Otherwise, when he hears my proposed tariff, his skin will probably crawl away with him. He is accustomed to seeing the publisher impoverish the author. That spectacle must be getting stale to him. If he contracts with the undersigned, he will experience a change in that program that will make the enamel peel off his teeth for very surprise and joy. No, that last is what Mrs. Clemens thinks, but it's not so. The proposed work is growing mightily, in my estimation, day by day, and I'm not going to throw it away for any mere trifle. If I make a contract with the canny Scott, I will then tell him the plan which you and I have devised, that of taking in the humor of all countries. Otherwise, I'll keep it to myself, I think. Why should we assist our fellow man for mere love of God? Yours ever, Mark. One wishes that Howells might have found value enough in the verses of Frank Soule to recommend them to Osgood. To Clemens he wrote, You have touched me in regard to him, and I will deal gently with his poetry. Poor old fellow. 
I can imagine him and how he must have to struggle not to be hard or sour. The verdict, however, was inevitable. Soul's graceful verses proved to be not poetry at all. No publisher of standing could afford to give them his imprint. The encyclopedical Scotchman, mentioned in the preceding letter, was the publisher, Gebby, who had a plan to engage Howells and Clemens to prepare some sort of anthology of the world's literature. The idea came to nothing, though the other plan mentioned, for a library of humor, in time grew into a book. Mark Twain's contracts with Bliss for the publication of his books on the subscription plan had been made on a royalty basis, beginning with 5% on The Innocents Abroad, increasing to 7% on Roughing It, and to 10% on later books. Bliss had held that these later percentages fairly represented one-half the profits. Clemens, however, had never been fully satisfied, and his brother Orion had more than once urged him to demand a specific contract on the half-profit basis. The agreement for the publication of A Tramp Abroad was made on these terms. Bliss died before Clemens received his first statement of sales. Whatever may have been the facts under earlier conditions, the statement proved to Mark Twain's satisfaction, at least that the half-profit arrangement was to his advantage. It produced another result. It gave Samuel Clemens an excuse to place his brother Orion in a position of independence. To Orion Clemens in Keokuk, Iowa, Sunday, October 24, 80. My dear brother, Bliss is dead. The aspect of the balance sheet is enlightening. It reveals the fact, through my present contract, which is for half the profits on the book above actual cost of paper, printing, and binding, that I have lost considerably by all this nonsense sixty thousand dollars, I should say, and if Bliss were alive, I would stay with the concern and get it all back for on each new book I would require a portion of that back pay. But as it is, this in the very strictest confidence, I shall probably go to a new publisher six or eight months hence, for I am afraid Frank, with his poor health, will lack push and drive. Out of the suspicions you bred in me years ago has grown this result, to wit, that I shall, within the twelve month, get forty thousand dollars out of this tramp instead of twenty thousand dollars twenty thousand dollars after taxes and other expenses are stripped away is worth to the investor about seventy five dollars a month so i should tell mr perkins to make your check that amount per month hereafter while our income is able to afford it this ends the loan business and hereafter you can reflect that you are living not on borrowed money, but on money which you have squarely earned, and which has no taint or savor of charity about it. And you can also reflect that the money you have been receiving of me all these years is interest charged against the heavy bill which the next publisher will have to stand who gets a book of mine. Jean got the stockings and is much obliged. Molly wants to know whom she most resembles, but I can't tell. She has blue eyes and brown hair and three chins, and is very fat and happy. And at one time or another, she has resembled all the different Clemenses and Langdons in turn that have ever lived. Livy is too much beaten out with the baby nights to write these times, and I don't know of anything urgent to say except that a basket full of letters has accumulated in the seven days that I have been whooping and cursing over a cold in the head, and I must attack the pile this very minute. With love from us, yours affectionately, Sam. $25 enclosed. On the completion of the Prince and Pauper story, Clemens had naturally sent it to Howells for consideration. Howells wrote, I have read the two peas, and I like it immensely. It begins well, and it ends well. He pointed out some things that might be changed or omitted, and added, 
it is such a book as i would expect from you knowing what a bottom of fury there is to your fun clemens had thought somewhat of publishing the story anonymously in the fear that it would not be accepted seriously over his own signature the bull story referred to in the next letter is the one later used in the joan of arc book the story told joan by uncle laxert how he rode a bull to a funeral to w d howells in boston christmas eve eighteen eighty my dear howells i was prodigiously delighted with what you said about the book so on the whole i've concluded to publish intrepidly instead of concealing the authorship i shall leave out that bull story i wish you had gone to new york the company was small and we had a first-rate time smith's an enjoyable fella i like barrett too and the oysters were as good as the rest of the company it was worth going there to learn how to cook them next day i attended to business which was to introduce twichell to general grant and procure a private talk in the interest of the chinese educational mission here in the u s well it was very funny joe had been sitting up nights building facts and arguments together into a mighty and unassailable array and had studied them out and got them by heart all with the trembling half-hearted hope of getting grant to add his signature to a sort of petition to the viceroy of china but grant took in the whole situation in a jiffy and before joe had more than fairly got started the old man said i'll write the viceroy a letter a separate letter and bring strong reasons to bear upon him i know him well and what i say will have weight with him i will attend to it right away no no thanks i shall be glad to do it it will be a labor of love so all joe's laborious hours were for naught it was as if he had come to borrow a dollar and been offered a thousand before he could unfold his case but it's getting dark merry christmas to all of you yours ever mark the chinese educational mission mentioned in the foregoing was a thriving hartford institution projected eight years before by a yale graduate named yung wing the mission was now threatened and yung wing knowing the high honor in which general grant was held in china believed that through him it might be saved twichell of course was deeply concerned and naturally overjoyed at grant's interest a day or two following the return to hartford clemens received a letter from general grant in which he wrote li hung chang is the most powerful and most influential chinaman in his country he professed great friendship for me when i was there and i have had assurances of the same thing since i hope if he is strong enough with his government that the decision to withdraw the chinese students from this country may be changed but perhaps li hung chang was experiencing one of his partial eclipses just then or possibly he was not interested for the Hartford mission did not survive. End of section twenty two. Recording by James K. White, Chula Vista.